whatever role you aspire to get a job as be software development devops web development or even data science there is one technology which if you are well versed with it will always give you that extra edge over every other candidate in your competition want to know what that technology is it is cloud computing cloud computing has become the backbone for every technology product out there and if you have the required skills and knowledge about cloud computing then you are sure to land that job you have always aspired for so guys buckle up and stay with us till the end of the session as we discuss about microsoft azure an industry leader in cloud computing domain with a 22% market share and approximate 45000 plus job openings in the world today learning this technology will definitely seal the deal for you if you want to become a successful it professional in this session you will get to learn as well as master some of the most important azure services through extensive hands on sessions you will get to learn through very interesting case based quizzes and we will also discuss about some very frequently asked interview questions that can help you crack your next interview stay with us till the end of the session as we sail through the very important concepts of microsoft azure there is a lot to learn and a lot to discuss in this session so let's quickly move on to the agenda of the video before that make sure to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon for regular updates also don't forget to mention below in the comments how you like the video now without any further ado let's discuss the agenda so we're going to start with what is microsoft azure moving further we will discuss the story of startup companies using azure azure services and azure pricing after that we will discuss website architecture in azure and end to end implementation of azure project after that we will discuss what is cloud computing various cloud models top 3 cloud providers and we will also learn how to deploy an e-commerce website app on azure and to end this session we are going to discuss very crucial azure interview questions and answers so what is microsoft azure microsoft azure is a cloud provider that provides various platform as a service and infrastructure as a service products azure has cloud solutions to all the infrastructural problems by providing services in various domains did you know that almost 95% of fortune 500 companies are using azure also it is 5 times cheaper than aws in terms of windows and sql server because there are also microsoft products forbes say that microsoft azure is set to boost the size of the it market by 10 trillion dollars in the next 10 years as per predictions 80% of the businesses will move their workload to cloud by 2025 thus making it a major career to consider transitioning to for a better understanding of azure let us start at the very beginning microsoft azure was announced in october 2008 and released on february 1 2010 as windows azure first and later named as microsoft azure on 25th march 2015 in today's scenario its reach is in 140 countries and is still expanding which is pretty impeccable in simpler terms microsoft azure is a platform that enables users to engage in agile cloud computing and is designed for creating and managing apps through microsoft's data center now there are four integral microsoft azure service domains the first one is azure compute compute is the most integral domain in azure as it brings everything together with azure virtual machines you can get on demand scalable compute resources azure virtual machines app services and container instances are some popular compute services second we have azure networking networks from the cloud networks in azure vnet is the networking tool that connects all azure resources together These networking services allow enterprises to safely connect their on-premises services to the Azure cloud. It is also used to manage virtual private networks and further create multiple virtual networks on the cloud. The third one is Azure Storage. Azure Storage provides storage solutions that are more durable and large-scale applications, data-driven applications can be built without any hassle. 
Azure automatically scales the storage requirements according to the usage and it automatically balances throughput according to the connections made. And the last one is Azure Database. Azure provides relational databases, NoSQL databases, data lakes and data warehouses. It provides a scalable, high available and fault tolerant database server and lets you scale according to the incoming data. There are various job roles in Azure. Let's take a look at one of the most popular job roles, Azure Developer. An Azure Developer is a cloud professional who creates cloud-based applications making use of the benefits of the cloud architecture. If you are proficient in testing, security, development and deployment, then a career in Azure Development is somewhere you will fit in well. The job includes responsibilities like testing of applications, maintaining, developing and deploy them on Azure. It also includes participating in all phases of development and having the ability to work side by side with cloud administrators, clients and cloud architects. In United States, on average basis, an Azure developer gets paid $132,148 per annum. However, for an entry-level developer, it's $97,000. Whereas in India, the salary offered ranges from 7 lakhs to 25 lakhs per annum. That's all about Azure. What is cloud computing? All right. So let's go ahead and understand first cloud computing by its definition. So guys, by definition, cloud computing is nothing but the use of remote servers on the internet to do your tasks. It could be basically hosting an application. It could be hosting your database server. It could be anything, right? But when you use servers on the internet, uh, when you use somebody else's servers on the internet rather than using your own servers or computers when you use somebody else's computer on the internet that is called cloud computing right and the person or the company who provides you with that kind of server is called a cloud provider this is a gist of what cloud computing is now obviously cloud computing has more things to it and we will discuss that as we move along right now to give you an example as to how you can imagine how cloud works is like this let's say you are a developer okay and what you want to do is you want to host an application so you basically start up a company and you you have an idea which is similar to let's say Instagram and that idea is a billion dollar idea right and what you want to do is you want to start off by just creating the application by yourself you don't want to hire any people right because you want to keep the cost minimum so you develop the code by yourself and now the application is ready but you have to make this application available to the world so how do you do that so the first thing that you would have to do is you'll have to buy some servers and you'll have to put that application on those servers so once your application is on those servers, the next top uh, task would be to basically make that uh, application available on the internet, right? And how would you make it available on the internet? You basically connect internet to these servers and you assign a public IP to these servers. And now your, your application is basically available on an IP address. Next thing that you would do is you would buy a domain. And the next thing that you know is now the domain is ready. And now your application, some, anybody on the internet who goes to your particular domain would be able to access your application okay so guys this is the normal life cycle of how applications were launched uh, before cloud computing now the problem over here guys is that you invested some money on these servers and guys servers are not cheap they're very very expensive right and as a guy who is starting up with their company you might think that your idea is worth a billion dollars but if you actually think about it there's a lot of risk and there's a lot of uh, uh, I mean, there's a 50% probability because you are just starting off now that you might fail. Although there's a probability uh, of a 50% probability that you might succeed as well. But there are a lot of risks that are involved and there's a lot at stake over here because you're investing a lot of money on these servers, right? So this was the general way of uh, starting up a business before cloud computing emerged.
Now, after cloud computing, it has become very simple now. Let's say you come up with an idea and now you want to deploy your application. All you have to do is you will go on cloud and you would say, hey, I need some servers for deploying my application. So you would get those servers which would already be connecting to the internet or everything would be set up by the cloud provider. You just have to use them, right? And the only thing the cloud provider would expect from you is he would say like, hey, you know what? You just have to pay me for the time that you're using the servers for and that's about it i don't need anything else from you right now that's an awesome thing now the kind of pricing that cloud computing gives you is uh, a pay as you go pricing that basically means you just pay for the amount of time that you're using servers for in case of azure it counts in terms of minutes right so the number of minutes that you would be using the servers for it will charge you according to that right now if you again think about what all changes came about over here when I was not using cloud and when I'm using cloud now, the first change that would come about here is if let's say, you know, you were not using cloud computing and you bought these servers. Now, obviously somebody has to manage these servers for you as well, right? And now when somebody has to manage them for you, there's always a chance of downtime as well. So you always at your back of your mind, you would always be thinking of uh, whether my servers are up and running or not. Um, do I need more people to handle these kind of servers? When your application becomes big, you would also have to scale these servers. So all these problems would be at the back of your mind. And at the same time, you also have to develop code for it, right? So that's a lot on your plate. Now, what cloud does for you is, it says, you know, you just pay me for the amount of time you're using the servers for. I, on the other hand, will hire the workforce that is required to manage these servers. I, on the other hand, as a cloud provider, will also scale your servers as and when required when the demand increases on your application you just sit back relax and you code your application that's all you have right and guys this is the biggest advantage that you get with cloud computing right you can focus on the work that you have to do everything logistical uh, or everything operational with respect to uh, managing servers is handled by your cloud provider and what is better than paying less for that right you pay you're paying less you're hiring less workforce and at the same time you're getting a better quality of internet hosting available I mean you, you, you basically like, like let's say you imagine now if you have to secure an application you'll have to buy a, you, you'll have to hire a security engineer who will basically secure an application you will also have to hire people who will ensure that you're all uh, that your application is up and running how by basically scaling them uh, up and down that your number of servers so you would need deployment engineers you would also have to keep some servers in your stack so that whenever new servers are required whenever the demand goes up those can be plugged and played as and when required right so these are all the things that you had to do but now with cloud computing you don't have to do that because everything is managed by the cloud provider you just have to code your application so summarizing the advantages that you get with cloud computing is that while you're starting up you don't have to invest a lot right that is the number one advantage number two advantage is you can focus on your app development you don't have to focus on uh, you know what is happening on my server are my servers running off fine or not are the security patches updated or not everything will be managed by your cloud provider and the third thing is that it requires like a workforce because obviously you're not hiring anyone to manage your servers everything is being done by the cloud provider if you want to hire people you can actually hire more developers so that your coding work is distributed among them right so these are the advantages guys that you get with cloud computing now uh, cloud computing is offered in various uh, in various types of services and that we will discover as we move along but those types of services leads to different kind of applications or different kind of products on the cloud for example you might have heard about this you might have heard about google drive you might have heard about netflix airbnb all these applications are basically hosted on cloud and you might not even realize it right now if we talk about google drive google drive is nothing but it's 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 this kind of service it's software as a service that is given to you by cloud provider what is the software as a service we'll discuss that as we move along but just understand that google drive is a cloud product it is basically hosted on google's infrastructure right you don't care about where uh, if you are uploading a file on google drive you don't care about where on which server is it being uh, stored right you don't care about which operating system is that server running you don't care about you know whether the hardware on that server 
is good enough to basically handle the speed with which you want to work you don't care about anything right you just care about your file being there on google drive and you know it's gonna be there why because you trust google with your things you you trust google that it'll manage everything on the infrastructure side and that is exactly what uh, cloud computing is all about similarly when you talk about netflix netflix is a very popular video streaming surface i'm sure all of you must have used it that is itself also hosted onto cloud right so netflix we rely on netflix to be always up and running and netflix itself relies on the cloud provider on which it is hosted that you know they will ensure that i am up and running always right so that is how cool uh, you know the concept of cloud is that a, a popular service such as netflix is also not caring about how the servers are managed all of that is managed by your cloud provider similarly you must have also heard about airbnb you must have also heard about the e-commerce com uh, company the giant which is amazon then there is also prime video all of these products they are basically hosted on cloud right so if you are from india you would also recognize flipkart flipkart is again an e-commerce giant which was recently taken over uh, by walmart right flipkart also is completely hosted on a cloud provider in flipkart's case it's basically hosted on microsoft azure right so we'll be talking more about azure as we move along but guys these are some of the products that you might be using in your everyday life which are based basically hosted on the cloud right now moving forward guys uh, we were talking about cloud computing uh, services so there are various kind of services that cloud computing has to offer us there are basically uh, the cloud computing business is based on two kind of models and we'll discuss those models in this section which is cloud computing models all right guys now let's discuss the various cloud models which on which basically cloud companies are working and are earning right so basically cloud computing gives us two models the first model is the deployment model and the next model are the service models now what are these let's discuss them one by one so guys deployment models are basically the way you can deploy your application on cloud right the various ways you can apply deploy your application on cloud are basically called deployment models right so that's a thing that you choose how do you want your application to be deployed how are they deployed we'll discuss that in a few moments but first let's discuss how is it different from service models so guys service models are different like service models are how do you want your service to be or how do you want the cloud provider to give you a particular service do you want an infrastructure from the cloud provider do you want a platform from a cloud provider or do you want a software from a cloud provider right now what what does these three things mean so when you talk about infrastructure as a service you basically expect that you would be given a machine uh, to work on from the cloud provider that basically means you will get access to the operating system in case of platform as a service what you do get is basically a dashboard kind of thing where you will not get access to the operating system but you know you get get access to a dashboard on which you can upload your application and basically see whether your application is up and running right so, so a software installation everything is handled by the cloud provider and the next thing is software as a service wherein you do not get access to the operating system you do not get access to a dashboard where you can upload your code but what you do get is a software that has been made by the cloud provider which you can use to cater to your needs for example there are various crm softwares out there which are hosted on cloud for example zoho crm it's a cloud product right google drive on which you which basically use for solving your storage needs is again a software as a service similarly you can think of a lot of things which are basically softwares that you use on your day-to-day -day life on which you can basically not upload your code but you can actually use that software for example facebook is also a software and it's hosted on cloud so that also falls under software as a service instagram is a software that you use that also is hosted on cloud that also soft falls under software as a service platform as a service is a little different basically because you will be uploading code on it and that will be deployed on a server that you would not be aware of right so that's why it's a platform it gives you a platform to code and that's why it's a platform as a service and on the other hand when is when we talk about infrastructure as a service like i said you get the access to the operating system similarly when we talk about deployment models public cloud is nothing but when you share your uh, code or when you share your machine with other people on the in, uh, network as well right more about that i'll talk 
as you move along right uh, the, but let me first tell you the difference between private uh, public and hybrid cloud so private cloud is nothing but when you are when you do not want to share your machine with anybody else right uh, you just want your code to exist on the machine and then you have something called as hybrid cloud which is basically a mixture of both of them right so let's go ahead and discuss each of them in detail as you move along right so let's first talk about the deployment models so the deployment models like i said there are public private and hybrid the first one is public cloud so what basically happens is that when you deploy a machine on cloud when you deploy a virtual machine on cloud it is not a separate machine which gets deployed on cloud so what basically happens is that each cloud cloud provider they buy machines which are humongous in size right it could have around 30 petabytes of storage and it can have around uh, let's say 200 gb of ram or 300 gb of ram or even more than that right so each machine has this kind of a specification now what they do is they install hypervisors on these machines and what do hypervisors or virtualization softwares do is that they launch multiple machines on this very same system right so let's say you launch five machines on microsoft azure so that could mean that all your five machines which are launched may be hosted on one particular server as well that's a possibility right so this is how cloud provides you with different kind of uh, specification machines they basically buy one kind of machine they buy all their servers with one kind of specification but according to your needs according to what kind of specification uh, you want they virtualize a machine from that very server and obviously they launch more virtual machines also from that very server if the resources are free right this is how cloud works now what happens in case of public cloud is that let's say you are launching a virtual machine right and you have launched it uh, let's say on microsoft azure so if there is one more company let's say you are amazon okay and there's one more company let's say it's a flipkart or let's say it's walmart so if they come up to microsoft azure and they say that uh, you know what i also uh, want to launch my website on your cloud platform it could be that both of your websites are actually being hosted from the same server right now this might sound okay to you because you believe in your cloud provider and you know they guarantee you uh, security to your applications they guarantee you that no data of yours will be hacked from the other uh, people who are also sharing the same hardware as you but some companies they basically say or they have some confidential data which they do not want to share with anyone right so we'll come to that but if you are okay with this kind of a setup wherein you know your application could be on the same hardware on which other applications are also there or other people are also using it then you term it as public cloud because you are on the cloud which where all the public can basically come up and they can launch their own servers and it could be that you are existing on the same server as well but you don't care about that that is public cloud next type of cloud is private cloud so private cloud is for those companies that i was talking about which uh, basically want confidentiality and they want uh, security in the utmost manner that they can right so let's talk about some government agencies right so if some government agency have have to host uh, their data on cloud and let's say they turn on to microsoft azure uh, for that matter so they would say okay so we don't care about the money that we have to pay you right but we want security in the most highest regards possible so what microsoft azure tells them is you know what uh, although we have this system in place which is unhackable uh, it's it's technically unhackable no other person who is hosted on the same server as you would be able to get into your website but if you are still concerned because you know uh, in technology actually there is nothing called as unhackable everything can be hacked right it's just uh, uh, it's just hardware right if earlier people can like you would have heard about people jailbreaking iPhones and Apple every time it comes up with a new phone it says it's the most secure device on the planet and still people manage to hack it right so same is the situation here as well even though your cloud provider is guaranteeing you that you know your 
hardware that you own and if there are other companies also on that hardware they will not be able to hack into your data still you know the companies they do not want to take any chance so they opt for private cloud so i was taking the example of government agencies which have very uh, you know vol volatile data with them data which is very very confidential so they don't take any risk they also opt for a private cloud a private cloud basically means is that they would give you one unit of their server for your use right you use that server as you own it no other company will be posted on that particular server that the cloud provider guarantees you right so that is termed as a private cloud one other way that you can create a private cloud is that you can buy your own servers right and you can set up set them up in a data center and what you can do is you can install the hypervisor the virtualization software on top of it and you can use those servers as if you uh, are using any other cloud provider for that matter like if you use microsoft azure you can deploy uh, machines with various specifications similarly you will be able to do that in your data center as well but the scene is over there you have bought your own servers right on the other side of uh, the second type of private cloud that i discussed with you is when your cloud provider that is a company like microsoft azure they would say okay you know what uh, i can provide you a server on which i will not be putting any other company and you can use that server as your own and that is also termed as private cloud okay so these are the two deployment models first we discussed private cloud uh, sorry public cloud and then we discussed private cloud the third type of cloud uh, which exists in terms of deployment in terms of how you can deploy your applications on cloud is called hybrid cloud now what is hybrid cloud uh, as the name suggests it's basically a mixture of public and private cloud now why would you use a deployment model like this so uh, one use case that can, i can tell you guys is let's say you know because i told you private clouds are expensive uh, let's say you have uh, a distributed kind of an application on which uh storage is done on one server the website hosting is let's say done on the other server so what you do is because your website is already facing uh, the internet what you do is on the private cloud you basically just store your files right and um, you know all the confidential data is stored on the private server on the other hand the website is actually hosted on the public server because anyways it has to be exposed onto the internet and what you do is you create a private connection between your server that is your website server and your backend storage which is basically on private cloud and then they interact so it basically gives you an advantage of saving some money because now your website exists on the public cloud so if there is anything related to website anything related scaling related to website or anything for that matter everything will happen on the public cloud and if there is any extra space or extra resources required on the private cloud you will actually have to set up a new server which will be storing the extra data for you you do not have the option of uh, choosing the cheaper option which is public cloud in this case because now private cloud is very expensive uh, and the cloud provider told you that in uh, beforehand that if i if you put your application on private cloud i'll give you one whole server for your own use and nobody else will be deployed on it right so if scaling in that sense has to happen but only your data will be stored on it and you do not uh, or you cannot have a control on how much specification do you need on that computer because obviously you will be buying that own uh, buying that computer or server for yourself right on the other hand if you deploy it on a using a cloud provider that is uh, you buy a private uh, cloud or you host or you ask your cloud provider to basically give you a private cloud on their own premises so they might give you a server which is configurable but again that is more expensive than what is there on your public cloud so this is how a hybrid implementation guys works uh, moving forward guys now we have discuss about the various deployment models the various ways you can deploy your application on cloud now let's discuss the various service models which exist on uh, cloud right so we have already discussed there are three kind of services that can be offered to you on cloud uh, you might get an infrastructure as a service a platform as a service or a software as a service now guys infrastructure as a service uh, like you already know uh, i have already explained to you guys when you get access to the operating system right of an application or of your server that is 
you can configure or you can install anything on that server of your choice you can install a database you can install web applications you can install any backend applications whatever you want to install you can install on it. it's your server do whatever you want with it right that is called infrastructure as a service on the other hand when you come as to platform as a service in that case they do not give you an access to the operating system in fact they do not give you the access to the machine as well they just say i will give you a dashboard you upload your code over there and i will host your application for you let me handle all the operations let me install the required software needed for your code let me do everything let me do scaling let me do everything for you right so in that kind of a scenario that kind of a service is called platform as a service okay and the third type is software as a service where we have already discussed that when you get access to a software rather than a platform or the whole machine as a service you call it as software as a service and the examples were google drive the examples were facebook instagram gmail anything of that sort on which you, are, you, you do not have the option of uploading your code uh, to host your application you basically can just use that application that's termed as software as a service now moving on forward guys let's talk about who provides these kind of services right now this was cloud in general right but today's session is about microsoft azure so how does microsoft azure fit into this kind of a story is let us explore that so guys the, the top three cloud providers uh, in the whole world are basically aws and then you have microsoft azure and then you have google cloud so all these three companies they provide the cloud business model on their own infrastructure right so every concept that we studied is provided by these three cloud providers and uh, let's let's put it out there that aws is the most used cloud provider in the world right it's the top cloud provider with the largest market share but that does not mean that microsoft azure and google cloud a little less operational or uh, are not that great as aws it's just that aws was launched way back in 2006 and that's why most of the companies who got leered into uh, you know okay so they understood cloud and they said okay so it's actually going to save a lot of costs for us they moved on to aws and because there was no other cloud provider at that particular time they are now still on aws because now of course those companies which shifted at that time they are now completely dependent on the cloud provider and if they try to migrate that will actually cost them a lot right and that is why aws has the largest market share reason being it came here first and hence there are more and more people who are actually hosting their applications from aws the second largest cloud provider is microsoft azure right so guys microsoft azure was recently launched i guess it was launched in 2012 right and since then it has grown a lot right so it has around 13 or 14 percent of the whole market share right uh, of of the whole cloud paradigm and it is growing exponentially every year right why are we studying about microsoft azure i will give you a lot of facts um, you know in the upcoming slides but uh, what i want to point out over here is the growth of microsoft azure is more than the growth of aws right so at the growth rate at which aws is growing microsoft azure is growing at a triple speed uh, than the growth of aws so that just shows that people have started adopting microsoft azure people have started using microsoft azure and that but that does not point that you know people have stopped using aws that basically means uh, now what the, the shift that i see in the industry right now is everyone wants their application up and running they do not want any discontinuation in the business processes which are running 24 7 um, in their organization so for having that kind of uh, availability so basically slas uh, when you deal with slas slas are basically service level agreements so when companies they get uh, in in partnership with cloud providers and they say you know you host our cloud pro uh, our servers for us they also sign service level agreements where the cloud provider says you know this is the amount of guarantee that i can give you um, that you know your servers would be up and running so the this slas uh, are usually 97 98 99 percent which basically means um, your cloud provider is guaranteeing 99 percent of your uptime throughout the life cycle that you will be on that 
cloud provider but you know companies they still do not like the number uh, 99 they feel you know why should i take a risk for that one person so what they do is they actually rely on other cloud providers as well right so if let's say your application is hosted on microsoft azure and what you want to do is uh, your your microsoft azure is saying you know your application is going to be up 99% of the times so what you do is you replicate your architecture and you deploy it on a secondary cloud provider as well because whenever your cloud provider will be down let's say your microsoft azure cloud computing uh, service goes down right so if that goes down you at least have a backup which will serve as your main website again or your main application again which is hosted on some other cloud provider and hence uh, uh, you know even if microsoft azure is down your other cloud provider does not get affected right and hence your business still continues so this is a shift that i'm seeing in industry that people are not only on cloud but they are now on multiple cloud providers as well so that you know their application never go down so guys like i said uh, the three top cloud providers are aws microsoft azure and google cloud but now let's go ahead and talk about why are we learning about microsoft azure today when i mentioned that you know aws is the largest cloud provider in the market why am i not studying about aws why am i studying about microsoft azure so let me go ahead and tell you guys why right so the reason for that is that microsoft azure in terms of microsoft products like you and i we both know that at some point of your life uh, in it or at home you would have used a microsoft product that's how well they have integrated all or that's how well they've designed their, their products that each and every person on this planet planet if they are into it they must have used microsoft products at one point in their life right and microsoft azure gives you a benefit in in in, in terms of using microsoft uh, products that it says that if you are on cloud and if you want to use any microsoft product like windows or sql for that matter aws whatever price aws gives azure can give you a price which is five times cheaper than that price the reason for that is very simple that microsoft owns the license and hence a, a license which is basically being bought by Amazon would be uh, you know costlier to them and when they give you that license on a shared basis that is on, on a timely basis obviously they'll charge you more but when it comes to Microsoft they have those charges in hand because it's their own license right so what they tell you is that dude you know what whatever AWS is charging you for that particular instance for a product uh, for a software which is by Microsoft which is running on that server I'm going to give you that same server in one fifth of the price so this is the first advantage that you get with microsoft azure that if you are into microsoft products if your application is using any kind of microsoft product you will find it one fifth of the price when compared to aws the second thing is that if you have microsoft licenses now obviously if you are let's say in a business and you are using some microsoft uh, software you obviously would have bought some licenses and when you want to go on to cloud you know you do not want to pay for the licenses as well you just want to pay for let's say the server that you're using why should you pay for the operating system when you have actually paid for that operating system before when you purchased it for your office laptop or your office server right so what you can do is or what option microsoft azure gives you is the bring your own license option so you bring your own license you give the license key to them and they will not charge you anything for their licensing even the one fifth cost that they were charging they will not charge you that if you have your own license if you have your own microsoft license and you bring that to the microsoft azure cloud okay so that is that is the second advantage that you get with microsoft azure and the third advantage that you get is that more than 95 percent of fortune 500 companies are actually using microsoft azure now that could be uh, either in the case of uh, as of a primary cloud provider or it could be using microsoft azure as a secondary cloud provider or it could be using some products of Microsoft Azure but if we talk about the companies uh, the fortune 500 companies 95% of them are using Microsoft Azure right so if you get yourself certified in Microsoft Azure you have a 95% 
probability of uh, hitting a company uh, if you go to 100 companies you have a 95% uh, chance that you will be actually landing up in a company which will be using some kind of a Microsoft as your service right so that's a pretty huge number and that actually gives you a higher probability of getting a job as well in these fortune 500 companies so guys these were the three main advantages as to why Microsoft Azure is being preferred by businesses for their work right and that's why companies have now started to shift to Microsoft Azure as well and that is why it is seeing such a exp huge exponential growth rate when compared to AWS now now that you know that you know why are we learning Microsoft Azure the reason for that is obviously uh, the chances of getting yourself a job in Microsoft Azure is more right now let's move on and talk about what exactly Microsoft Azure is right so guys Microsoft Azure is basically a cloud service which is developed by Microsoft right it is owned and managed by Microsoft and it offers you its services in a pay-as-you-go model and it is the second largest cloud provider in the world right so this is what Microsoft Azure is so whatever I've taught you with regards to the concepts of cloud all of them are given to you by Microsoft Azure right along with the advantages that I told you all of that you get with Microsoft Azure and all you pay for that particular service is based on the number of minutes that you're using its services for right that's how amazing cloud is and that's how amazing even Microsoft Azure is right now let's move forward and talk about how Microsoft Azure basically works right so we have discussed enough about what cloud computing is what is Microsoft Azure we, we are all clear with that why are we using it why are we learning it today we are all clear with that now let's get into the technical aspects of Microsoft Azure and understand how does basically Microsoft Azure is structured in terms of its architecture all right guys so now let's go ahead and understand the Azure core architecture so guys, this is the core architecture for Azure. As you can see, there are four ways of accessing Azure, right? These four components are basically nothing but four different ways of accessing the Azure resources, right? So the Azure resource manager is basically a mediator between the Azure resources and the external agents which can interact with the Azure resources. Now to interact with the Azure resource manager, you need these four ways. Now, what are these four ways? The first way is the Azure portal. Now, what is the Azure portal? The Azure portal is nothing but the GUI website that you get provided with, right? For example, if you go to portal.azure.com, once you have signed up on Azure, you can basically go to that portal and you can deploy any kind of resource that you want, right? So you can control and manage the resources from that interface. So that interface is called the Azure portal, right? The next thing is Azure PowerShell. Now, what is Azure PowerShell? So there is a thing called Microsoft PowerShell. So that exists in a Windows system. So if you're using a Windows system, you can just type in your start bar PowerShell and you would be able to see what PowerShell is, right? It's a native Microsoft product. Now, what Azure or what Microsoft provide you with is it also gives you an extension uh, for uh, making your PowerShell interact with Microsoft Azure, right? And once you install that extension, once it's installed on your system, your PowerShell would be able to connect to Microsoft Azure, which will basically give you the ability of controlling or deploying resources on Microsoft Azure using the command line. So that's Azure PowerShell. Similarly, you have something called as Azure CLI. Now PowerShell, is, like I said, is a product from Microsoft. Azure CLI is basically done on the DOS prompt, right? So DOS is altogether a different software which has been there since ages on Windows, right? So if you want, if you are more uh, inclined towards using the DOS prompt, you can actually install the necessary softwares for Azure and then you can use the DOS commands to use or manage or deploy Azure resources. So this is the third way of accessing your Azure resources. And then you have something called as REST clients. Now, what are REST clients? REST clients are nothing but uh, they are APIs which you can include in your web applications, right? For example, you can create your own web application through which you can create or use your Azure account. For example, let's say you create a website wherein, uh, you know, you take the user input 
you take an integer number from the user and then you have created a button which is called deploy and what that does is whatever number you have mentioned it basically deploys that many number of servers on microsoft azure right but you are not basically doing that directly from the azure portal or you're not doing it that through the powershell or you're not doing that through azure cli what you have done is you have created your own application and you have linked your application to your azure account and you're making or you're making that website or you're allowing that website basically to control your azure resources and this is possible using apis which are also called rest lines right now these resources in case of azure powershell and azure cli they would interact with the help of sdks to connect to azure resource manager your azure portal and your rest clients can directly interact with the azure resource manager and what is an azure resource manager like i previously stated it's nothing but a mediator so basically what happens is all the resources which are deployed on azure they are they are not directly accessible by the user even if he's using the website or using the powershell or using the cli or using the rest lines every request has to go to the uh, azure resource manager and what the azure resource manager does is it basically authenticates your request it will check whether you as a user of a microsoft azure account have the necessary permissions to do a certain task which you're trying to do with your application for example when you create a microsoft azure account you would have the option of creating multiple users in that same account so that multiple people can work on your own account for example let's say you start a startup or you open a startup right and now you have hired a tech team now uh, what you want to do is you want uh, your cto or the person who's going to be managing your tech team uh, the admin access of your azure account and on the other hand the developers who probably let's say if if one of the developers is going to work on the azure storage right so you just want him to access as your storage you don't want him to access as your vms or any other kind of as your service uh, so what you can do is you can create a user and you can give definite permissions as to what he can access and what he cannot access okay now how will this be helpful now let's say your uh, technical manager he signs in uh, as a user right and he signs in let's say through the azure portal and then he tries to deploy a vm resource or a virtual machine or he tries to use a storage account you would be able to do so why because he has the administrator access you have given him and he'd be able to do everything that you can do on the other hand let's say now your developer comes in he also logs in through the azure portal he also sees everything which is there right but the moment he tries to deploy a virtual machine because he has to go through all his requests would be going through the azure resource manager when the azure resource manager authenticates this guy and sees whether he has the permissions to launch a virtual machine or not the basically the authentication fails so the authenticator will basically say no this guy does not have that permission so azure resource manager will not take a request forward it will basically revert you back with the error message saying you do not have the sufficient permissions to carry out this task right and this is the sole reason we need a mediator between our azure resources and the uh, and the various ways through which we can use uh, azure now this would be the same case with azure powershell this would be the same case with azure cli when you use azure powershell with your azure account you obviously have to enter your credentials in case of a developer he will be entering his credentials uh, that you have given to him right and those basically just have the access to the storage and again you would also get the same kind of message in azure powershell similarly you will get the same kind of message in azure cli and even in the rest lines right so when you connect your website to your azure account again you will get a key and a secret access key right or in other case uh, what you'll have to do is you'll have to include some metadata on your uh, server on which you're hosting that website and that metadata would basically authenticate you to the azure account so for every user you get a different kind of credentials for your metadata in case of a developer you will get a different set of credentials and those credentials would basically when they'll be authenticated they would 
get or they will inherit the same properties or the same permissions that the developer account has and accordingly your azure resource manager will authenticate and check whether you do you uh, do you have the required permissions or not right and accordingly you would be able to do the operations so guys uh, summing up or, or just revisiting what we just studied so there are basically four ways to access azure you have azure portal azure powershell azure cli and you have rest clients right all of these they interact through the azure resource manager and the azure resource manager based on what kind of permissions you have it basically routes your request to the necessary service and carries out the task for you right so this is a gist of how azure works in the back end now let's move forward and talk about the front end the middleware and the services right so the front end as we discussed there were four ways of accessing azure uh, services which were this is the azure portal this is the azure powershell um, this is the azure cli and then you have the rest lines the middleware was nothing but it was the azure resource manager we'd be discussing that and then you have the services uh, that we'll be discussing in a few moments right so let's start off with the front end part the front end components so what is the azure portal so guys the azure portal looks something like this right so it's a gui component that you get on your web browser and on your web browser you can basically you can see the on the left hand side you have things as all resources you have web apps you have sql databases you can just select the service that you want and you can subsequently launch it we'll be discussing more on this as we move along uh, i'll be showing you guys the portal i'll be showing you guys how you can use it to deploy resources for now we're just understanding what the azure portal looks like and this is what it looks like right on the right hand side you get all kind of widgets so these are widgets these are called widgets which show different kind of information right so you'll have the option of including these widgets on a dashboard more on this we will talk as we move along in the session so guys this was the azure portal this is the azure powershell so i told you guys microsoft has launched its own command line which now comes with windows integrated which is called powershell if you want to use that powershell with your azure account what you'll have to do is you'll have to download some libraries uh, which will help your powershell uh, to basically connect to azure and once you do that uh, you would basically see something like this windows azure powershell and now you can enter the powershell commands which should basically help you to connect to your azure account and carry out whatever you want in a command line fashion right similarly if you are into dos you can actually go ahead and use azure cli so dos commands are different from powershell and uh, there could be a scenario wherein you are better at dos commands than your powershell commands and if that is the case you can actually go ahead and just install the libraries for azure uh, cli and then you can actually use it in the dos environment right in this case also if you want to manage your azure resources uh, like you were managing it through powershell uh, through command line statements you can do a similar kind of way in azure cli as well but the commands that you would be entering over here they'd be more in line with dos commands uh, on the other hand when we talk about powershell we would be using powershell commands to control azure in that case okay so this was azure cli guys in the next in the last topic is rest clients so rest clients as i already told these are nothing but apis that you use on your website so you'll have to authenticate them uh, using the metadata credentials and these credentials would be available for all the accounts that are created under a root microsoft azure account so each credential would be different from each other uh, based on if there are more users for example in our case we created a user for our it manager and then we created a user for a software developer for our software developer we just gave him the storage access for our it manager we basically gave him uh, the administrator access so when they put their credentials down in the code of their web application and they try to connect to azure based on the permissions that they have they would be able to access the resources in case they do not have the permission you will get a corresponding error to that that this particular user does not have the necessary permissions to access that particular resource all right guys so these were the front end components of the azure core architecture now let's talk about the middleware uh, the component which basically acts as a mediator between your just a quick info guys intellipad provides Microsoft Azure certification training 
in partnership with Microsoft, mentored by industry experts. The course link of which is given in the description below. Now let's continue with the session. Touch points that is your front end components and the core components which is uh, the Azure resources. So it acts as a mediator, the Azure resource manager. So Azure resource manager, it basically helps you to deploy and manage the Azure resources, right? It also helps you to organize uh, resources in Azure. For example, uh, it will help you in grouping resources together. Let's say um, I'm launching a web application, okay? And I'm also at the same time launching some other application. Let's say I'm also launching uh, my Android app backend service. So what I can do is, let's say if, if I'm launching a web application, I would need uh, certain components. I would need, let's say I need a separate storage for my web application, right? So I can create a storage account. I would create a web app and then I would create a database server. Now, if I create it just like that in Azure uh, and you try to see all the resources, uh, you would not be able to make out as to which resources are there for my Android application and which resources are there for my web application. What you can do is probably you can define a nomenclature and then you can say probably uh, you can name your instances like uh, let's say for Android database, you can say Android underscore database. For your web application, you can say web app underscore database. So that's one way of sorting it out. But Azure Resource Manager makes it easy for you. How does it make it easy? It basically gives you the ability to create groups, right? So if you're creating one kind of an application, what you can do is you can create a group and inside that group, you can basically just map the resources or launch the resources that are specifically there for that particular application. For example, for a web application, I can launch all the resources that I want and I can group them together uh, in the web application group, right? I can name the group anything. It's just like a folder, guys, if you were to understand it more simply. Uh, understand it's just for sorting out resources. Let's say you have a desktop full of files and those files are PDFs, TXTs, and uh, doc documents. So what you can do is you can just create three folders and inside those three folders, you can put your doc folders and in inside the PDF folder, you can put PDF files inside the text files you can put the text files right so this is the way of sorting on your desktop similarly if you want to sort your resources in azure you can use the uh, ability of creating resource groups using the azure resource manager right and at the same time the third point or the third feature of azure resource manager is it authenticates it checks what all permissions you have and based on that it gives you the ability to control your azure resources right so it also authenticates your calls to the azure uh, resources and only through the azure resource manager would your calls go and if they are accepted by the azure resource manager only then they will be forwarded otherwise they would be rejected and you would get an appropriate message for that all right so guys this was all about the azure resource manager so i was talking to you about uh, what a resource group is so as you can see let's say this is a resource group of mine and what i want to do is i want to group all these three resources so my vm instance that i launch that is termed as a resource if i launch a web app that is also termed as a resource don't worry if you don't understand what a, what is a virtual machine what is a web app i would talk more about this as we move along in the session but for now understand that any service in azure any instance that you launch in azure that is basically a resource right and when you group one or more resources together or i should say two or more resources together for a particular thing which so i gave you the anal analogy of uh, folders if you group them together and that symbolizes something that basically can be done using resource groups and that is exactly what is specified in the figure as well right so you have some virtual machines you have app servers and you have sql database and you have all grouped them together in a resource group and probably you can call it let's say the production environment you can create a test environment call the resource group a test environment and deploy the necessary resources inside that as well so guys with this we come to an end of the azure core architecture so by now you understand the nitty-gritties 
of how Azure works in the backend, right? How things are structured inside Azure. Moving forward, guys, now we will be talking about the Azure services, right? So we'll be talking about the resources that we just saw, the resources that we were grouping inside the resource group or the resources which basically the Azure resource manager was managing. We're going to talk about those and those are nothing but services in Azure, right? So it will become more clear as we move along. So let's just start off now with core Azure services. All right, guys. So before starting off with the services, guys, uh, there's again a simpler way to understand all the services in Azure. What Azure has done is, let's say there are around 300 plus services in Azure, right? Now, it is difficult to actually remember all those services or to basically know how one service is different from the other. So what Azure has done is it has actually divided its services based on what the services does or what the services do, right? Uh, so the major sections that it has divided its services in are these, right? So uh, these are not all the sections that Azure gives us the services in, but these are all the important sections or the important domains in which Azure provides you services. And as a cloud engineer or as a Azure engineer, when you'll be working in companies, mostly you would be working on services which are included in these domains, right? So we'd be covering these guys. There is no Azure engineer out there who would be knowing each and every service in Azure, right? But what we as learners can do is we can learn all the important services which are basically used in your everyday life uh, when you become a cloud engineer, right? And as and when you apply to companies, uh, probably you can tell them you know all the basic services, all the important services in Azure. And if there is any special requirement for a particular service that they use, it is obviously going to be an easier task for you since you understand how Azure works. So understanding one more service in Azure would not be a great deal. But most of the times, I would say 90% of the things that you would be doing as a cloud engineer or 90% of the services that you would be using or working on as a cloud engineer would be covered under these domains. So now let's go ahead and start off with the first domain, which is compute. But before that, let me give you a brief about all of these domains, right? So the first domain is compute. So in compute, you have compute intensive resources wherein you get raw processing power. More on this, we will talk about as we move along. Then the second kind of domain is networking. So this particular domain would include all the services which provide you with networking capabilities, right? Then we have the storage uh, domain, which basically gives you all the services in Azure, which can basically uh, give you the capability of storing some files, right? And obviously there, there are a lot of services in storage and each service is targeted at a different kind of use case. So we're going to discuss some of the storage services in Azure, which are very prominent. Then you have services related to database and analytics. Right. So if you want to store textual data, which also you want to analyze using graphs or uh, using flowcharts, right, you can do that in Azure in the domain database plus analytics. Then our next domain comes out to be AI and machine learning. Now, this is a very important domain, guys. And I've seen actually people who are data scientists, uh, people who are researching on data science. So basically, when you're working on data science or when you're working with AI, you need a lot of computing power, right? Now, the good thing about cloud is that it offers you a pay as you go model, which basically means you only pay for the time you use the resources for, right? And uh, nobody can afford a, you know, a high spec machine. If you need an i7, an octa core processor and a 32 GB RAM, it's very difficult for a layman to get hold of such kind of a machine. So what researchers and what data scientists can do is they can actually launch a machine on Azure with a similar spec that they want for their use case, use it for the time they want and shut it off. And you'll be charged as low as around 0.05 or 06 dollars, I guess for if, if you use it for around half an hour or so, right? So I guess half an hour or 45 minutes should be enough if you want to do a POC or if you even into researching or if you're into testing, I guess this would be the cheapest option for you uh, rather than getting a full blown server or a full blown laptop with high specs and all that will be more expensive for you. So it's better if you use services from cloud for your compute intensive needs, but that is not it. 
what you get in ai and machine learning domain is you get a um, you know you get a pre built dashboard kind of a thing so you don't have to feed in algorithms everything is pre built in azure uh, you basically get a drag and drop kind of a push functionality when you are particularly using azure ml because i've used that i am telling you it's pretty drag and drop uh, if you compare it with its counterparts let's say if you want to do a regression test in r you would actually have to write a long script to do a particular thing but the the kind of services that azure has launched uh, for example like i mentioned azure ml all you have to do is drag and drop and you can get your results right so that's how convenient it is and that's why people are more and more to save their time to save on their costs they are actually using the ai and machine learning capabilities of the cloud and in particular we are talking about azure so azure also has ai and machine learning services which also we will be discussing as we move along in the session right then the next domain is identity so identity domain uh, domain would basically include services which will help you in authenticating users it will help you to uh, basically get the metadata credentials that we discussed earlier for your website so all the authentication part the authorization part uh, whenever you want to uh, give specific permissions to particular users all of that can be managed with the identity services and lastly we would be discussing the domain which is management which would basically include services such as monitoring it would include services uh, such as infrastructure as code right uh, don't worry about these big words guys as we move along everything will be clear but without wasting time let's jump on to our first domain which is compute and let's understand what are the different services that we're going to understand in that right so in compute guys you basically have four prominent services you have virtual machines you have function apps you have app service and then you have the azure kubernetes service so the first service that we're going to discuss about is the azure virtual machine service now what is that now guys azure virtual machines are nothing but it's it's basically a server or i can say uh, in the most layman terms possible let's just say it's a computer uh, just like a laptop which has just installed windows on it and nothing else is there right for example let's say you buy a laptop what is the first thing that you see you see uh, your windows there uh, or you see your mac os there or you see your linux operating system there and basically no 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 software is installed it's just the bare minimum operating system which is given to you and whatever you want to do on your laptop you install it and then you work on right so similarly virtual machines are there virtual machines are nothing but they are machines that are launched by your cloud provider which in our case is azure and they launch it for you so you don't have to worry about uh, where are they getting it from they launch it for you and what they do is they give you the remote access to it right so it's basically like working on your own laptop but working on it from a remote location so similarly you get your own machine on azure which is freshly made right uh, you have a fresh operating system on it there are no softwares installed and whatever you want you can install on this particular server so we call it server because uh, basically you would be using it for uh, deploying applications uh, which would be uh, basically be available to the user so that's why we call it a server right so basically these are server or computers that are launched by azure for your own personal use but you would be accessing it uh, remotely if it's a windows machine in a, in a gui case you can basically do an rdp and use it if it's a linux machine you can do uh, basically do an ssh and you can work on the command line for it but remember guys there are no softwares installed on it there are no extra softwares installed on it so anything that you want the server to do for example let's say you want to create a database server you can just install the database on it and it'll be ready right and it will be ready for accepting requests for the database service if you want it to be a web server you can basically install a parse php etc and then you can put your website on it it'll become a web server anything and everything that you want or that you can do on your laptop you can do on virtual machines so this is what azure virtual machines is guys now the next kind of service is similar to virtual machines but it's actually an advanced version of virtual machine so what are function apps so guys function apps is uh, like i said it's an advanced version of virtual machine in which you do not get the access of the operating system okay so uh, let me give you an example for example uh, let's say uh, you are let's say you're doing some uh, work on a website and that website basically let's say does processing for you 
for example let's say you are on facebook and what you do is you upload a profile picture and once you upload a profile picture let's say you want to crop that profile picture to a particular size and then you want to upload it as a image on your facebook so what will happen so uh, you will upload your image on the facebook app uh, you will do the cropping part let's say you want to add a filter as well you add that filter and then you click on save and then you want it to be uploaded as a profile picture on your facebook right so there is a minimum amount of processing that would have to be done on your image some processing has to be done on your image right and basically how that works is that processing is actually not done on your phone or on your computer on which you are accessing facebook that is actually done on the facebook servers but the way they handle it is uh, they uh, basically would have a web server in place uh, they would separately have a database server in place which would be interacting with your web server and for the processing they have a separate server okay and that separate server is basically called a backend server and what does that backend server do all the requests which comes in it basically processes it and gives out the result that's the sole job of a backend server and why is it separate why is it not integrated with the web server the simple reason for that is let's say there are 100 users who are using your website right and they're constantly exploring your website going through the ui doing uh, uploading images doing processing and everything now your back end component is doing the image processing and the front end component of yours which is a website component of yours is basically serving the website to the users right so there are two tasks happening over there and let's say any one of them they uh, get overloaded with some work right that would hamper the performance of the second component let's say there are more users on the website right so obviously your web component or the website component of your server would require more processing power so let's say it takes up 60% of the processing and let's say what happens is all these people who came in they upload their profile pictures and they put some filter on and they now want to process it so one thing is your server is already busy serving these 100 people your website and the cpu mark is at 60% now because of the processing load which is coming on to your back end component that also re- uh, requires around 80% cpu to work efficiently but now because 60% has already been taken by your website server there's only 40% left so what will happen in this case your server will inadvertently become slow right it becomes slow and it it might even crash in case a deadlock situation happens right and this was usually the case when we were not aware of distributed computing but nowadays what happens is we are dealing in a a uh, world where we cannot afford downtime and that is the reason everything has been distributed right so if there is more load on my backend server my backend server is going to handle it it will not hamper the performance of my website server or my database server so every software component is now distributed and why are we discussing this we are discussing this because we are talking about function app now what is a function app function app is nothing but a backend service on which you do not have to deal with the operating system like you do in virtual machines you do not get an access to the operating system you cannot install any kind of software on it whatever you choose uh, let's say uh, you have an option of choosing what kind of back end code you want to run on the function app let's say your image processing uh, whatever code you have written for the image processing app let's say you have written it in python so when you will be deploying a function app what will be choosing is what kind of code would i be uploading on the function app let's say you choose python the next thing that you would be doing is you would be clicking on next and then it will make your function app ready and then it will ask you for the code for the image processing you give in the code you click on save and now your back end server is ready to accept requests that's it so now all your ba- website server has to do is ping the back end server with the required information with the image it will basically take the image it will run through the code see what it has to be done do the processing on the image and give the image back to the website server or to the facebook servers which will basically upload the profile picture right so in a just what is function app a function app is basically a service which will not give you access to the operating system it will basically give you one dashboard on which you can upload code and it can do any task for you all you have to do is give it work it will do for you and that's about it you don't have to mess around with anything else you don't have to worry about what machine size i should give to my function app you don't have to worry about how many machines should i run so that my function app never gets overloaded everything is managed by azure all 
you have to do is give in the code and see your application working. So these kind of applications are basically called platform as a service. And the earlier uh, service that we discussed was virtual machine. It's basically called infrastructure as a service. Why infrastructure as a service? Because in that case, you got access to the operating system, right? You can do anything on that server. You can install anything. You can actually delete everything also and you can make that server hang or you can make that server not working. You can actually uninstall the installation files of the operating system as well. That is something that you can do with your server. But what will happen is it will not cause any harm to Azure. Basically, you would not be able to use the server and uh, in the far end time, you'll basically have to delete it because it won't be usable. That's the most extreme thing which could happen. But the case with function app is because it's a platform as a service, it's giving you a dashboard on which you can upload code. And hence, it's a platform, right? It is not giving you access to the operating system. It is not giving you access to what software you can install. You just choose the environment in which your code can run and that's it. That's what a function app is all about. It's a backend server without choosing or worrying about the underlying infrastructure. Moving forward, the next service that we have is app service. App service is yet another uh, platform as a service kind of resource that we have in Azure. And what you can do with app services, you can basically launch or deploy websites. Now, you would be wondering that in function app also, I can just give my code and probably I can give my website code and deploy the website for me. No, your function app can only give outputs based on the inputs. It cannot deploy a web application for you. If you want to deploy a web application, you would have to use app service. In app service, you would find a, a resource called web app. You'll have to deploy that. And on that, you will basically get again a dashboard since it's a platform as a service. You will again get a dashboard where you will be able to upload your website files. And once you do that, once the process is finished, you will basically get a link. And if you click on that link, you can see your website, right? So again, we did not get access to the operating system. We do not have control on what softwares are installed. The basic way the app service works is, or uh, in our case, since we are discussing about websites, our web app works is, it will ask you uh, what kind of code is your website written in. Let's say my website is written in Node.js. So I'll just say, I'll just select Node.js and I'll click on next. And the next question they'll ask is, uh, do you want to auto scale when the CPU increases or when the memory is low? Do you want to auto scale? You will say yes, I want to auto scale. You'll click on next and it does everything for you. And the, what, at the end, what you get is again a web UI on which you will have a button called upload on which you just have to upload your website and everything would be set for you, right? There is also an option to just directly mention the GitHub link. It will pull the code from GitHub and it will deploy whatever code was there on GitHub. But the keyword here is it deploys application for you in function app. So this is a very tricky thing that what is the difference between function app and uh, a web app. So function app only does the backend tasks for you. You give it code, it will take an input, it will give you the output. That's it. It is not used to deploy an application. App service, on the other hand, it is only used to deploy an application. Okay, so this is the main difference between a function app and an app service. A next service is probably the, uh, a very important service when you're working in a containerization in, uh, environment. So I'm sure most of you know about what Docker is. If you don't know, just type on YouTube Docker tutorial by IntelliPath. Go through that video and you would be able to understand uh, you know, what Docker is. So Docker is nothing but a containerization platform on which you can deploy applications. So we were talking about distributed computing, right? So containers are nothing but they act as uh, separate virtual entities which are isolated from each other. So I can launch an Ubuntu container. I can launch a, a CentOS container. I can launch a different flavor of Linux container as well, right? In them, I can install any software I want and exactly whatever code files I want, I can put on those containers and these containers can then interact and mimic a distributed application kind of a scenario, right? Now, what Kubernetes is, it manages these containers for you. It's an automatic service which manages these containers. What, what does it manage? Let's say, uh, you know, I deploy three containers. One is my 
वेबसाइट कंटेनर वन इज माई बैक एंड कंटेनर एंड वन इज माई डेटा बेस कंटेनर नाउ फॉर सम रीजन माई बैक एंड कंटेनर इज नॉट वर्किंग ओके इट स्टॉप वर्किंग नाउ वॉट विल हैपन वॉट शुड आइडियली हैपन आइडियली माई इफ इफ माई बैक एंड सर्वर स्टॉप वर्किंग आई नीड टू गेट एन अलर्ट आई विल गो देर आई विल सी वॉट द प्रॉब्लम इज आई विल फिक्स इट एंड एंड देन माई बैक एंड कंटेनर और बैक एंड सर्वर विल अगेन बी रेडी एंड माई एप्लीकेशन वुड सर्व नो वे But what happens is you cannot monitor the application twenty four by seven. So what Kubernetes does for you is it does all the manual tasks for you. So it automatically detects uh, that a fault has occurred in a particular container, and what it does is it deletes that container and launches a new copy of it automatically, right? And this is just one of the tasks that Kubernetes does automatically for you. you can also configure kubernetes to scale your containers for you or descale your containers for you and it can do a host of other things and we would discuss it probably uh, when we move along and we just when we just are focusing on azure kubernetes for service we can actually talk more about it because there are loads of feature in it but this is again a very important service so most of the startup companies uh, not not mncs but most of the startup companies have now adopted uh, the container architecture or have now uh, made their code into uh, fit into containers and now they are using the kubernetes service if i were to give you a little background of the kubernetes service the kubernetes service was actually developed by the google company later they made it open source and now it's available to the world anybody can use it or download for, for free and can actually install it on their system right but when you install it on your system you actually have to manage kubernetes all by yourself so what azure does is it has created platform as a service again and it says i will handle the kubernetes installation i will handle the kubernetes configuration you just tell me what you want and i will deploy that in a kubernetes cluster for you right so all the advantages of kubernetes you get and you also don't have to deal with kubernetes so this is the power of cloud this is what azure is giving you as a service right and this is what azure kubernetes service was all about all right guys so now let's get down to the interesting part let's now start off with a hands on where you will get an taste of how as basically azure portal looks like and also how things work out how you deploy resources on azure and basically in the most essence we learned about what a vm is so we're going to see how we can actually launch a vm inside microsoft azure all right so just give me a minute i'll just switch on to my portal and then we will start on with the demo now before moving over there guys these are the three things that we're going to do so uh, when we were learning the architecture i told you guys that basically all the resources that are deployed on in azure can be managed or they can be group together using resource groups so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to create a resource group which will have the name demo environment okay then what we're going to do is in this demo environment basically we're going to launch a virtual machine which will have a linux operating system on it now once it is deployed we will try to connect to this virtual machine using the putty tool uh, that is available for doing ssh on linux so basically when you whenever you're installing or whenever you're launching a linux linux instance a way to connect to a linux instance is using ssh right because it's a command line operating system and all everything and anything that you want to do on this operating system you can do it on the command line on the contrary if you deploy a windows machine in that case you have to use the remote desktop protocol so it's basically called rdp and there's a software for that which can basically connect uh, using rdp so that is inbuilt in windows so if you are on a windows machine just type on type remote desktop right and you will get that application the only thing it will ask is the ip address click on connect and then it will ask for the password all right guys so without wasting any more time let's go ahead switch to my azure portal and let's see how it looks like right so guys this is my azure portal so let me just go to home and let me show you how it actually looks like so this is how your portal looks like guys this is the web gui that we were talking about now there are some resources that are already launched in my microsoft azure right so as you can see i have named my resources something like this but uh, let's say i am going to deploy a linux vm now right and that linux vm is only for demo purposes now this will actually give you a take as to how 
you can or how resource groups basically can help you guys now if i go to all resources right now you can see these are all the resources which are deployed on azure right now but i do not know which resource is doing what or which resource is contributing to what application on the contrary if i go to resource groups you can see that there is a group which is called intellipart which exists on my microsoft azure portal and if i go inside this resource group i would be able to see all the resources which have been deployed so now what i'm going to do is because uh, what i am doing right now is just for demo purpose so what i'm going to do is i'm going to add a resource group so let me just click on add and let us create a resource group uh, by the name demo environment so i'll type in demo hyphen env right and let's say the region that we have to choose uh, always choose a region guys which is nearer to you so what do you mean by region so region basically means now microsoft azure is so huge that it has deployed or it has set up its data centers in different countries the reason they have done so is uh, because let's say you have your application in or, or you have a startup and you have actually started it up in let's say india right and your application is actually only only accessed by the indian audience right so that's whom you cater to so what you can do is uh, rather than deploying so it makes more sense to deploy your application or your website on uh, in in a region which is nearer to your audience because in that case it the internet routes it will be far lesser when you compare it with launching your application in some other country for example let's say uh, we launch this resource or we create this resource group in uh, let's say us right but my target audience is basically in india now what is going to happen now when my target audience audience is in india and let's say i'm going to the intellipart.com website that is my application every time the data is being fetched from the us and it is being transferred to the uh, indian uh, servers and then uh, from your isp you are getting the data on your system now if we were to make or if we were to deploy our application in india itself what will happen is that the distance that the data has to be cover uh, data will cover will be less and that will significantly increase your response time of the website right so that is why choosing a region is very important you can choose any region you want but i would suggest you choose a region which is more nearer to you right so in our case let's scroll down and see if we have any region which are nearer to me so i can see that we have a region in india which is called south india so let us select that right all right so now the, the region that my resource is getting deployed is in south india right so that's what i have selected the name that i have given is demo environment and now let's go ahead and click on review plus right so this is what is going to happen the subscription is going to be pay as you go if you are under free tier you will see free tier the resource group this is the name that i have given and the region on which this is being deployed is south india let's click on create so now my resource group is being created right and if i do a little refresh over here I can see that my demo environment resource group is present here. Now what I want to do the next step that I have to do let me just go back to my slide is to deploy a linux vm in this demo environment resource group. So let's do that. Let us come back to our azure portal and now what we want to do is we want to deploy a virtual machine. So you will see on the left hand side that there is a service called virtual machines. Let's select that. And now what I have to do is I have to click on add right so because i want to create a virtual machine so i click on add now it will ask you which resource group do you want to make this uh, server available in so i want to basically make it available in demo environment so this is what i have selected what do i want my virtual machine name to be let's say i want my virtual machine name to be new vm hyphen linux okay this is what the name is the region i want it to be nearer to me so i'll select as south india right availability uh, options if you go ahead and choose it you will have an option between availability set or no infrastructure redundancy required so what is redundancy redundancy basically means do you want a copy of your server somewhere else as well so that uh, let's say in the data center where this server is going to be deployed that data center goes down right or something happens and the data gets corrupted so if you choose that you know you want to replicate your server what will happen is even if there is a downtime in a particular data center in which your 
VM was deployed, your redundant server will come into power and that is from where you will get your data. So basically it increases the availability of your application and even if there is a problem from the Azure side, your application will not go down. But since we are doing a demo, what we will select is no infrastructure redundancy required. Uh, what is the image that you want? So by image, we mean the operating system, which what, what kind of operating system do you want to connect to, right? So you have all these operating systems over here. I can actually launch a Windows 10 Pro. I can launch a Windows Server. I can launch Ubuntu 16. I can launch Debian 9, CentOS, SUSE Linux, Red Hat, Ubuntu Server, right? So for our sake, let's consider Ubuntu Server is what we want to deploy. And now it'll ask me, what is the size of the machine that you want to give, right? So what you can do is you can actually change the size. So by default, it'll say you should deploy a two CPU and an eight GB machine. You can just click on change size and you will have all these options available to you, right? So you can see that because what we are doing, going to do is a demo. So what you can see over here is 0.5 GB RAM and a one CPU will basically cost me around 383 rupees per month, right? So let's go ahead and try to deploy this machine, right? So this makes more sense because we are only doing a demo and probably I'll delete it after this session, right? So I've selected this and I click on select now. So you can see it's one vCPU and 0.5 GB memory. Great. Next thing it is asking me is what is the authentication type that you want to give? on this particular machine. You can either choose the SSH public key or what you can choose is password, right? So if you want to choose SSH public key, what you'll have to do is you'll have to generate a SSH public key, right? If you choose password, what it will ask is the username and the password. If you, and this is basically the most standard way of doing it, but if you want to give security to your instance, uh, the suggested method would be to create a public key. Now, how can you create a public key? Uh, there is a software called Putty Gen, right? And the way you can download it is just type on Google, Putty download, right? And then you will get a link from putty.org. Just click on that. And you can say, you will see this link, which says download putty, just click over here, right? Now you will get all the versions on which you can basic using, which you can basically install putty. Now what we're basically looking for is putty gen, right? So you will find it over here based on your CPU architecture. Uh, you can basically select putty gen and then you can download. Once putty gen is downloaded, it will look something like this. So as you can see, it's putty key generator. What I want to do is I want to generate a public private key. So let's click on generate. Now what it will ask is you'll have to hover your mouse here for some randomness and it will create a key based on that. So let's hover our mouse in this region. And now it has created the key for me. Now it says the public key for pasting into open SSH authorized key file. So this is the public key basically, right? And you will have to copy this. Let's copy it. Right, so this is my public key. Now let's come back to my portal. So I can just choose SSH public key and I can paste the public key over here. And this is how it works. Now, if your key is verified, what you will get is a tick mark over here, which basically means that a key has been verified and now you can go ahead, right? So my key is now verified. What that is the next step that I'll have to do? The next step that I'll have to do is I'll have to save the private key, okay? So this is the public key which has been generated. What I have to do is I have to save the private key which I'll be using to connect to my instance. So in this case, you basically do not have to use, you know, any password. If you have this particular file, which will basically be saved. Once I click on yes, let's say I save it on the desktop or let me actually save it somewhere else. Let me save it in the C drive and let me actually create, uh, let's say in the app folder, I'm just creating this private key file and let's name it as Azure hyphen key. Okay. And now I'll click on save. So my PPK has now been saved. If I want to go there, I can just go to C, I'll go to app and I can see that Azure hyphen key PPK is now present over here. Great. So this is done. Now I'll have to specify the username. So let's specify the username as Azure. You can specify any username that you want. 
right? So we have specified it as Azure. Uh, now the next thing that it is asking is, do you want any inbound ports uh, to be enabled on this particular instance? Now we will be connecting the, to this instance from our machine, right? And the protocol that we'll be using is SSH. So we'll have to open the SSH port. So we'll have to click on allow selected ports. And what port do I want to allow? I want to allow SSH port, okay? Uh, let's select HTTP also. Uh, why? I'll tell you that in a few moments once we have the Linux machine up and running, right? In case this was a Windows machine, I will also have to enable the RDP port, which you can just tick over here. In my case, I don't need the RDP port. I just need SSH and I need HTTP too. The use for it, I'll tell you as we move along. All right. So I want SSH and HTTP to be enabled. And what I can now do is I can just click on review plus create. And now it will basically just show me all the configuration for my VM, which is going by default, right? I can just review it and that will be it, right? Now I will show you very something very interesting over here. Let's once this loading is complete. So as you know, cloud computing, it doesn't charge you per month, but basically the pricing model is a per hour kind of a thing. Right. So as you can see, the machine that I'm launching right now is right now 50 pesa per hour. This is the rate or this is basically the pricing of my machine that I'm going to launch. So that's awesome. Right. The next thing is the OS which is being launched is Ubuntu Server 18.04. That is also great. And if you want, you can actually look at the username, which is Ubuntu, sorry, Azure. What are the public inbound ports? It's SSH and HTTP. Uh, the disk type is SSD. Is it a managed disk? Yes. Uh, the network, it's basically creating a new network for me, which is, uh, which goes by the same resource group name, which is demo hyphen ENV. So what is going to happen is guys, when I launch this particular VM, a lot of things will be created. It will create disks. It will create um, networks and everything related to it will actually go inside that particular resource group, right? So I'll show you how to do that. Just click on create once you feel everything everything is right and now my machine is basically getting created okay so let's wait for a few while it will take like a minute or so to deploy your machine so let's wait for that time and let's hope this deploys soon so as you can see it says your deployment is underway once it's complete you will see a different message over here so let's wait for that message to appear All right guys, so my deployment is complete. As you can see, the message is being told over here. So the next thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to resource groups. And now I can see that I have something called as demo hyphen ENV. I will go inside that. And over here, I have all the related resources to my VM, okay? So guys, as you can see, my virtual machine is this particular resource. So let me go inside that. And now what I'll have to do is I'll have to select this IP address. This is the IP address on which the instance is available. So let's copy this IP address. And now let's open the putty tool. Now what is the putty tool? We used putty gen before to create the key. Now for connecting to the instance, you will have to use the putty tool. Now how do you download the putty tool? Again, back to your tab where you opened the download uh, web page. Now over here, you will have to select putty.exe, it says the SSH and Telnet client itself. You'll have to download this according to your architecture and then you will have a tool which looks something like this. Now what I want to do is I want to connect to this IP address which I've just copied from the Azure portal and I will have to go inside SSH and I'll have to go inside auth and now I will have to select the PPK which will basically be used to connect to my machine which is Azure-key. Let's click on open. And now everything is ready guys. So I have selected the PPK. I have inserted the IP address and now let's click on open. So it will ask. So whenever you connect to a new IP address, it will give you this warning. Don't worry about it. Just click on yes. And now it is asking, what do you want to log in as? So remember the username that we gave was Azure. So let's select that and hit enter. And that's it. That's about it guys. So now you're inside your Linux machine, which is the Ubuntu machine. And now you can do anything with it as you feel necessary, right? Now you will ask me one thing that, you know, we deployed a 
we we allowed http connection why did i do that just to show you so show you one very awesome thing now since this is ubuntu the commands that i'll be entering now is uh, basically for ubuntu and if you want to copy these commands you will also have to install uh, or you will have to launch ubuntu os right so what i'm going to do is i'm going to make this server as a web server so in order to do that i'll pass on the commands sudo apt get so let's update this machine first sudo apt get update and this will now update the machine all right so my machine is now updated now let's go ahead and install apache so sudo apt get install apache 2 so guys what is apache apache is basically a software for web server and what is right now happening is it is being installed on my ubuntu machine once it gets installed on my ubuntu machine all i have to go do is i'll have to go to the ib address of my vm instance and then i will be able to see a web page over there right so it's almost complete guys so let's wait for this to complete and then we'll move forward all right so my apache has now been successfully installed and now if i go back to my machine or my portal my azure portal i'll just copy this ip address and now let's paste it in a new tab and hit enter can you see you this is basically a website uh, which has been created by apache 2 uh, it's basically a default page which you see when you have installed apache 2 but nevertheless guys if you guys go to this ip address given that i would not shut off this machine you will be also able to see this particular page which is basically the apache 2 ubuntu default page now what i can do is i can also go ahead and edit this web page right so let's go ahead and go to the location where this web page is basically stored so it's stored inside var www.html and this is the index.html file which is being shown over here so what i'll do is i'll just change the name of this index.html file to let's say one.html file and i'll have to give sudo in order to do that and now let's create one more index.html and let's say uh, this is a html page whose title would be demo website right and the body of this would basically have a heading which would go like welcome to intellipaths azure okay so this is what i specify i close the headers and i close the body and i close the html as well okay so i've closed the html i've closed the body i've given the h1 i've given the title as demo website let's save it and if i do an ls now i can see that there is an index.html present now if i do a refresh you can see i'm getting this welcome to intellipass is your training and the title of my page is demo website right now you would have also noticed i made the apache page as 1.html so if i go to 1.html this is the ubuntu default page and if i simply go on the ip address it will open index.html which is basically this so what is microsoft azure microsoft azure is a cloud provider that provides various platform as a service and infrastructure as a service products Azure has cloud solutions to all the infrastructural problems by providing services in various domains. Did you know that almost 95% of Fortune 500 companies are using Azure? Also, it is 5 times cheaper than AWS in terms of Windows and SQL Server because there are also Microsoft products. Forbes say that Microsoft Azure is set to boost the size of the IT market by $10 trillion in the next 10 years. As per predictions, 80% of the businesses will move their workload to cloud by 2025, thus making it a major career to consider transitioning to. For a better understanding of Azure, let us start at the very beginning. Microsoft Azure was announced in October 2008 
and released on February 1, 2010 as Windows Azure first and later named as Microsoft Azure on 25th March 2015. In today's scenario, its reach is in 140 countries and is still expanding which is pretty impeccable. In simpler terms, Microsoft Azure is a platform that enables users to engage in agile cloud computing and is designed for creating and managing apps through Microsoft's data center. Now there are four integral Microsoft Azure service domains. The first one is Azure Compute. Compute is the most integral domain in Azure as it brings everything together with Azure Virtual Machines. You can get on-demand scalable compute resources, Azure Virtual Machines, App Services and Container Instances are some popular compute services. Second we have Azure Networking, Networks from the Cloud Networks. In Azure, VNet is the networking tool that connects all Azure resources together. These networking services allow enterprises to safely connect their on-premises services to the Azure Cloud. It is also used to manage virtual private networks and further create multiple virtual networks on the cloud. The third one is Azure Storage. Azure Storage provides storage solutions that are more durable and large-scale applications, data-driven applications can be built without any hassle. Azure automatically scales the storage requirements according to the usage and it automatically balances throughput according to the connections made. And the last one is Azure Database. Azure provides relational databases, NoSQL databases, data lakes and data warehouses. It provides a scalable, high available and fault tolerant database server and lets you scale according to the incoming data. There are various job roles in Azure. Let's take a look at one of the most popular job roles, Azure Developer. An Azure Developer is a cloud professional who creates cloud-based applications making use of the benefits of the cloud architecture. If you are proficient in testing, security, development and deployment, then a career in Azure development is somewhere you will fit in well. The job includes responsibilities like testing of applications, maintaining, developing and deploy them on Azure. It also includes participating in all phases of development and having the ability to work side by side with cloud administrators, clients and cloud architects. In United States, on average basis, an Azure developer gets paid $132,148 per annum. However, for an entry-level developer, it's $97,000. Whereas in India, the salary offered ranges from 7 lakhs to 25 lakhs per annum. That's all about Azure. Just a quick info guys. IntelliPad provides Microsoft Azure certification training in partnership with Microsoft, mentored by industry experts, the course link of which is given in the description below. Now let's continue with the session. So guys, we have successfully deployed our Linux VM on Azure and we have successfully hosted a website also on this particular server. Now guys, remember that this is infrastructure as a service. Now what I've done is, I had the access to the operating system. I basically installed Apache 2 and then I put a website over there in that particular folder, which is var www.html and then I got the website, right? So this is infrastructure as a service. You're getting the whole operating system and you can do anything with it. I can also install MySQL on it and I can configure my website to basically talk to the MySQL server, right? I can do anything with this server. Now, when you compare it with app services, which we saw earlier that app services are basically platform as a service or function as a service. Functions app is also an, a platform as a service. Now, how is it different? From the hands-on po point of view, you will basically not be using Putty. You will basically just deploy that app, that is the web app, and you will get a URL instead of an IP address. You will get a URL and if you go to that URL, you will see a default page. So let's, uh, let's say you saw a default page uh, when we installed Apache 2, you will see a default page from Azure uh, when you go to that link that this is a default page for the web app that you have deployed. 
right? And you, if you find the dashboard, you will see a button called upload. And what you can do is uh, like I created this index.html file, you can also create yours and you'll just have to upload it. Now Azure will take care where that file has to go inside the file system, right? And it will take care that on the link when you go now, you will see your website. It will take care whether what software it has to install, whether it have, wants to install Apache 2, which is basically the web server, or uh, there are several other web servers as well. You have Nginx, you have, you know, Tomcat. So anything that you want uh, or anything uh, which is configured in Azure would be automatically installed. And all you will get is a button which will ask you to upload the website. So you would not get direct access to the operating system. And hence it is called platform as a service. Similarly with functions app, in app services basically you can deploy applications in function app. You cannot deploy application, it is simply a place where you just put your code and that code will be done, right? So if, if in short I'll have to tell you what functions app is, it basically does processing. Okay guys, so guys this was our demo, this was the first demo as to uh, how the you can launch virtual machines on Azure. Now let's go ahead to our next topic. All right guys, so next in our list are the networking services of Azure. So let's go ahead and start with them. So guys, basically there are five core services in networking that you should know of. The first one being the very important one, which is virtual networks. Now what are virtual networks? Virtual networks are basically isolated environments or isolated networks on the Azure infrastructure for whatever machines or whatever VMs that you launch in Azure and if you want them to talk to each other. For example, I deployed an application where probably I would have a database, I would have a backend server, I would have a frontend server. Now all these servers have to interact with each other so that the whole application can basically function. Now how can they interact with each other? They can interact with each other only when they are on one network, right? So that is very important. Otherwise they will have to interact with each other, other over the internet, but that is not a secure thing to do, right? A secure thing to do is when instances or when servers interact on their own private network, which is basically not accessible to the outside world. It is only accessible to the administrator who has possibly launched those instances. So in those cases, we need virtual networks. And also one more thing that when you're using virtual networks, or if you're using private networks in Azure, you basically get a bandwidth of around one GB per second, right? That is the kind of bandwidth that you get when you are dealing with instances which are in the same network that is in the same virtual network. But if instances have to interact over the internet, obviously the bandwidth will go down and at the same time it is not secure, right? So whenever you want to launch any resource in Azure, which basically can be launched inside a network, they are launched inside a virtual network and you do not have the option of launching an instance or a server without a virtual network. You have to launch it inside a virtual network. Now that if you don't want to use it and want to have instances talk over the internet, that is your choice. But Azure does not give you an option of deploying an instance without it being a part of a virtual network. All right. So guys, this is a virtual network. Moving forward. Now let's talk about load balancers. Now what are load balancers? Now this is a very important service. Reason being when you deploy your application on cloud, one of the most popular reasons of deploying applications on Azure is because you can get high availability, which basically means you can launch your application on multiple servers. So that even if one server fails, the other server can basically be their replica and they can serve the application, right? So this results in a high availability of your application. Now, what is a load balancer? A load balancer basically sits in front of multiple virtual machines which have the same application running on them, right? And it sits in front of it. Now, obviously, if you are a customer, you do not realize whether an application has been made redundant on multiple servers, right? If you go to facebook.com or if you go to intellibar.com, you wouldn't realize how many servers are actually working in the back end. So how is it possible, right? You have to know, uh, basically servers, they have IP addresses, right? So you as a customer should know which IP address you should ping. But all you do is you go to a particular domain, let's say intellipar.com and you get the website. So how is it actually working? So basically the way it works is that load balancer has its own IP address or domain name, 
and what the load balancer does is it basically randomly spreads the request out to the n number of servers it has let's say my intellipart website resides on five servers wherein one is the primary server and four are the redundant servers but all these five servers are basically serving my website now when a customer comes onto intellipart.com his request is processed in this fashion that whenever he comes to intellipart.com basically he is routed to the load balancer's uh, domain name or ip address and once a request reaches the load balancer the load balancer sees what which server basically has less load right and the server which has less load it sends the request to it right now load balancer is also an important concept you must have heard about auto scaling right or if we talk it in terms of azure it's basically called vm scale sets so what happens in that uh, particular scenario is we specify a threshold limit we specify that whenever the cpu usage goes beyond 80% of the aggregate number of servers let's say there are four servers and the average cpu load on all these four servers has gone beyond 80% right so what happens in that case it will basically launch a new instance now when it launches a new server with the same application your load balancer should also route traffic to it and that is when load balancer plays a key role it plays a key role when you're doing auto scaling and at the same time it plays a key role when you have multiple servers which are basically serving the same application and you want to equally divide the traffic coming onto your servers or uh, basically coming onto your load balancer on your servers right so this is what a load balancer is as the name suggests right but the load balancer in its ba most basic sense it it basically does it uh, randomly right it randomly equally distributes the traffic among all the servers it does not find uh, follow any protocol or rule as in how it has to basically divide the traffic right so this kind of process or this kind of procedure when it is followed it is basically called a round robin fashion of distributing traffic right the next kind of load balancer is the application gateway load balancer now what is application gateway load balancer the application gateway load balancer basically works a little different from the normal load balancer that we discussed earlier so in the application gateway load balancer basically the load is distributed based on rules now what are those rules those rules are basically paths now for example if i go to intellipart.com slash blog right what will happen i get to see the blogging website and if i go to intellipart.com slash all courses i basically see all the courses which are there on the website now how does that work now you if you, if you are from an it background if you, and if you understand how servers work you might say that there must be two folders inside the root document of uh, the web of the server wherein inside the all course uh, folder you have the code for displaying all the courses and inside the blog folder you have the code for showing all the blogs but that is not actually how it works right so basically if if you if i were to talk about our infrastructure the intellipath infrastructure we have a separate server for blogs and we have a separate server for all the courses that we have right now the load balancer that we use is an application gateway load balancer it's kind of like that so basically what happens is whenever it sees that in the url there's a path which says slash blog it basically routes the traffic onto the blogging server and whenever it sees that the path is slash all courses it routes the traffic to my courses server so this is how it works this is called path based routing and basically it works on the layer 7 so if you guys are aware of the osi model uh, right so according to the osi model the application gateway load balancer works on layer 7 right now if you are not from cs background if you, and if you didn't understand what what i just said it is okay so in the most basic sense what uh, the application uh, the layer 7 that it works on in the most basic basic sense what that means is that application gateway load balancer does path based routing right whatever path is there in the request based on that path it basically routes the request to a particular server you can also define a default rule in case anything which is there except 
slash blog and slash all courses if there is a default uh, server that you want to send your request to that is also possible like for example you would have seen that uh, some websites if the link is not found on that website they basically route to a 404 page right now how do, how does a typical 404 page look like right if you look a 404 page it basically says error 404 content not found right but some websites uh, like if you if you would have visit flipkart.com or amazon.com or even in telepath.com in the, uh, that case if you try to search for something which is not there on the blog for example let me just switch to my browser right and let us go to let's say in telepath.com uh, and let's say slash azure right now what will happen it will basically give me a 404 page and let's see how that looks like okay so there is a slash azure thing let me do one thing let me type in some gibberish uh, content and let me just search for that so this should give me a 404 right so you can see i've got an oops page which says we were unable to find the page you are looking for and if i change the content also over here let, let's say we enter some random text again i will again see this page can you see it says page not found and this is similarly the way it happens for other websites as well for example if i go to amazon.in and i again search for something gibberish let's see what happens it says 404 document not found and this is basically a custom page right and if i again go to anything other any other gibberish url i again get this page now how is how is that working so that is working because they also are using an application load balancer which basically says anything other than the rules that we have specified if someone goes or tries to go to a particular uh, url like the one that we have specified route them to the 404 page which is this right and that's how the application load balancer is bringing you to this particular 404 page right so guys this is the application gateway the next service that we have in networking is called the dns zones now what is dns zone now uh, any website that you go to guys you do not enter the ip address for that website right you basically enter a domain name and that domain name basically gets you to the website right you never enter the ip address so similar is the case with dns zones as well so what dns zones helps you in is basically it helps you to route your domain to the azure resource where your application basically resides for example you go to any uh, domain website and you buy a domain let's say you buy a domain which is uh, uh, personal website dot xyz let's say you buy this domain now you want to route what whoever is going to this domain you want to route the traffic to one of the virtual machines that you have launched in your azure portal now how would you do that for doing that you will have to go inside the dns zones service of azure and you basically will get some name servers right those name servers are basically dns servers that azure owns and those dns servers you would have to specify in your domain uh, so where you bought your domain you would basically get a dashboard wherein you can uh, put there's uh, the, the dns servers which the domain that you have bought will ping on right for example whoever would be going to personal website dot xyz would basically be routed to those dns servers that you will be mentioning over there right and those dns servers you get from dns zones the next thing that you do is you specify in the dns zones that who whatever traffic is coming from the domain that I, that that basically i've specified route them to this particular vm instance i'll have to specify that in dns zone service and that is how it will work so whenever you need a use or whenever you have a use case like uh, you have the domain with you or uh, even if you want to buy a domain you can actually buy the domain at uh, the azure dashboard as well but let's say you have the domain itself right and you want to point it to any azure resource which is existing in your uh, dashboard so the way to do that is going inside dns zone right our next service guys is again a very important service which is called cdn now what is cdn cdn basically means content delivery network now how does that work what is a content delivery network a content delivery network basically it basically improves uh, the time taken to basically serve you a website for example if you go to amazon.com or if you go to facebook.com let's say 
do you happen to see the speed with which the website loads if you have a good internet connection it loads very fast right now where do you think the web facebook website is actually hosted right now what happens is now facebook is a multinational corporation right it's a it's a big website which is actually being used by the whole world right so they have different data centers across the globe from where the requests are basically served but let's talk about a smaller scale website let's let's talk about intelepart.com right we don't serve the whole world we basically might have around 400 to 500 people uh, at a particular time on our website right now what happens is we get traffic from across the globe right we want everyone to have a speedy experience when it comes to them using our website right now what is what what are the ways that i can ensure that let's say my traffic is coming from us right uh, the traffic that comes from us is like let's say 60% of my overall traffic so what i can do is i can set up my data center in the us so that the us people will actually get the website fast right but let's say someone is accessing the website from japan so in that case what he will have to do is whenever he goes to intelepa.com the request will basically be sent to the us servers and from the us servers the request will come back and that's when his website will start to load right so this basically increases latency latency is basically response time of a particular application in our case it's a website in telepa.com now if you want to reduce latency what are the different ways to do that uh, the different ways to do that is the first way that you can do it is you can basically open a data center in japan as well and load all your uh, scale up the number of servers that you have and then also put your website over there and whenever people from japan will basically be accessing your website they should be seeing the japanese version of the website and the people in the us they should be seeing the us version of the website the people in india should be seeing the indian version of the website right that's how it works when you use an e-commerce website like amazon so you have amazon.in you have amazon.com for australian people it's amazon.au right so for different pe- countries it has the different extension which basically means that that particular website is being served from their home country's data center right but there is another way to basically serve your website faster and that way is basically called cdn now what is cdn cdn basically caches all your state static data right for example what kind of static data are we talking about let's talk about videos let's say my intelepart website also plays videos in the self paced courses now if you are a person who is uh, in japan and let's say my servers are there in the us so what will happen is the moment you try to play a video on my website that video will get downloaded to the nearest location of an azure data center right So while you're watching that video that video has been downloaded on the data center of the Azure premises in Japan and what happens in, uh, later is basically whenever any other person in Japan would try to access that website he will get access to it through the Japan server rather than the US server so what you have done is you have set up your servers in US you have not set up your servers in Japan but what you have done is you have basically enabled CDN on your website and what happens in that case is all the static content is basically loaded onto edge servers of azure so whatever servers are used to cache data cache static data uh, in the cdn services are called the edge servers right so the, whoever is accessing my website from whatever part of the world if they have a azure data center near them my content will basically automatically get downloaded over there and whenever there is a next person who is trying to access it that already downloaded data will be served to him directly and that's how i reduced the latency of my application without setting up servers in different locations for different kind of uh, traffic that i get right so this is how it drastically reduces cost because i'm not launching new servers and at the same time it serves the purpose of reducing your latency of your application so this is what cdn profiles is guide so guys these were the core services in networking of azure right now let's move forward and talk about a next set of services which are basically the storage services all right so guys next in our list we have the storage services of azure so let's go ahead and have a look at them so guys essentially there are six services that you should know of while you are using azure in terms of storage 
Zig services are blob, file storage, tables, queues, data lake storage, and data box. So let's discuss them one by one. The first one being blob. Now, what is blob, guys? Blob basically means binary large objects, right? So if you have binary files and you want to store them on Azure, blob storage is the answer for you, right? So it can store anything from music files or, or it can store video files. It can also store text documents, any kind of file that you want to store on Azure can be stored on Blob. Now, Blob also can be used with your in conjunction with your websites and they, it can basically act as a storage server for you, right? It also enables you to host content which is publicly accessible over a link. It can also host static websites on uh, its storage. So that is what Blob is, guys, right? So most of the time you would see that companies, um, if they have a website, all its static content is actually picked up from the blog, right? So this was about the blog guys. Our next service is file storage. Now what is file storage? File storage is basically a shared file storage that can be used with multiple computers. That basically means if I have five servers, right? And let's say they uh, need a particular file for uh, they're working and all these five servers basically need the same file. So what I can do is I can basically create a drive or I can create a storage point on file storage and all, all these five servers can be used or can be used to basically mount the file storage drive on them, right? And any change that, that is done from one server on the central uh, repository of file storage would all those changes would be reflected on all the next four servers the use that i can think of uh, for file storage is let's say you have an application which writes data onto uh, a particular file right and basically this application of yours is spread across multiple servers to ensure it is highly available right let's say you have an application which basically writes data right and this application is spread across five servers now what happens is you uh, we've already discussed the role of a load balancer you hit the load balancer and you're randomly assigned a server and you work on it let's say you worked on server one as a customer you would not know which server you're working on correct let's say you worked on server one right you saved your changes and now this files are now saved on server one but the next time you hit the url now you are on server three if you are on server three, you would not realize it, but your work, you would expect it to be there on server three as well. Now here comes a problem. If there is no central storage for all these five servers, they will be asynchronous in nature in the sense that they will not sync data with each other. Whatever changes are done on the first server, the third server, the fourth server and the fifth server will be unaware of it, right? And that is when the arise the need of a central storage. And that is what file storage is for, right? You can, it basically uses the SMB protocol, SMB. Uh, so basically SMB 2.1 and 3.0 is compatible with file storage. And recently even Linux platforms uh, like Ubuntu, CentOS, and even Mac OS have started supporting uh, SMB, right? So it essentially would recommend you to use SMB 3.0, but there are some OS versions which could have uh, SMB 2.1. For example, if you're using Ubuntu 16 or Ubuntu 14.04, they are basically using SMB 2.1, right? So it has the backward compatibility as well for older OS like Ubuntu 14.04. So if you want to mount a drive on Ubuntu, which basically is uh, hosted on Azure file storage. You can do that using the SMB protocol. There are a list of softwares that have to be installed. More than that, we can discuss uh, when we study file storage in detail. But for now, because we are in a tutorial session, we are basically, I just told you what file storage is used for. So if you were to ask, or if you were to think of a use case where you need a central storage kind of a thing. Now you know that you have to use Azure file storage. Moving on guys, our next service is Azure table. Now Azure table is basically a NoSQL data store, 
right? And it can help you to store structured data, right? It, it basically can store structured data. It has table, tabular columns and tabular rows in which you can save data, but it is no SQL in nature, which means the data does not have to be in symmetry, right? Your next data could have eight columns. The third, the third row could have two columns. The fourth row could have just five columns. It could take any kind of data, but the only condition is that the data should be structured among columns, right? So if there is any kind of need for storage of data of this kind, you can use Azure table. Our next kind of storage is Azure queues, which basically is used with stateless systems, right? Systems which do not know of what all jobs are executing on the count part or on the replicated servers of their application. For example, let's say there is an image processing website and what it does is it, the moment you upload an image, you can process the website uh, or sorry, process the image according to your need, right? So what happens in this case? Let's say there are 200 people on the website and they've all pressed the process image button together. And what will happen? There are 200 images that have to be processed and obviously, not all 200 images can be processed at the same time. So what happens is the images are processed one by one. And let's say in the backend server where the processing is done, there are five servers who are doing the processing. Okay. Now all these five servers, they pick up an image at random from the queue. So let's say the queue is first and first out, whichever image comes first goes out first as well. So whenever the job of the first server is done, let's say it was doing a processing on an image and the image processing is done, it picks up another image from the queue. The second server would also do the same. The third server would also do the same, right? So what happens is, let's say the first server, it processed image one. Now the second, third, fourth, and fifth server, they would not know whether the first image has been processed or not, and they can process it again. So for those kind of scenarios and for solving those kind of situations, we had queues which basically streamline all the content which has to be processed and whichever content is taken up by a particular server, it deletes it from the stack and then puts the second uh, image or the second object, which basically has to be processed, right? So for these kind of scenarios, you use Azure queues. Our next kind of service is data lake storage. Now data lake storage is similar to that of a blob, uh, not a blob, but tables, Azure tables. So data lake storage can store data, but it is basically used to store data for big data analytics. It specializes in that particular core segment. So if you have a big data analytic use case and you want to store data for that, data lake storage is should be the choice for you. Right. So this is about data lake storage, guys. The next service that we have is Azure data box. Now, what is Azure data box? Now you might think of your company, let's say, let's say you're working for a company and you have all the servers on premise, right? You have been working since 15, 20 years in the sector that you are, I mean, your company, and you do not, did not have cloud at that time. And what I've done is you've bought your own servers, you have hosted your own applications, but now the cost incurring for those servers is too high when you compare it with the cost which is there in cloud computing when you opt for cloud computing. So now what I have decided is basically that you want to migrate all your applications to Azure data box. Okay. Or, uh, sorry to Azure. So let's say there are five, pet there's five petabytes or let's say thousand terabytes of data that you have to transfer on Azure. Now in businesses time, is very important guys. Time is money. Basically, you must have a heard of that phrase. So everything is required at a fast pace. And if you want to transfer 1000 terabytes of data, imagine the data transfer costs, which would incur to you. And also it would take a lot of time to upload 1000 terabytes of data via internet to Azure, right? You would agree on that. Now to solve problems of this scale, when you have a large amount of data, that you want to transfer onto Azure Cloud. What Azure does is it basically gives you a physical device on which you can load your data, right? So Azure Data Box is a service in which you can you can basically request a box kind of a system from Azure, which basically ships to your company. You can load all your data onto it, and then that box is again shipped back to Azure Cloud, and all your data is again uploaded 
to Azure Cloud from their data center directly, right? So this not only reduces the time taken to transfer data, but it also hugely reduces the cost that you would incur in the internet charges because 1000 terabytes is not less data guys. Now 1000 terabytes is very less when I talk about a company which is existing since 15 years and when you talk about multinational corporations, the data can be in petabytes, right? And if you have a petabyte scale data that you want to transfer to Azure, it would take weeks, if not months to transfer that kind of data. So that is where Databox comes in and Databox, uh, Databox, Azure Databox can basically support around five petabytes of data at one time. Right now, if five petabytes of data is less for you, you can request multiple boxes from Azure too, and multiple boxes will reach your location. You store your data onto it. I mean, you copy your data onto it and then request Azure back that you can take away your data boxes and they will take the data boxes back to the data centers and transfer their data directly. Right. This will reduce your time to around one week of time. So your data of petabyte scale can be transferred to Azure in less than a week. And at the same time, you would also save on huge internet costs. Right. So guys, this is what the data box service of Azure is. All right, guys. So now let's go ahead and do this hands on on Azure blob storage. So let me quickly switch on to my Microsoft Azure portal, which is this. All right, guys, so this is my Microsoft Azure portal. What I want to do is I want to show you guys how the blob storage works in Azure, right? So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go into storage accounts. And over here, you will find that there is a storage account called demo environment. Why is it here? Because I created virtual machine with the name demo environment. Right. And obviously the virtual machine requires some storage. If you go inside this, you will see that you have the four options that we discussed that are blob files, tables and queues. What we are interested in is blob. So we'll just click on that and you can see that this has boot diagnostics for the new VM Linux that we launched earlier. Right. So all the logs for that VM are basically going inside this container. So basically if I go inside this container, you can find that these are the two text files which are present will basically will have the log data of that VM that we launched, right? So, but we're not here for that. What we basically want to do is I'm going to show you guys how you can use blob. Now, no matter what you are working on if you want to create a blob storage for yourself you will have to create a storage account right in our case this was the vm storage account if you are starting a fresh uh, on azure you will not have any storage accounts over here right so let's create a storage account first then let's try to name it something relevant which might go with uh, the demo that we are doing so the resource group that we want to add it in is demo environment and the storage account name that we want to give is let's say intellipart hyphen zero. Let's say this is the one that we want to give. Okay. Where is the location that we want the storage account to be in? As discussed earlier, we'll choose the nearest location to us. So in that case, the nearest location would be Asia Pacific South India. Let's try to choose this location. Right now, how do you want the performance? It could be either standard or premium. We can discuss this later, probably when we'll discuss this service in detail in our further sessions. But for now, let's let it be at standard, right? Put everything at default. And now let's click on review plus create. When you do that, it will ask you all the, it will basically show you all the information with respect to the storage account that we are creating. If everything looks good, just click on create. Once you have clicked on create guys, your storage account uh, will take some time and then it will become ready for use. And like earlier, I specify all you have to do is go to resource groups. Uh, let's say this is the demo environment uh, that we created earlier. I'll go inside this and now I can see all the things that I had launched are present over here. Even the storage account that I'm creating that is that is basically being launched right now. I can see that also over here, as you can see, it's in Telepart Azure. This is the storage account that I created. And now it is visible inside demo environment resource group. 
on the other hand if i go to all resources i'd be able to see all the resources that are there on my azure account but this looks a little messy and that's why resource groups are pretty helpful guys because i know that my uh, resource that i've deployed is sits inside a specific resource group and that resource group basically i can name uh, on the basis of what task that particular particular resource is going to do since ours is a demo session what we have done is all the resources that we are basically deploying are inside the demo environment resource group right and right now we just deployed this storage account which is in telepod azure and as you can see it has been successfully deployed now let's go inside the storage account and like we saw earlier you see a similar user interface over here you have four options either to go inside blob or to go inside files or tables or queues let me demonstrate to you how blobs work so we'll go inside blobs guys and as you can see there are no containers over here what are containers containers are nothing but root folders right for example on windows you have the desktop folder so desktop folder becomes the root folder or to give you a better example let's say i you go to the c drive of your computer right whatever is inside the c drive is the root of the drive if you create a folder inside that drive and you then put files inside that folder that is no longer the root directory right so in whenever you are uploading files on blobs the first thing that you need is a root directory and that root directory is nothing but containers right so let's go ahead and create a container so i click on a new container and let's name this container let's say as in telepart okay and now let's click on okay all right so my new container is now ready now you would have noticed that there is something called as access level and right now the access level is private more on this i'll explain to you as we move along so right now we have not changed it to anything it's private and let it be at private now what i'll do is i'll go inside this container and it says no blobs found right so what i can do is i can upload some files onto this container and for doing that i'll have to click on upload and now i'll have to select the file so let's so these are some images that i have on this system so what i'll do is i'll just select a random image and now let's upload this image onto my blob all right so this image is now uploaded on the blob and what i can do is i can just click on this image and i can see all the information with respect to it it's in it's 88 kb in size this is the last modified time this is the creation time now here is something interesting guys i have the url to the file that i have uploaded right now this url can be embedded anywhere it can be embedded on a website it can be embedded on a post that you're making to social media this basically is a file which is now hosted on the internet and anywhere anyone who has a access to this particular link would be able to see the image that you have just uploaded awesome isn't it right so what i'm going to do is let me copy this link and let me open it in a new tab right and i'll hit enter so right now it says resource not found the specified resource does not exist now why do you think this happened this happened because we did not give access to the container for general public use right what do what does that mean if i click on the container and i click on change access level it's right now private which means i can only access this blob through the azure portal or through uh, you know cli or through some other way but only that way would be working now if i want anyone and anywhere who wants to access this file I'll have to go ahead and choose anonymous read access for blobs only, right? So when I do that, I've just selected blob over here and I click on OK. Now the permissions for the files inside this container has changed. And what does that mean? That basically means if I refresh this now, I would be able to see this image over here, right? Similarly if this link is copied by you and pasted on your browser you also would be able to see this particular image right so guys this is what a blob storage is you can use blob storage to dump data uh, such as logs such as images such as videos 
that could be either private if your uh, application does not want to use it and you just want to keep there keep it there for uh, you know just keeping it there or what you can do is you can provide it a public read access on the blob level that is for all the files will have public read access and those files will then be able to use by just going to their link let me upload one more file for you guys so that you are clear with the concept of defining permissions so i've defined the permissions on the container so i don't have to do anything now i'll just upload the images and this is a new image which has been uploaded and now if i go inside the image and i copy the link and if i paste the link over here you can see i am able to see the screenshot even here right the moment i go out and i change the access level to private and i click on ok now if i refresh okay so it did not change uh, the permissions of the files not visible okay so that basically took some time for the permission to get allocated on the container which basically means uh, like if i go out and if i change the access level again to blob and if i refresh this files yes i'm able to see them right and again if i go out and if i change the access level to let's say private again and if i refresh the first refresh it is there the second refresh it is there but if you wait for some time like a minute or so this access will basically be gone as you can see it now says resource not found right so with a click of a button you can basically control all the files permissions which are there inside a container and grant them public or private read access all right guys so guys this was a brief demo about blob storage on azure let us come back to our slides right so guys i i hope now you're clear with what blob storage is now let's move forward and talk about our next set of services which are the database and the analytics service in microsoft azure right so basically there are five core services that you should know of when you're dealing with azure in terms of database and analytics so the first service is the SQL database service, which basically is a database as a service, right? You do not get an access to the operating system on which this database is installed. You basically get access to only the database. And basically, if you remember what we have studied earlier, for a service which does not give you access to the operating system, but in turn gives you access to a platform kind of a thing where you can interact with the service and probably upload something onto the uh, software being used is called platform as a service. So Azure SQL database is basically a platform as a service, which not only gives you the independence from the infrastructure side, but at the same time, it is highly scalable and it can provide you up to 212% of return on investment. That means that whatever money you are gonna spend on Azure SQL database, the benefits that it is going to provide you is going to give you back 212% of the money that you would be investing in using Azure SQL database. Isn't that interesting? right so guys this was the first service among the database and analytics services in azure our next service is cosmos db now guys cosmos db is basically a fully managed database service again just like sql server but in this case what happens is your database is extremely highly available which means it is distributed throughout the world using azure regions and it is highly available right uh, so basically what happens is when you launch a cosmos db cluster it distributes or it creates a replica of the database in multiple regions as you specify right and the cool thing about cosmos db is whatever region you want to close or want to stop and probably you do not want your database to be replicated in a particular region you can do that with the click of a button. If you want it again in some other region, you can again do that with a click of button. So everything is fast. Everything is at one 
the whole control is at one central place and you can replicate your database accordingly with that one platform or with one that one cosmos db dashboard that you get right now again you have multiple models that you can implement in cosmos db for example you can implement multi master replication or you can implement multi write regions uh, replication which basically means usually when you have a distributed database which is highly available you have one region where all the writes take place but the read can actually be done from any of the regions where the database has been distributed but in case of cosmos db you also have the option of configuring multi region region uh, multi write regions which basically means that uh, let's say i want to i'm in india and my and i'm, I'm a user who's using your application right now if i am using your application uh, probably the website is being served from the nearest edge location of my location for example uh, you must have enabled uh, content delivery network on your website if you want to increase or sorry decrease the latency on your application right now to decrease the latency on of your application you have implemented cdn so i am being served the website from the nearest location of my home from where i am accessing your application and at the same time the application itself is also accessing the database right now imagine the website is fast but the processing that it does that is the data that it has to fetch uh, from a particular database it exists in altogether a different region which is on the other part of the world right on the or on the other side of the world right that will again increase the latency of your application so, so we so you don't only need your front end component to be uh highly distributed you also need your backend and your database to be highly distributed and highly available right and that is the sole reason when you are dealing with a uh, audience which is spread across the globe you also have to take care that the processing that these that each of these guys are doing would also be available to them in the lowest time possible and for that what you have to do is the backend processors or the backend servers and the database servers also have to be near them so that whenever they are writing any information that also information can be written faster now if you have a write one and read anywhere kind of a distribution in that case you will have to write at a central location let's say the central location is the us and your databases which are basically the read replicas are actually distributed throughout the globe what are read replicas read replicas are basically the copy of the central database from which you can read the data and these read replicas basically get synced or, or basically are synced with the central database with the, uh, so whatever you write on the database is automatically and quickly replicated on the read replicas as well so it's very fast right so in terms of reading the data you can get a, a very low latency but in terms of writing the data if you want low latency as well then you need to have a multi write regions and that is exactly what this feature is for so in a nutshell cosmos db is basically a fully managed database service which provides you with a large scale deployment of databases throughout the globe and it also gives you the option of deleting or replicating your database on a new region entirely with a single click of a button right so that is what cosmos db is for you guys right the next set of uh, or the next service that we have is the data factory service now what is the data factory service it is basically an etl service which is an extract transform and load service which basically can take data from multiple sources and then transform the data according to what has been coded in the application using a particular service which can be used in conjunction with data factory and then load the resultant data into a bi service which can be used to analyze the data right so usually when you are doing this kind of an infra setup you need a lot of planning you need a lot of mediators between uh, the technologies which are being integrated for example the data can be coming from 
multiple sources such, such as social media websites it can be coming from emails it can be coming from chats it can be coming from uh, reviews it could be coming from anything right so all these data sources are basically first of all aggregated and the data is first put in the raw form in one particular place then what happens is according to the logic that you have specified for the transformation of this data for example you probably want to see the data in a particular view so that basically means you would have to first transform this raw data that you've got from multiple sources into a structured format so that is what transformation is so once you have the resultant data that you feel is the correct way of uh, getting the data or representing the data the next step that you need is obviously if there are a million rows in your data set you won't be able to find uh, what you are actually looking for or basically it will it might take a lot of time for you to analyze a million rows of data that you have just created so what you can do is or what what the industry came up to this particular problem was that they created a business intelligence application what is a business intelligence application it takes in the data set and it quickly creates patterns it creates quickly creates graphs which can actually help you to better understand the data right so data factory also happens to have the integration capabilities with a lot of bi tools the most prominent one is microsoft's own power bi tool but it also can integrate with tableau and other bi systems right similarly it can be integrated with multiple data ingestion systems as well so it's a total etl uh, system that you can deploy on azure and connect your various sources and outputs and get the resultant res output okay so guys this is what data factory is our next service is event hubs now what is event hubs event hubs is basically a place where you can again take in a lot of data just like data factory you can extract data from multiple sources but in this case you're not actually extracting data but the multiple sources from where the data is being generated the data is being pushed onto event hubs okay so the data is pushed onto event hubs and the event hubs job is to process this data and see where this data has to go next right for example let's say the data is coming from a social media website right so you analyze okay so this data came from a social media website it has to go to this particular service this data is coming from this particular website it has to go to x or y particular service similarly you have millions and millions of data coming every second or data packets coming every second and the sole job of event hub is to basically analyze each packet and redirect it to the corresponding consumer of that packet right so this is what event hubs is for you so this is done very fast uh, so the speeds claimed by azure is around 1 gbps that that is it can process 1 gb of data per second so the messages coming to event uh, event hubs can be processed that faster and it also does parallel computing of each data packet right so this is how or this is what ev event hubs is for guys now obviously event hubs cannot be just used alone right you have to use it with in conjunction with a host of applications for example the producers that is the data producing resources have to first combine with the event hub and then you have to define the rules in event hub as to what data goes where or what data goes to which consumer right and then your consumers are defined on and they are basically connected to event hubs right so basically event hubs in the most basic sense is a single point of uh, data ingestion so you don't have to worry about where should i send my data send all your data to event hubs and event hubs will decide where your data packet has to go based on what rule you have defined inside that system okay so guys this is what event hubs is a next service is data lake analytics right so we already saw what data lake is so data lake is basically a storage for big data analytics right so data lake analytics is basically a distributed cloud based data processing infrastructure right so it it is basically architected to perform data processing on the big data i mean the data that you stored on data lake is has to be processed by something right and that processing can actually be done by 
data lake analytics so it is basically the architecture is based on yarn so yarn is basically a component of the hadoop ecosystem and it can also and, and basically pairs with the azure data lake store or where basically we have stored all our data and can perform the analysis uh, on the scale of big data analysis that is big data is huge amount of data with variety of data in it right um, so all the data has mixed and matched fields right the data is in the rawest form possible and the processing can be done only by using selected tools which can actually make that happen if you use simple tools or if you use traditional tools the time taken by those tools to process this amount of data will be huge right and that is why you need hadoop uh, tools to basically make this process faster and azure has used the same technology that hadoop uses and has made it even faster for you right so data lake analytics is used in big data analytics it will it will basically used for processing data and what data the data which you store on azure data lake store right so this is what data lake analytics is guys moving forward guys now let's move on to a next domain which is the ai and machine learning domain in azure all right guys so in azure you basically have three core services in the ai and machine learning domain the three core services are cognitive services then you have bot services and then you have the awesome machine learning studio so let's understand each of these services one by one the first service is the cognitive services now what are cognitive services cognitive services in azure are basically apis or sdks uh, you know which have been developed uh, for a developer which can be integrated in his application and these apis and sdks basically interact with the machine learning models which have been created in azure right so cognitive services would include services like vision which basically gives you image processing capabilities it also has text analytics uh, services which can basically uh, do natural language processing for you so all these services all these services in azure are ready to use and to use them you'll have to integrate them with your applications and those integration can happen with the help of apis can happen with the help of sdks and once your application is integrated with these services you are charged on the basis of the number of requests that you make to these particular service for example the vision service and the cognitive services of azure is pretty awesome any image that you upload it will tell you each and every thing in the image whatever is present and how is that possible basically azure has processed thousands and millions and even billions of images already right and they have trained their image processing uh, machine learning model in a way that now it gives accurate results right so instead of creating your own machine learning model for image processing you can actually use the azure's machine learning model and you can get your work done so it might have used deep learning it, it might have used the only machine learning we do not know but the results are very accurate and if you want to use ai and machine learning capabilities of azure so the models which are trained by azure if you want to use them directly you can actually use the cognitive services of azure and to integrate them with your applications you have several apis and sdks available to you so this was about cognitive services guys now there is a derivative of the cognitive services that azure has launched which is basically called the bot service now what is the bot service guys the bot service is basically a chatbot which has been developed by azure which is totally based on ai and it basically makes uses of the natural language processing uh, service uh, or or the capabilities which are basically uh, there in the cognitive services of azure it makes use of that right and it is very to the point and you don't have to train the model to become expert in the conversation that you are having but it can actually learn from every conversation that you have with the ai chatbot of azure and you can actually tweak its setting so that it becomes custom designed for you so that your customers get the right answer every time they ask a question from the bot service of azure right so uh, in a nutshell azure bot service is nothing but a chatbot service it's a pre built chatbot service which you can integrate in your application 
and this chatbot service has already been trained by Azure and it gives accurate answers to questions and but obviously uh, your you will have to tweak it according to your applications you'll have to do some settings so that it answers the correct uh, way of answering uh, the answers would be according to you and according to your domain of application okay so guys this was the bot services and next set of service is the machine learning studio now what is the machine learning studio guys it's basically a very simplified version of using machine learning for example the most simple language that i think for starting off in data science is r right so as a beginner if you start using r or start learning r you will have to spend some time to first of all understand the syntax how it works etc and then you'll get a hang of how to create models how to train them how to test them etc so what is microsoft azure microsoft azure is a cloud provider that provides various platform as a service and infrastructure as a service products azure has cloud solutions to all the infrastructural problems by providing services in various domains did you know that almost 95% of fortune 500 companies are using azure also it is 5 times cheaper than aws in terms of windows and sql server because there are also microsoft products Forbes say that Microsoft Azure is set to boost the size of the IT market by $10 trillion in the next 10 years. As per predictions, 80% of the businesses will move their workload to cloud by 2025, thus making it a major career to consider transitioning to. For a better understanding of Azure, let us start at the very beginning. Microsoft Azure was announced in October 2008 and released on February 1, 2010 as Windows Azure first and later named as Microsoft Azure on 25th March 2015. In today's scenario, its reach is in 140 countries and is still expanding which is pretty impeccable. In simpler terms, Microsoft Azure is a platform that enables users to engage in agile cloud computing and is designed for creating and managing apps through Microsoft's data center. Now there are four integral Microsoft Azure service domains. The first one is Azure Compute. Compute is the most integral domain in Azure as it brings everything together with Azure Virtual Machines. You can get on-demand scalable compute resources, Azure virtual machines, app services and container instances are some popular compute services. Second we have Azure networking, networks from the cloud networks. In Azure, VNet is the networking tool that connects all Azure resources together. These networking services allow enterprises to safely connect their on-premises services to the Azure cloud. It is also used to manage virtual private networks and further create multiple virtual networks on the cloud. The third one is Azure Storage. Azure Storage provides storage solutions that are more durable and large-scale applications, data-driven applications can be built without any hassle. Azure automatically scales the storage requirements according to the usage and it automatically balances throughput according to the connections made. And the last one is Azure Database. Azure provides relational databases, NoSQL databases, data lakes and data warehouses. It provides a scalable, high available and fault tolerant database server and lets you scale according to the incoming data. There are various job roles in Azure. Let's take a look at one of the most popular job roles, Azure Developer. An Azure developer is a cloud professional who creates cloud-based applications making use of the benefits of the cloud architecture. If you are proficient in testing, security, development and deployment, then a career in Azure development is somewhere you will fit in well. The job includes responsibilities like testing of applications, maintaining, developing and deploy them on Azure. It also includes participating in all phases of development 
and having the ability to work side by side with cloud administrators, clients and cloud architects. In United States, on average basis, an Azure developer gets paid $132,148 per annum. However, for an entry level developer, it's $97,000. Whereas in India, the salary offered ranges from 7 lakhs to 25 lakhs per annum. That's all about Azure. Just a quick info guys. IntelliPad provides Microsoft Azure certification training in partnership with Microsoft, mentored by industry experts, the course link of which is given in the description below. Now let's continue with the session. What machine learning studio says is you do not have to learn any programming language. It has drag and drop interfaces. So all you have to know is data science, AI or machine learning conceptually. And if you understand or if you have the principles of the data science uh, concepts understood pretty well, what you can do is you can start off by creating your own machine learning model by just doing uh, drag and drop from the UI of the Azure Machine Learning Studio and you'll be up and ready with your first model in under five minutes. Of course, for a specific set of data set, obviously you will not be taking millions or billions lines of data set, otherwise that will take a little more time. But yes, you can create your own machine learning model with Azure Machine Learning Studio without knowing any programming language, right? So that is the power of Machine Learning Studio and the most coolest feature of it is it has a drag and drop user interface. So everything is drag and drop. You just drag and drop whatever you need, whatever data set you need, whatever algorithm you want to implement, whatever thresholds you want to implement, just drag and drop everything and it will work like a charm. Okay, so guys, this was the Machine Learning Studio application for you. The next set of services that we're gonna discuss guys are the identity services in Azure. All right guys, so now let's go ahead and understand the core Azure services in the identity domain, right? So guys, the, probably the most important service when you're dealing with identity in Azure is Azure Active Directory. Now, what do you mean by identity? Identity basically means when you want to give a particular person some access to a particular resource uh, that is being used on Azure Cloud. Right. So Azure Active Directory is basically a fully managed multi-tenant service uh, from Microsoft that basically offers identity and access to particular users in your organization. Now, if you're acquainted with how a Microsoft Windows server works, you would know that there is a server Active Directory as well, right? There's a Microsoft server Active Directory as well, in which you can specify for your on-premise applications, which users have access to what extent, right? For example, some people can just have read access or some people can have read and write access or some people can even have admin access to a particular application, right? And the most important part about Azure Active Directory is that it can integrate with your on-premise server Active Directory directory and can also authenticate people who are there on the on-premise infrastructure and want to use the on-premise resources like or on-premise softwares can also be authenticated using Azure Active Directory. And if those on-premise users, then you want to use resources on Azure, that also will be authenticated using Azure Active Directory, right? Now, how does all this works? So it's a very simple concept, guys. What you can do, you can actually add users in Azure Active Directory right now you can add individual users and you can assign individual roles to each users for example if there is a SaaS application which you have deployed on uh, Microsoft Azure giving access to that particular SaaS application to a particular user would be possible by just adding a user and giving him the access of thus that SaaS application right and you can also do a mass uh, allocation of a particular permission for example let's say uh, you want to give administrator privilege to a set of people now how would you give that so one way is whenever there is a person who comes into a company whom you think is, can be given admin access you will add his user and provide him the admin access or what you can do is you can actually define a group on which you have specified admin resources or so admin privileges and whoever users will be added to this particular group will get those permissions or will get those privileges automatically right so in this case what you will be doing is whoever is coming into the organization you're just adding him to the group and the permissions inheritance takes place automatically 
because that group has been assigned the admin privileges similarly if you want to create some other group for example you want to create a group for some saas application you can also do that right and this concept is a part of azure active directory and again in a nutshell azure active directory is nothing but it's basically a directory in which you can add users and specify what these users can do on azure or on on premise software right and these users can be managed in two ways or you either either you can manage them individually by creating a user time and again or what you can do is you can add these users to already existing groups that you have created with the respective permissions and they'll inherit all the properties which have been specified to that group okay so guys this was the azure active directory and this was about the identity domain in microsoft azure moving forward guys now let's talk about the management tools in microsoft azure that are very important for you to know while you're working as an azure professional all right guys so let's go ahead and understand the management services of azure so the first service is log analytics guys now what is log analytics uh, so basically the full name of this service is log analytics workspace now what you can do with log, log analytics workspace is you can dump all the logs for with respect to what is happening on a particular azure resource onto this workspace now how do you do that the first thing that you do is you basically go to your management console and you go to log analytics workspace over there you will have to create a log analytics workspace and specify the name anything right it's pretty straightforward once you have specified that the next step would be to add a data source so if i were to show you quickly i can just jump on to my management console i can go to log analytics workspace which is somewhere over here here okay, it is now here is a sample log analytics workspace that i've created i just go inside it and as you can see it says connect a data source so you can create or you can basically connect azure virtual machines uh, over here or you can specify some other sources if you want to and you can also specify as your activity logs to stream over here right so this will start accumulating logs in this workspace once that is done we'll have to specify monitoring solutions as to how you want to read the logs and what do you want to do uh, with respect to a particular uh, level of uh, logs for example you have info level you have critical level in logs right this basically tells you that a particular command failed or a particular command passed so if the level uh, so the level field of a log if it let's say info that means it's fine it it can go ahead but let's say the level field in the log so what do i mean by level field a level field is nothing but you can specify in your log notation that whenever there is an error i would specify a term such as level okay and i would specify that is equal to critical but if things are okay it's just for know how as to which command has been executed and that command executed successfully in that case i can specify the level as info okay and then i can specify in my monitoring solution that whatever log comes in check the level field in that log and if the level field is critical you can flag that log basically so all that can be configured inside the monitoring solution so if i were to click on view solutions you can actually check out what all monitoring components you can actually add on your log analytics workspace so as you can see you can add as your security center uh, you can add optimized catalog so there are a lot of things that you can basically add on to monitor logs right you can choose according to your will it is available in azure market space so once you specify the monitoring solution your log starts to flow in and in your monitoring solution you have to specify which logs to flag and that's how it's going to work right so this is the log analytics service in azure guys and and it helps you to manage your azure resources effectively pinpoint where the problem is occurring go over there and see the logs see on which command problem occurred fix that problem and then go ahead with your daily routine so this is what log analytics is guys the next service is cost management and billing so this is basically a native application of azure guys which helps you to manage your bills in azure right so for a few things which i can tell you uh, on the top of my head which comes in is uh, that you can manage a budget you can specify that my azure budget or my azure bill 
should not go over a particular limit you can specify that or you can so when you when you say it should not go over a particular limit that means if it goes beyond that all your azure services will be stopped but when you are in a business you actually don't want that so what so this particular limit is called a hard limit that is you want to limit it to that particular cost there is another kind of limit which is called a soft limit which basically means it will alert you that your budget has been crossed and you can actually make forecasts also in this particular service uh, based on your usage uh, let's say you, you have used azure heavily uh, for five days so it gives you a forecast that if you happen to use azure in this similar fashion this is what your bill is going to be at the end of the month right and then you can actually see what kind of tweaks you can make in your services so that your bill comes down so all of this is possible in cost management and billing services of Azure. Now this also is under the management domain, reason being it helps you in managing your Azure resources in a better fashion. The next service guys is a very important service which is an automation account. Now what is an automation account guys? It is nothing but uh, it's, it's a way of deploying Azure resources. So how do you deploy Azure resources? So we have seen few of the resources in this session today wherein we deployed a virtual machine, we deployed uh, a storage account. So all of that was possible one by one. I mean, I had to go manually into that service. I had to click on that. I had to specify a name and that's how, you know, my resources were deployed. But in automation account, what happens is you can create run books. Now, what are run books? You basically specify a code wherein you specify all the resources and their names and their configurations that you want to deploy. And then you upload that runbook onto the automation account and then you run that runbook. Then what it does is it automatically creates the resources for you. You don't have to do anything. Just put that runbook over there, click on play button and it will create all the resources for you with the exact same configurations that you have specified in the code. It is particularly helpful when you're setting up a large infrastructure wherein you'll have to deploy thousands or 2000 machine where each uh, where the 2000 machines are basically divided into multiple sets. It could be backend server set, it could be database server set, it could be front end server set, all of which will have different kind of configurations. And if these, this is the kind of a scenario, then run books would be of great help. And that's where automation account also comes in, which basically helps you to play those run books. Okay. Our next service is metrics guys. Now metrics is a service which helps you to visualize what all is happening on your Azure resource. For example, what is the network throughput? What is the CPU usage, right? Uh, what is the memory usage? All of that you can see inside metrics. Now you can actually check a 24 hour log as well in metrics and see at what point of time does your resource or your uh, or the particular metric that you're checking could be CPU usage, could be memory usage is actually rising. And then you can plan accordingly as to how to plan your or how to scale your infrastructure at that particular time right so this is what metrics are useful for it basically gives you an overview of how things are going so if you think about it it is nothing but metrics uh, sorry it is nothing but logs which is basically basically getting visualized in form of graphs but nonetheless it's very helpful and that is a service which is being provided to you by azure by the name metrics all right guys so these were all the services in the management domain guys our next up we'll be discussing a hands-on so enough of theory i guess we have discussed probably most of the important services which are there in the azure portal now what we'll be doing is i will be showing you an application which basically exists on my local host and what we'll try to do is we'll try to migrate that to azure and we'll choose the services based on the knowledge that we have gained today we'll choose the services accordingly then we'll set up the infrastructure and then we'll see how it works on the cloud. So guys, let's go ahead and do that. All right, guys. So let's go ahead and let me show you what all we are going to do. So the first thing that we're going to do is basically I have a website that I've already created on my local host, which basically can upload data to Azure blob, blob storage through the website. So I'm going to show you guys how I have configured it 
and how can it basically upload data to Azure blog, right? So the second point is create a new container and upload files to this container from the website, right? So we'll be creating a container and our website, we're going to configure to upload files to this particular container. Third thing is we have to create a MySQL database on Azure. So right now what is happening is uh, my website is basically storing data on the localhost MySQL engine. What the hands-on expects us to do is we'll have to deploy MySQL database on Azure and the website should basically push the data onto the MySQL database which will be there on the Azure portal, right? So this is the third step and the fourth step finally we want our final website to be uploaded on Azure web app and basically we have to deploy it using the local git method. What it is, don't worry about it. As you move along, you'll get it. All right. So let's start off with the first point right now, which is demonstrate the website on the local host. So let me switch on to my browser. So guys, this is my Azure portal. And if I have to demonstrate to you my website, it basically exists on localhost. Azure one, right? So this is my website guys. And what it does is it basically can upload data onto Microsoft Azure. But right now what uh, we, I have not basically configured it to connect to my Microsoft Azure storage account. I'll show you how we can configure it, right? So once a file is uploaded on the blob, it also makes an entry of it in the database, right? Now, where is the database? Uh, the database exists on my local host. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just open the MySQL console, right? And my MySQL console basically has uh, a database called images. So if I do a show databases, you can see that there is an images database. So this is the database that my website will be interacting to. So let me just use images and in this database what i have is a table so if i do a show tables command you can see that i have a table called names right but right now there is no data inside names so if i do a select star from names as you can see it is empty set right so when the data when this website will be uploading file when it will be successfully uploaded the next step would be to basically put the data inside the database as to what is the name of the file okay so let me show you the code guys let me show you how the code looks like this is my index.php let me just open it all right guys so guys this is this is how my code looks like so the first thing that i'll have to do is basically i will have to enter a deployment key over here which will basically be my connection string and the second thing that i'll have to do is i'll have to enter the container name which i'm going to create in a little while right so let's first jump on to our azure portal and what we want to do is go inside our storage account so guys, this is my storage account and what I want is the deployment key. So in the storage account, you will have to go to access keys. Just go inside that. And here you will find two keys. You can take any of these two keys. So what I'll do is I'll let's say I take key one and this is the connection string. So I'll have to copy this and I'll have to come back to my code and I'll have to replace it over here. So let's replace the deployment key. And now I will have to remove this part out of the deployment key. This is not required, right? So this we will remove and this is my deployment key guys. All right. Next step is to basically enter the container name. Now the hands-on basically expects us to create a new container. So let us do that. So let's go inside overview and let's go to blobs. So I have a container in telepart over here. Let's create one more container and let's call it new right and let's give the access as blob and let's click on ok all right so my container is now ready and it's called new let's name the container over here so my container name is new okay everything else looks good so right now the, this is this is basically the uh, connection information for my mysql database so right now it is going to upload the data onto my local host mysql all right so let's see if I can upload a file now. Let's save this index.php. 
let's come back to our website let's refresh it once and now let's choose a file which we want to upload uh, let's go inside let us try to upload let's say database so this is an image which is called database let's select this and let's click on submit so it says blob updated uploaded successfully and new record created successfully so let us verify that in our database so i'll do a select star from names as you can see there is a new entry over here which is 6803455573 this is the name which has been assigned by my website so this is basically a random name the reason for that is that it could be that you are uploading duplicate files and if you upload duplicate files you don't want the names to coincide so what i'm doing is i'm assigning a random name to every file that i'm uploading right so this is the file which has been uploaded and we can check it over here if i click on checklist this is the file which has been uploaded and if i click on this file now i can download that file basically from azure it says blob not found and the reason for that is that i'll have to change the uh, url inside my list website which is basically uh, if i click on checklist this is the list.php i'll have to change some code here i'll show you that but first let's go inside the new container and as you can see there's a png file over here now this png file i can directly download from a list file but in order to do that what i'll have to do is i'll have to click on this file and I'll have to copy this URL and I'll have to see what is the prefix over here. So the prefix is this. So I'll have to copy this prefix and now I will have to go inside my code and open the list.php code. And this is the URL that I'll have to replace. So let's replace it. All right, great. Now let's save it. Come back to our website. This is the list.php. Let us refresh this once. And now when I click on the file, you can see that I've downloaded the file automatically. Let's click on this file. And this is an image which has been downloaded. Now let's try something else. Let me show you the image first and then I'll try to upload it. So what I'll do is I'll go inside downloads and let's say I want to upload this machine file. So this machine file looks something like this. Okay. Now we're going to upload this machine file. Let's go inside our website. Let's choose a file. And now let's select the machine file which is basically this. This we will upload, we'll click on open and we'll click on submit. So it says blob uploaded successfully. If I go inside my container and I refresh it, you can see there's a new entry over here. Even in my database, if I refresh, there's a new entry over here. And now what I can do is I can basically just go to my list, refresh it. This is the new entry. Click on it, file gets downloaded, click here. And this is the file which was uploaded. So what is basically happening over here is this file is now hosted on blob and any of you, if you click on this link, you will be able to download it. But the problem is that this website right now is only available on my local host and I have to make it available to the world. Now, how can I do that? So first thing first, uh, let us go back to our slides and see what is our next step. So our next step is that I want to create a MySQL database on Azure. So right now my database, which is being updated is on my local host. But what I want is that it should be updated on my Azure MySQL database. Now let's see how we can do that. So the first thing that I will do is I'll have to go back to my Azure dashboard. I'll have to go to services and I'll have to go into databases. And this is the database uh, that I want to launch. Azure database for MySQL server. Let's select it. Uh, let's add a database. I want to include it inside my demo environment resource group. The server name, let's specify it as in Intel one, right? The admin username, let's specify it as Intel. The password, let's specify it as Intel at the rate one to three. Okay, it says your password cannot contain all or part of the login name. No issues. Let's name it as Azure at the rate one to three. Same is the case over here. All right. And where do I want to launch it? I want to launch it in South India. Uh, the version is 5.7, which is great. Now let's change the amount of specification that we have for this server. Let's click on configure server. I want a basic configuration. I basically want one core. And I want the least amount of storage, which is 5 GB. 
auto growth no i don't want it backup retention period uh, the least is seven days which is fine and i think that's it let's click on ok now the server has been configured now let's click on review plus create okay so our username is intel my password is azure at the rate one two three and now let's click on create all right so my deployment is underway which basically means uh, my mysql database is now getting deployed let's wait for some time let's wait it we'll wait for it to be complete and then we'll proceed with our demo all right guys so my deployment is now complete so i can just click on go to resource and i am in so this is my database guys now in order to see or in order to access my database this is the server name that i'll have to use so let's go ahead and select this so my server name is this let's copy it and let's come back to our command prompt and what we want to do is mysql hyphen h this is the connection string or the server name next thing is i'll have to specify the username which in my case is this so let's copy it paste it here next thing that i want is the password so the password is azure at the rate one to three now this will give me an error guys it says client with ip address is not allowed to connect to this mysql server so let's solve that let's solve that so we will go inside connection security and what i want to do is i will specify my client ip which is this all right that's been added also guys turn this enforce ssl connection off because right now we don't want to get into making an ssl connection since this is a demo all right guys everything looks good now let's click on save and once this rule has been saved what we'll see is that we should be able to connect to our database all right guys so it says it has successfully updated the connection security and now when i go back to my command prompt and i try to enter the same command with the password azure at the rate one two three you can see i have successfully connected to my mysql database on azure now if i could do a show databases right now you can see there are only the default databases present so let us change that so i'll just exit or before exiting let us just create an empty database which is images so we'll use images and let's create a table so create table uh, names and the names will be name space bar cat 20 so we have created it and now let's just go to our code so the code is over here this is my code guys now i will have to specify the server name so server name in my case would be this let's copy it this is my server name my username is this and my password is azure at the rate one two three okay everything looks good let's save the file similarly in index.php let's do the same changes my server name is this let's copy it my username is this let's copy it and my password is azure at the rate one two three all right let's save the file and now let's go to our website let's try to check the list let's see what it shows us it shows us empty because there's no data in the azure sql table great now let's choose a file and now let's try to upload some random file let's click on submit it says blob updated successfully new record created successfully let's check that so i'll just do a select star from names and i can see that there is a new entry over here if i do a checklist this is the new entry if i click on this i can download the file and this is the file that i basically uploaded great now my website is updating data onto azure database and at the same time it is uploading data onto my uh, storage account inside the container which is new right so let's go inside blobs let's go into new and this is the new file which was basically just uploaded great guys now what i want to do is i want to make this website public right this website is working fine over here but i want this website to be used by everyone in the world now how can i do that in order to do that i will have to go on to home 
and we studied or we saw a service which can basically just upload our website and not ask us to install any software it will not ask us to log in into the operating system do some configuration nothing it will just give us a dashboard through which we can upload our website so let's go ahead and do that so the web the service that i'm talking about is app services so let's go inside app services and let's click on add so now it will ask me which resource group so i'll say demo environment name of the instance let's specify it as intel demo all right okay it's already been taken so let's specify intel azure all right this seems to be available uh what do you want to publish i want to publish the code the runtime stack it's actually php 5.6 this is the one what is the region that we want to deploy it in we want to deploy it in south india so let's select that south india this is the one great uh let's change the size of the server which will be launched so basically we are in dev test environment right and this is the minimum configurations that we can launch all right let's click on apply and now let's click on review and create so this over here we can basically do all the change uh, all the necessary review as to what all we are launching so we just selected php 5.6 and we specified the name of the app that's all we did right now let's click on create now guys what will happen now is it will basically deploy a server on which it will install php 5.6 It'll install Apache and then it'll give me a URL and when I go to that URL, I will basically see a sample app, right? It is not giving me access to the operating system. It does not ask me to install any software. All that was done over here was we selected the runtime stack, which was PHP 5.6. We specified the server configuration and that is all. That is all we need to configure and that is all we get access to. Now, once it gets deployed, I'll show you guys how you can upload your code onto this particular web app. So as you can see, it is already deployed. Now let's go to resource. And this is a resource guys. The status is it's running right now. And if I browse this web app right now, it'll basically show me a sample web app, which has been deployed on it, right? Let's wait for that website to appear. Since this uh, web app has just been launched, it might take some time for the web app to show the website, but nevertheless, it will show the website. So let's wait for it to actually show us. Let me try stopping it and refreshing it once. All right, it's gonna take its sweet time. So let's give it that. All right, so as you can see, hey, app service developers, your app service is up and running. Time to take the next step and deploy your code. Great, so this is what you want to do. Now, to deploy your code, you will have to go inside Deployment Center. So let's go inside that. So once we are inside Deployment Center, it's asking me where is my source control, right? So my source control is basically on my local, right? So, but it my local is not a Git repository as of now. So what I can do is I can just go on my code, which is over here. Azure one, this is the folder and let me just right click here and click on git bash, right? Let me just make the text a little bigger for you so that it is visible. All right. So guys, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to initialize an empty git repository, so git init. And now I'm going to add all the files in the git file system. I'm going to stage it for the git file system. So once this process is done, I'm going to commit it get commit hyphen m and this is my first comment now it's going to save the files great so the files are saved now what i want to do is i want to upload this particular code onto my azure web app right so going back to the portal i do have a local git where i have my code checked in so let's select this option and click on continue now it's asking me which build provider to choose. Uh, don't worry about here. Don't worry about what is Azure pipelines and what is Kudu engine. Basically, if you select Kudu engine, you don't have to do any configuration. More on this we can discuss in the further sessions, but right now just select the Kudu engine and click on continue. And now it says your local Git repository URL will be generated upon completion. Branch would be master. App service is build service. Great, let's click on finish. So now it is basically going to set up the Git environment for me on the web app server. 
and what I will get is basically this URL which is my git URL. So this URL I'll be using to upload my code but before that I will also have to set the credentials for my git system. So to set that I click over here FTP or credentials and I'll go to user credentials and I can specify anything over here. Let's specify a username. Let's say the username is IntelliPath and let's say the password is Intel E at the rate one two three Intel E at the rate one two three and now let's click on save credentials. So it says saving credentials was a success. Great. Now what I can do is I can just close this and now I'll just have to go to my resource. I'll have to go to deployment center and now I will just take the git URL over here. All right, so this is the git URL. Let's copy this and now git remote add Azure and let's try to paste this link now. Yes, so this was the syntax git remote add Azure, right? And now what I want to do is I want to push my code onto Azure. So git push Azure master. I'll hit enter and I'll ask me the credentials. So credentials is in telepath and the password is intel at the rate one two three. Oh, authentication failed. I think I forgot the password. Uh, no issues guys. So I can just specify it again. So it's intel at the rate one two three and intel at the rate one two three let's save the credentials okay credentials are saved let's go back here git push azure master and now it should basically push my code onto the web app now it will take some time over here guys don't worry about the time it will take around a minute or so to upload your code so let's wait for that time and let's hope everything goes well all right the process has started so it is updating the branch now, copying all the files. Great. So my code is now uploaded on the app and it says it will restart in 10 seconds. Great. So meanwhile, what I can do is I can go to my web app and I can just refresh this. And as you can see, my website is now available over here, right? If I click on checklist, you will see an error and I'll tell you why that error would be there. It says connection failed. Client with IP address is not allowed to connect to this MySQL server. Now, how can you solve that? Just go to home and go to your database, go to connection security and allow this, allow access to Azure services. Just click on on and as a security feature, just remove the IP address that you used earlier. And now let's click on save. So now my security settings will get updated and then I would be able to use my website on the web app. All right, so my settings are about to be updated. Let's wait for that time and then we'll go ahead. All right guys, so my data is, has been updated successfully. So if I go here back and I click on refresh, you can see the list is now being generated. Let's try to upload a file guys. Let's try to upload, let's try to upload this word file. Okay, let's click on open and let's click on submit. It says blob updated successfully. Let's check that. Let's go to our resource group. Let's go to our storage account. Let's go inside blobs. We go inside our container. And this is the docx file which was just updated. And if I refresh the list, I can see the docx file over here as well. If I click on it, I'd be able to download it. And guys, with this, we have successfully completed our demo. But let me show you a very awesome thing that comes with connecting Git to your web app, right? So now I can just simply go to my index.php and let's say I want to change this heading, okay? So let's try to change the heading. I'll just go down, upload to Azure blob and let's add a little bit of text over here. Let's say, welcome to IntelliPath, okay? Let's save it. Come back to our git terminal. Let's do a git status. You can see that index.php has been modified. Great. Let's stage this file. Let's commit this file. Updated index. 
great and now let's push it so git push azure master we'll again take a minute or two and then our files will get updated on the web app automatically all right so my code has been updated let's go ahead and check it so let me just refresh this website and as you can see my code has successfully updated over here it says upload to azure blob welcome to intellipart and this is exactly what we changed all right so guys with this we have successfully completed our demo let's summarize what all we did so let me come back to my slides so we demonstrated the website on the local host which was working fine then we created a new container and then we uploaded all the blob files over there after that we also deployed a mysql database on azure and the localhost website was then able to insert data onto the mysql database on azure and then finally we also deployed an azure web app and we deployed our website using the local git method and finally we also checked if we updated anything and we pushed through our git method the files were successfully being uploaded onto my azure web app right all right guys so our first question is which of the following is not a platform as a service and the options are mysql database for azure app service azure vms or is the answer none of these the answer is azure vms the next question is can we deploy a azure vm without a virtual network so the options are yes no or none of these the answer is no so let's take the example uh, wherein let's say you guys want to start your own company let's talk from that perspective and then we'll understand why big companies are using uh, cloud platforms like azure today all right so let's say you're a guy who just wants to open a food platform let's say your the food platform that you want to open is uber eats okay so if you want to open an application like uber eats uh, what is the first thing that you'll have to do so obviously first of all you will have to have an application right which basically you will be developing and which will basically work right so let's say you hired a team of developers and you have done that so now your application is ready and now the next step is basically making it available to the world right making it available on the internet so how will you do that so for doing that guys first of all you need to host that application on a server okay now uh, when you're starting small and let's say there are four or five people who are going to use your application you can do that using your own laptop as well now when you're doing it using your own laptop let's say you have developed the application right and now you want to host on the internet so what you do is you basically run that application on your laptop you connect it to the internet right and obviously there are a certain other things as well that you would need for example you would need a static ip of your laptop which an ip which is not going to change anytime right and at the same time you will also need 24 7 electricity so that your laptop never shuts down right otherwise if your laptop shuts down the other people will not be able to use that application okay so guys this would be the basic setup that you would need to host your application now let's talk about a scenario uh, wherein you know your application becomes a hit overnight and now some thousands of users are using your application now obviously your laptop will not be enough so what will you have to do so as you know that okay so my application is actually working a lot of people want to use my application and you know it is going to be a success in the future now so what you do is you take a loan from some bank or you uh, take some amount from your savings and then you ba basically buy a set of servers okay so those servers take around two to three days to basically get delivered to you then you basically set them up for setting them up again uh, you know you need a team which can basically install the required software on it then you need a place where you can keep these servers so you rent some apartment put those servers over there uh, you know connect uh, it to a power backup uh, kind of a facility where even if the electricity goes there is a generator which is going to power up your server and at the same time you basically also contact a service provider an internet service provider which is going to give you good internet to your servers seems everything sorted right so now you've invested a huge chunk of money on your application right and now you have made it available on the servers where thousands of people can access it 
okay now the application again becomes a hit overnight and now there are more customers who basically want to access your application and now the servers that you bought they're not enough so what you basically happens is uh, you get to know okay so more customers are using your application now and now you suddenly have to buy more servers because obviously the servers that you have currently they're not uh, giving you the uh, the right kind of performance that you need so again you have to invest some money now take one thing into account guys that servers are very expensive at the same time you also rented a place you are giving money for the internet connection you are giving money for the electricity so there's a lot of investment required over here to make your application available online to hundred thousands of users or even a million people right and obviously because you know you have just started out you are not getting the kind of money that you are supposed to do because you are also doing marketing for your application you are also giving a lot of discounts on your application because of which you are not getting the right right kind of revenue in right so what should you do so as and when the traffic will grow again and again you will have to buy more servers and that will require more investment from your side so you get fed up of the solution uh, of, of this particular uh, situation and now you're looking of ways to basically solve it now if this kind of situation arose before the year 2006 or 2005 well you didn't have any other option but to shut your company or take some loan from a bank and pay the interest also to the bank while you're repaying uh, you know the amount to them right but now with cloud providers such as azure such as aws such as google cloud platform this has become very easy so what is this cloud platform and how is it going to help you let's understand that so guys with a cloud platform what you can do is you can rent infrastructure right so now let's say you have an application which is ready and you want to make it available to the world so what you will do is you can basically uh, you know go to uh, azure and you can just tell them okay you know what i need uh, 32 gb of ram of servers and around 16 core of cpus right and i want 24 7 electricity i want that server to never go down is that possible so as your people say yes that is possible all you have to do is monthly you just have to pay the rent uh, for our servers we will manage all the electricity we will manage all the internet connection we will manage uh, everything which is required from the hardware perspective all you have to do is take care of your application which you're deploying to the server and nothing else and in lieu of that you just have to pay the rent of the server that you are using now let's say after one month you do not require the servers anymore so you there is no security that you have to pay there is nothing you have to you have to pay just pay the amount that you have used the server for and that is about it that we require nothing else at the same time let's say tomorrow you need more servers that you want to add while uh, you know your customers are growing so all you have to do is take some more servers on rent and apply it to your existing fleet of infrastructure and you're set and it will hardly take two to three minutes to do this right and again you just have to pay the rent of the servers that you are basically going to use okay so now with this uh, they also give you a feature wherein let's say the load increases on your application the cpu usage of the servers which are hosting your application it increases so automatically new servers will be added to your fleet and as and when the cpu usage goes down a particular number it can also start removing servers from your fleet right or removing servers from your infrastructure and this is what is called as auto scaling and with this you never have to now worry about how many servers you need how many people are there on your website why because everything is being managed automatically and at the same time you do not have to buy servers now you can just rent them and use it as long as you want them right so this came to be a very good deal for you and that is exactly how millions of companies worldwide have now shifted to cloud why because Azure is going to Azure or AWS or any other Google Cloud platform for that matter is giving you servers on rent rent right and the rent is as low as 0 0.005 dollars per hour right so that is how cheap the rent is for the servers that you're basically trying to deploy
and with this uh, you know the internet is managed with them the even if the hardware outdates let's say tomorrow they will upgrade your hardware for free you don't have to pay them anything extra other than your rent they are going to manage everything and because of this your usage is going up why because now uh, your application is available all the time and at the same time the traffic also uh, is being managed automatically so that uh, the new servers are added to your fleet and are removed for your fleet as and when the traffic increases or decreases okay so this is the story of a startup why it was using azure now let me show you some of the companies who are using azure today right or are using a cloud platform today specifically microsoft azure so these are all the companies who are using Microsoft Azure for all kind of needs of infrastructure, right? And they just have their software over it. So companies like Toyota, Honeywell, Lufthansa, LinkedIn, Samsung, Xerox, BMW. Just a quick info, guys. IntelliPad provides Microsoft Azure certification training in partnership with Microsoft, mentored by industry experts. The course link of which is given in the description below. Now let's continue with the session. And even Microsoft itself. So any Microsoft website that you go to is also hosted on Microsoft Azure. Right? So all these companies are on Azure for the very same reason that I've just explained to you. First thing is cost effectiveness. Second thing is distribution of work because now you don't have to have your own team to manage your servers. And at the same time, you also are can be reliable on the infrastructure which Azure has given you because it would have been a pain to manage the hardware, uh, you know, a team which is going to monitor your hardware all the time if you were to set it up all by yourself. Okay, so now that we have understood what Azure is exactly and why we should use it, now we will move along and understand some Azure services and its pricing. So Suhas is saying, how much does it cost to owning a server versus uh, buying from cloud? Okay, so Suhas, it depends on the size of a server. So let's say if you, uh, let's let's compare the price of having a PC today, right? So if you buy a PC which, which has a very good GPU, right? Uh, let's, let's say you buy a 2080 Ti graphic card with an i9 core CPU, which has around 16 cores, Right, and a 64 gigs of RAM which has around 3000 megahertz of speed. So, this setup for just the CPU is going to cost you around three to four lakhs. And now, this is a PC. Now, imagine if you have to set up a server, and this PC will now be multiple times in the server rack that you have, which is basically going to cater to 1000, 2000 people. So, the cost of this setup is going to be around six to seven lakhs per server rack, right. Now imagine when your server hits 100,000 users or 200,000 users, this cost is going to increase exponentially. Now obviously you will have to manage it according to the revenue that you are generating, right? But at the same time, the revenue will take some time to come in, right? And at the same time, if your users are ex increasing exponentially, which is a good thing for you though, but let's say if you are not able to manage the demand of the users, which is basically the infrastructure that you have, it again becomes a problem. Let's say you have that kind of money to buy your own infrastructure. But with every increasing demand, that infrastructure will take some time to come to your office. At the same time, you will also have to take a headache of manage, managing or hiring a, a team of your own to basically manage these servers, right? And obviously, when you hire a team, you also have to deal with the problems that the team is facing. You have to also deal with uh, you know, uh, what are the kind of tasks that you will be assigning them, etc. So it becomes a headache for you because you basically wanted to open a app which is basically a software. So not only you now have to manage the software, but you are also going to manage the hardware side of the hardware software, thus giving less time to your application, which probably if you have spent more time on it, you could have increased the revenue of your company. Right? And that is exactly why basically companies prefer cloud providers. Okay, Santosh is saying, what about security charges? So Santosh, everything, you just have to include the rental charges. Security uh, from the hardware perspective, security from the perspective of 
you know, if you're deploying a firewall on Azure, so that firewall's foolproofness is all guaranteed by Microsoft Azure. Now, think about it like this. Let's say you have your own application that you're trying to launch in the internet space. Now, obviously, the kind of security, uh, you know, aspects that you can create around your application, the kind of money that you can invest around your application just for the security needs, whatever that money is, it's going to be always less than what Azure has already invested on their infrastructure, given the fact that Microsoft itself is hosting each and every service of theirs on Microsoft Azure. Okay, so you can be less assured that if you are hosting your application on a cloud like Azure, it's getting best in class infrastructure and at the same time, uh, you know, the security best practices. Now, obviously, you will have to make sure that your application from the software perspective is secure as well. That is not something that Azure can guarantee, but the infrastructure that you're deploying on cannot be tampered with. That is something that Azure will guarantee you. So, Monty, uh, why is there again a very good question? So, I just told you about why cloud platforms are basically, uh, you know, preferred rather than owning your own infrastructure. Now, why are we learning Azure today? Let's let's try to answer that question. So, as you all know, that uh, Amazon Web Services is the largest cloud provider in the market right now. Right, and when I say the largest cloud provider, it has around 41 to 42 percent market share. Now, because it is the largest cloud provider in the market, that obviously means that there are more jobs, and because there are more jobs, there are more people who are trying to apply for the job, and hence more competition. When you talk about Microsoft Azure, it's the second largest cloud provider. Now, let's first talk from the market perspective. Now, because it's a second large, a uh, second largest cloud provider companies which are using AWS right now, they're also taking into account a secondary cloud provider for their infrastructure needs. Why? Because let's say tomorrow, uh, you know, the whole of AWS servers go down. Now they do not want it to impact their own application. So what they do is they create a redundancy in place and what they do is they manage their servers on Azure as well. Right, and now they're using two cloud providers instead of one. This is from the market perspective, and that's why you can see the growth of Azure has been dramatic in the past two, three years. Right, the kind of growth that AWS has seen is less than the kind of growth that Azure is seeing from, uh, you know, if you if you take into into account the last three, four years. At the same time, Azure is a lot cheaper when you compare it with other cloud providers, and the sole reason for that is. The Microsoft products. So, if you are using any Microsoft product on, let's say, AWS on Google Cloud Platform, it is obviously going to charge you more than Microsoft product that you get on Azure. Why? Because Azure is basically owned by Microsoft. So, because of that, even the pricing is in control, and hence it becomes more cheap for people who want to use Microsoft uh, software. Third thing is now because uh, the AWS is the largest cloud provider. There is more competition over there. Azure does not have much of competition, but at the same time, since cons companies have started considering Azure, and because of the growth rate of Azure that uh, we have seen in the past three four years, there's an acute shortage of people who are who uh, basically are certified in Azure and at the same time know Azure that well as well. Nowadays, what is happening is people who know AWS they are the only ones who are also trying to uh, you know control the infrastructure which is there on azure in the same company right but that is not helping out because a lot of features are different between microsoft azure and aws and now companies basically want to have a separate guy who can manage their separate cloud platform that they have now obviously if you talk about senior cloud profiles such as senior cloud engineers or senior cloud architects now these guys, they are not just limited to learn only AWS or only Microsoft Azure. In the long run, when you see yourself, you can actually, you will actually have to learn more than one cloud provider. That is, some companies expect you to know both AWS and Microsoft Azure. Some companies expect you to know all the three, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud Platform, and AWS as well. But when you're starting out in the cloud domain, it is recommended that you start with Microsoft Azure. 
because it will be a lot easier for you to switch to the cloud domain because of the less competition right and while you are also growing for the next level the next level of profile that you want to go for then you should also learn aws you should also learn google cloud platform okay so sk is saying what is the difference between azure and aws services well sk when you talk about it from the uh, features perspective so what are the features that aws is providing which azure is not all the features are same but the way you implement them using the services is different right the steps that you have to do to do a particular task in azure is obviously going to be different from what you have to do in aws because they are two different companies they have built their own product uh, separately and obviously because of that the way of implementation is also very different right so that is the only difference but when you talk it from features perspective both the cloud providers are neck to neck they are giving each other competition in terms of the feature that they offer and because of that all the features or most of the features are same okay so how azure is different from aws and what is the basic process uh, for cloud is same so samir i think i just answered your question so both of them have the same features it's just that because they are two different products uh, the same thing can be implemented in the, both the cloud providers in different kind of ways as your services so these are some of the common services in microsoft azure uh, that we are basically going to discuss now okay so let's talk about the most common service which every one of you is going to use once you start um, uh, using microsoft azure and that service is nothing but the virtual machine service so guys the virtual machine is basically uh, it's an uh, infrastructure as a service or in other words it's basically a server so all that we have been discussing till now even in the example that i told you earlier was about using a server right so whenever you deploy a server in microsoft azure that is nothing but a virtual machine right so a virtual machine is just like your own laptop or personal computer or pc right it's just that a virtual machine can have whatever kind of resources you want right so when you deploy a virtual machine you choose the amount of ram that you need you choose the amount of cpu that you need and then you deploy it right so that is exactly what a virtual machine is right for example in your pc if you have a 32 gb ram right now you cannot just change it right now you have to buy some parts include it in your uh, pc setup and only then that configuration will increase but with virtual machines as seen as you can do that in a matter of seconds right and how can you do that because uh, you know the infrastructure or the hardware that is basically made available to you by microsoft azure is virtualized which basically means if your virtual machine is being launched on let's say a certain hardware it might be the case that the same hardware might be accommodating 100 or 200 of virtual machines as well so that is the kind of uh resources which are available on the hardware but the hardware can virtualize some of the resources and can make those resources available to you as a separate machine that is exactly what virtualization is right so a virtual machine in azure like i again said it's basically a server that you deploy right and these servers are basically uh, going to have the required ram the required cpu that you specify so that's what a virtual machine is right then the second kind of service is called app service so what is an app service so an app service is basically a platform as a service right and in that what you get is so let's say you deploy a virtual machine right so when you deploy a virtual machine what happens is you get a screen to a, a, a computer which probably has the linux operating system or the windows operating system installed on it and then you can use it as you want right but in app service this thing is not there in app service what happens is you are given a platform so you're not given the whole machine to work on you basically uh, uh, are given a platform which basically gives you a dashboard kind of a view and in that dashboard you can only do the actions which are specified by the service that you're deploying for example in app service you can deploy your own website but if you have to deploy your own website uh, let's say you want to do that on Azure virtual machine. So first what you'll have to do is let's say your website is based on .NET So you will have to install .NET on the server or let's say your website is 
uh, you know, based on Apache software. So you will have to install the Apache software. If it's a PHP website, you will install the PHP software. And once all the softwares are installed, only then you can deploy your website on it, or you can copy the files of your website on it, and then your website will become available. But the scene with the app services is that everything is deployed automatically. So you just tell us your what is the kind of website that you are going to deal with. So let's say if you have a PHP website, what you do is you click on app services, you tell Microsoft, okay, so I'm gonna use a PHP uh, website on the service that I'm deploying. And Microsoft themselves, they basically set up the environment for you. They install the softwares and everything. And all they do is they give you a button, which is uh, on the dashboard that you will see, right? And on that button, you can see, uh, uh, I mean, through that button, if you click on it, you will be able to upload your website. And once your website is uploaded, it will automatically be deployed on the server, which is basically deployed in the background. Right. So the purpose of having an app service versus a virtual machine is to make your life easy. So you do not have to deal with the operating system directly. Azure manages the operating system on your behalf. It manages all the software based on your behalf. And all you do is you just deploy your application. So that is what an app service is. Right. Similarly, the third kind of very common service which will be used in Microsoft Azure is the blob storage. So a blob storage is just like Google Drive. So I'm pretty sure everyone of you might have used Google Drive uh, in any of your careers, right? A Google Drive is just like you know uploading your file on the cloud, and that's about it. And that is exactly what a blob storage also is. So on blob storage, you can also upload your files, but what you can do with those files is a lot different than what you can do with uh, files on Google Cloud. Google cloud. For example, in Blob, you also have the option of, uh, you know, keeping those files in a very, uh, uh, very primitive kind of storage, which is going to reduce your costs drastically. And at the same time, you will see that when you're using Google Drive, you have a limit to the kind of files that you can upload. Uh, when you sign up on Google Cloud, the the storage I think that you get is around 30 GB. So 30 GB data is free for you that you can upload. And after 30 GB, you will have to buy some storage where you can upload that data, uh, upload more data. But when you're using blob storage, you do not have any restriction of how much of data can you upload. It's unlimited uh, data that you can upload. And at the same time, you are only charged for the data that you are upload per month. Let's say you uploaded one terabytes of data. So you will only be charged for the amount of one terabytes of data and nothing less, nothing more. Now, those pricings are also very different. So if you want very high speed uh, download and upload uh, to your to to your file that you have uploaded on uh, blog storage, the pricing will be different. Let's say you say that uh, this is a backup file that you're putting on blog storage, and probably you you will never use it again. You just want it to be saved in a very uh, safe place. So in that case, what you can do is you can change the storage class of your blob storage and that will almost take make the cost of uploading and keeping the file one tenth right and similarly there are a lot more features as well and that is exactly what blob storage is so again if you want to understand it it's just like google drive but with a lot more features so that's about what blob storage is right then you have something called as file storage so file storage is just like having a network drive right which you can map to your computer so i just talked about google drive google drive you cannot map it as a c drive or a d drive on your system but with file storage if you deploy it on microsoft azure it is again uh, you know a very uh, unlimited kind of a service where you can decide how many gbs or terabytes you need and once you've de defined that application in microsoft azure you can basically connect it to your computer and mount it as a local disk drive and then you can basically copy files to it or retrieve files from it as you want. So this is what a file storage is. Now the cool thing about file storage is that multiple people can be can basically mount this drive on their computer at the same time, and they can use it for uh, as a shared drive between them while they're working on it. Right. So that is what a file storage is. So each of these services basically plays uh, a different role when you are deploying an application on production cloud. Right. Then the next kind of service that you have is called virtual networks. 
so virtual networks is just like uh, you know in your office you have networks right so if you want to deploy a network for a set of machines that you have deployed in microsoft azure the way you can do that is by making use of virtual networks now again you can create n number of virtual networks in your azure account where you can have n number of servers and these virtual networks again can have n number of features that you can explore and implement which i think you will learn more as you start using the virtual network service right and the final kind of service that we are going to understand is load balancers right so what is a load balancer a load balancer is basically um, you know it's uh, it's it's more of use in production and uh, probably for a guy who does not know about load balancers even if they are using it they will never get to know about it right and there is actually a service that we are actually going to make use of in today's session as well where i'll show you the 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 reason people use load balancers so i give you the example of uh, a story in the beginning right where you can add more servers for your application and then as you add more servers more number of users can basically be dealt with right so how does that happen how does how do you, how can you add hundreds of servers and then decide where a user exactly is going to land on or which server he is going to land on for basically his needs for example if you go to flipkart.com or you go to amazon.com so when you go there you automatically are given uh, if your internet connection is good if your application loads just fine right so where is the data on that application coming from that data is basically coming from cloud is basically coming from a fleet of servers which have been deployed on cloud and to one of those servers you connect and that is where your data is basically coming from so you never decide which server you have to connect to that is automatically chosen for you right and that is exactly what a load balancer does it distributes the load equally among multiple servers which are deployed in your infrastructure okay more about this we will understand as you move along so guys this is a brief about the azure services in microsoft azure now let's go ahead and talk about the pricing so the moment you sign up on azure what you get is one month free usage of microsoft azure with a free credit of around 13300 rupees or 200 dollars right so you can use this amount to learn and understand microsoft azure right so you can deploy as many servers as you want and you can use them until and unless you exhaust the 200 dollar or the 13300 rupees credit that you have in your microsoft account the moment you sign up right so this is something which is very developer friendly which azure has done that the moment you sign up it makes the services available for you free so that you can practice them and learn more about it okay and other than that there are some set of free services as well which are valid for uh, you know a lifetime so whenever you're using azure this is uh, some of these services are valid for one year for example uh, when you're using linux virtual machines or windows virtual machines or microsoft azure 750 hours every month will be given free of cost to you of the server type b1s vm right so if you are using the servers the first 750 hours of those servers will be free of cost that is will not be charged to you while you're using those servers right so now guys let's move on and start off with the hands-on and what i'm first going to do is i'm going to explain you what we are basically going to make and then we are going to go ahead and start it okay so guys let's first understand the uh, website architecture that we're going to deploy on azure today all right so what we are basically going to do is uh, we will have two sets of servers right so, so the first set of servers would be in the uh, us region and the other set of servers would be in the indian region all right now since these these will be multiple servers what we are also going to do is we will, we are basically going to have a load balancer on top of them and through this load balancer uh, if you are in the us region if you go to a particular domain basically it should be pointed to the us server automatically and once you are pointed to the us servers your load balancer should basically uh, you know divide the load between 
the people uh, or between the servers that you have in your fleet right similarly if let's say you are from india so you will also be accessing the same domain which is uh, this right and once you access it you will be basically pointed to the indian servers and in indian servers we are going to have a load balancer which is basically going to route your request to a specific indian server okay so this is the architecture so uh, let me repeat it again so first thing what we'll do is we'll basically uh, deploy some servers in us and deploy some servers in india right and these servers will have a load balancer on top of them so now what is going to happen is if five servers are hosting the same application your user does not have to be concerned about which of these five servers uh, he has to reach he will basically reach to a common point and that common point will be the load balancer which is basically going to route the request based on which server is going to be more free okay and that is exactly what we are going to do with the us servers as well okay so guys this is the architecture there is going to be a separate entity over here uh, that entity is basically called a traffic manager right so that traffic manager has a feature wherein it can see according to which region the request is coming from and which uh, which of the servers that is either the indian server or the us servers based on which request where it sends the request and where it can deal the faster uh, deal the request more faster it will route the request over there and obviously uh, that basically has to do with the distance uh, between the customer and the server so let's say if you are in india and you are trying to access azure project or tk right so obviously if your request is being served from the us servers the uh, ping will be more or the time it will take to uh, you know uh, to to respond to your query would be more than the servers which are de which are basically deployed in the indian region so indian region if you are from india the servers can reply to you more faster similarly if a guy is from us right if he is trying to uh, you know ping a particular website and that website has servers in us obviously they can serve him faster than servers which are going to be there in the indian region right so this is the architecture that we are going to deploy today and this is basically how even a modern e-commerce application basically works so if you have a look at flipkart or amazon these are the things that they implement in the background which normal customers usually don't know about but they basically use every day okay and that is exactly what we are going to do so let's say i type in google.com so you will automatically see the moment i type google.com i'm uh, automatically uh, routed to the indian server so as you can see it's written india over here right if i type in google.co.uk you can again see i'm still on the indian server why because every time i'm trying to go to a different google website i'm always logged to the server which is more nearer to me and that is the indian google right so no matter which url you are entering over here you are always being redirected to the indian google right but if you want to bypass this so let's say you connect to a vpn right let's say you connect to a vpn and you connect to a particular country so whichever country you will be connecting to let's say you connected to uh, uh, you connect to france so now when you will be going to your browser typing in google.com now you will be redirected to google.fr right so that is exactly how it works what we are going to implement in today's hands on as well let's go ahead and the first thing that we would do is go to the azure dashboard so the url is portal.azure.com so once you guys log in or sign up on microsoft azure this is how your dashboard is going to look like now I, now i already have some resources uh, that i have deployed over here so you don't have to worry about them right so what i'm going to do is i'm going to create a resource and once i've created a resource now i will choose what kind of resource that i want to deploy so when i'm creating a new now it's asking me what kind of resource that i want to deploy let's say i want to launch a linux server so a linux server is basically uh, either an ubuntu server or it could be a centos server 
but if i want to launch a win windows server i can choose this windows or i can choose some other uh, operating system as well so this gives me limited option over here these are the popular options that people basically deploy so what we can do is we can just search for virtual machines i can click on that service and as you can see i have some uh, machines which are already running over here so we are going to ignore them so first let's deploy our first virtual machine so we'll click on add and now i can fill in all these things that i want okay so first things first it will ask you uh, a resource group to basically deploy it in so a resource group is nothing but it's basically a logical grouping of all the uh, resources that you're going to deploy on the azure cloud okay so what we can do is we can just click on create new and let's say this is demo hyphen webinar this is the resource group that i'm basically going to create right now okay so the resource group has been created and now we have to enter the virtual machine name so let's say it's uh indian server so this is the server that we are going to deploy right uh next thing that i'm going to see is the region that i want to deploy it in so it's in central india which works out for me which is great uh what is the operating system that i want to launch so these are the different kind of operating system that i can choose between so i have the microsoft options then i have oracle option i have the linux options so whichever i want i can choose so for this demo i'm choosing the ubuntu server then here i can choose the size of the virtual machine that i want to deploy so let's say i want to deploy uh the lowest on this list which is one vcpu and one gb of memory so let's choose this then it is asking me what is the authentication type that i want to choose do i want to log in using a public key or do i want to log in using a password so let's choose password let's give some username over here let's give the username let's say as uh in telepart and now let's give some password as well okay it says the value must be between 12 and 72 characters okay let's give that value okay now which ports do i want to be opened on the firewall so whenever you want to connect to a linux machine you basically connect using the ssh protocol okay and the ssh protocol basically always works on port 22 so port 22 is going to be allowed in the firewall for us let's click on next so now in disks we are being asked which kind of disk do you want do you want premium ssd do you want standard hdd do you want standard ssd so basically this is going to affect your performance so hdd is basically a disk based hard drive then you have solid state hard drive and then you have premium solid state hard drive as well so all these three will have different io values for this demo let's choose standard ssd right and then let's click on next now it's going to ask me uh, where do i want this server to be deployed so it's automatically creating uh, you know a virtual network for me which is called Deb demo webinar bnet right and it is all automatically creating a subnet as well it is assigning a public ip also to my server etc so let me keep everything at default we'll click on next uh, now it is asking me what kind of monitoring do I want on my server, right? So I don't want any more monitoring. So I just switch it off and Click on next again uh, This can also be left so you can just click on next next again and Finally now you can re re basically just review all your settings Right, so it says verification failed. So probably we did not fill out some information let's verify that so we'll just click here okay it says the requested size for resource is currently not available in central india so it's saying the uh, size that i selected which is uh, basically this is not available so let's choose some other size uh, let's choose let's say an 8 gb machine or a 2 gb machine let's say let's click on review plus create okay even this is not available 
all right so sometimes the region that you choose they might not have the required size that you want to launch and in that case you just have to go ahead and choose for a size that might be available i think if i go for a premium size it should be available give me a second okay so you can see there's a high demand for all these servers and that's why they're all used right so what we can do is we can just go back and none of the servers are available in this region so let's go to some other region uh, let's select uh, south india i think that should have some servers available for us okay so here some servers are available great so what we can choose let's choose the same size that we selected earlier click on review plus create and as you can see the validation has now passed so let's click on create now and with this now my server is getting launched okay now it will take some time for this server to get deployed but basically what we have done is uh, we have deployed one server in the south india region which basically is going to make use of an ubuntu server okay so let's go back to the dashboard and let me show you the uh, resource group which is basically getting created okay there are a lot of resource groups over here but what you can basically refer to is this so demo webinar is the resource group that i created right so now let's go ahead inside the demo webinar and here you can see the resource that you've just deployed the indian server it is getting deployed in there so as you can see the deployment has got succeeded great so let's deploy a us server as well so again let's click on add on the resource group let's create a second resource group for our us servers so that we can differentiate between uh, the resources that we are going to deploy and let's deploy it in the best us region okay click on review plus create and finally create this resource group okay so the resource group has got created and now i can just go to that resource group and can deploy some resources over here so let's do the same thing let's deploy a virtual machine again in the us resource group so i'll just click on create a virtual machine us server one let's get this name let's deploy it in best us okay this is the image that i want to launch uh this is the size that is automatically selected let's hope it is available let's give the username as intellipart and the password as this i think i'll keep the same password which i used for my previous server okay click on disks i think rest everything we can leave at default only in management we will turn the monitoring off and click on review plus create so as you can see the price is just 80 pesa per hour which is great so we'll just create it now and now a server is being launched in the us region okay now to make it more authentic let's deploy one one uh, virtual machine more so so that we have two and on top of these two virtual machines then we will deploy uh, you know a load balancer as well and we'll also figure out a way so that when we basically hit the load balancer we automatically get to know which server basically we are trying to connect to okay so while this is being deployed let's deploy uh, one more virtual machine in india so let's add one more it will be in the resource group called demo webinar virtual machine now name it will be indian 2 it will be in south india region uh, same image same uh, 
server configuration. Username would be entire part. And let's give the password same. Okay. Let's go to management. Uh, turn off boot diagnostics. And now let's create it. So in networking, let me see. Yes, so we are under the same uh, network that we created earlier. And now let's just go ahead and create this. All right, so with this guys, we have now deployed uh, two servers in the India region. And let's do the same for US as well. Let's deploy one more last uh, PM for our US region as well. So this will be in the uh, US resource group. Right. And the virtual machine is going to be named as uh, US server 2. It's going to be in the West US, same machine config. Username would be Interipart, and password would be the same what I entered for those. Again, finally, we'll go to management, turn out diagnostics, click on review plus create and create the VM now. Okay, so now this will be deployed in the background and what we can do is we can start configuring our server now. Okay, so let's head over to the US server, sorry, the Indian servers first and let's try to configure the first server that we deployed. So this is the IP address of this server. Let's connect to it. So for connecting, you will first need a terminal. So people who are using Windows, what you can do is, you can download a software called Putty, right? So you just have to go to putty.org, go to download Putty, just click over here. And then what you have to do is, you have to download the Putty 64-bit version, which is this, right? And once you download this, uh, you know, you will see a window like this, right? So in this window, all you have to do is, uh, okay, one second. Yes, this is the window that you will see. So just enter the IP address over here of the server. So in this case, the server's IP address is this. Just enter that over here and click on open, right? And that is about it. Same screen, then you will see as I'm seeing right now. Okay, so I'll just enter SSH. So people who are there on Linux or Mac, you just have to enter this command. So SSH, enter a part, at the rate, the IP address, hit enter, type in yes, it will ask the password. So just enter the password of the server. Even the putty guys will see the screen. And then you are now logged into your Intel uh, sorry, your Indian server in the Azure region. So this is your first server. Let's connect to a second server as well. So SSH in part at the rate, and then the second server is this. Uh, let's copy the IP for this server as well. Put in here. And now it's asking the password. And yes, you are now connected to your second server as well. Okay. So what I've done is I have deployed four servers, two in the US region, two in the India region, and now I've connected to these servers in the India region. All right, guys. So let's go ahead and configure these servers now. So what I'm going to do is first I'm going to basically install a web server software which is called Apache 2 
So in order to install that, first we'll have to update the machine. So let's update it by typing in the command so we could get update. And once the servers are updated, now let's install the software by using this command, which is sudo apt get install apache2. Okay, so the software is being installed over here. We can do the same on the other server as well. First update it. And once it's updated, we will install the Apache 2 software. So both the machines now have the Apache 2 software installed. And now let's try to see if that software is working or not. So ideally what should happen is if you install the software and if you copy the IP address of your server and try to paste it in the browser, you should be able to see the website that you have just deployed. But what happens is because, you know, we have not opened the firewall for uh, the HTTP protocol, that's why we are not able to see this web page right now. You remember we only opened uh, the port 22. So whenever your browser is trying to interact with your server, it always tries to interact on port 80. And that is exactly why you're not uh, seeing the web page right now. So what we can do is, let's say this is my Indian server 2. So all I have to go to is networking. And in networking, I have to add an inbound uh, rule. So in the rule, uh, I have to specify the destination port, which is port 80. And it is going to be allowed. And I just click on add. So with this rule in place, uh, what is going to happen is the port 80 is going to be opened in the firewall. And then once the rule has been created now, right? So this will take around, uh, you know, 30 to 40 seconds to basically get uh, updated in the main firewall of Azure. And then we should be able to see this website. So let's wait for some 30 to 35 seconds. And while this is happening, let's also open the port 80 on the first Indian server. So we'll just go to the first Indian server go to networking and add uh, port 80 over here okay so this rule is now getting created and if i go back you can see on this ip address i am able to see the apache 2 page so this is the indian 2's ip address and we are going to change this web page in a little while and I'll show you how you can do that. So to replace this file, what you have to do is you have to go to slash var slash www slash HTML and then replace index.html. So that is exactly what we are going to do now. So let's go to Indian 2 server. Let's go to the file location which was mentioned. And in this file location, now let's delete the index.html which is present. And let's add one more index.html. So to create or edit any file, you have to make use of the command sudo nano. So nano is basically just like notepad that you have in Windows, right? So notepad opens a notepad uh, for you to write in or edit documents. Similarly, in Ubuntu, there is a text editor called nano. Right? So we're gonna open that. And as you can see, it is now creating a file called index.html. So let's write a very simple HTML code over here, uh, which, which is basically we're just going to have one line, which is saying welcome to the Indian server two, right? Let's write this HTML, done. And now if I refresh this, you can see it says welcome to Indian server two, which is great. So now let's do the same thing for our first Indian server as well. So right now, if I go to this IP address in a new tab, I'll be seeing the default Apache two page. Uh, let's replace that with 
this code so what i'm do is i'll first go to the file path and now i am going to paste the code that we wrote over here into this file and change this to welcome to indian server one okay done and now if i refresh it great so now i have two ip addresses where if i go from the browser to these ip addresses i can going to see indian server one and indian server two and now what we are going to do is we are going to put a load balancer on top of them okay so let's see how we can do that so there are a lot of type of load balancers that basically you can deploy uh, the load balancer that we are going to deploy today is basically an application gateway Okay, so let's go to application gateway And in application gateway all we have to do is uh, So there are yeah, so we'll just click on add So what is Microsoft Azure? Microsoft Azure is a cloud provider that provides various platform as a service and infrastructure as a service products. Azure has cloud solutions to all the infrastructural problems by providing services in various domains. Did you know that almost 95% of Fortune 500 companies are using Azure? Also, it is 5 times cheaper than AWS in terms of Windows and SQL Server because there are also Microsoft products. Forbes say that Microsoft Azure is set to boost the size of the IT market by $10 trillion in the next 10 years. As per predictions, 80% of the businesses will move their workload to cloud by 2025, thus making it a major career to consider transitioning to. For a better understanding of Azure, let us start at the very beginning. Microsoft Azure was announced in October 2008 and released on February 1, 2010 as Windows Azure first and later named as Microsoft Azure on 25th March 2015. In today's scenario, its reach is in 140 countries and is still expanding which is pretty impeccable. In simpler terms, Microsoft Azure is a platform that enables users to engage in agile cloud computing and is designed for creating and managing apps through Microsoft's data center. Now there are four integral Microsoft Azure service domains. The first one is Azure Compute. Compute is the most integral domain in Azure as it brings everything together with Azure Virtual Machines. You can get on-demand scalable compute resources, Azure Virtual Machines, App Services and Container Instances are some popular compute services. Second we have Azure Networking, Networks from the Cloud Networks. In Azure, VNet is the networking tool that connects all Azure resources together. These networking services allow enterprises to safely connect their on-premises services to the Azure Cloud. It is also used to manage virtual private networks and further create multiple virtual networks on the cloud. The third one is Azure Storage. Azure Storage provides storage solutions that are more durable and large-scale applications, data-driven applications can be built without any hassle. Azure automatically scales the storage requirements according to the usage and it automatically balances throughput according to the connections made. And the last one is Azure Database. Azure provides relational databases, NoSQL databases, data lakes and data warehouses. It provides a scalable, high available and fault tolerant database server and lets you scale according to the incoming data. There are various job roles in Azure. Let's take a look at one of the most popular job roles, Azure Developer. An Azure developer is a cloud professional who creates cloud-based applications making use of the benefits of the cloud architecture. 
If you are proficient in testing, security, development and deployment, then a career in Azure development is somewhere you will fit in well. The job includes responsibilities like testing of applications, maintaining, developing and deploy them on Azure. It also includes participating in all phases of development and having the ability to work side by side with cloud administrators, clients and cloud architects. In United States, on average basis, an Azure developer gets paid $132,148 per annum. However, for an entry level developer, it's $97,000. Whereas in India, the salary offered ranges from 7 lakhs to 25 lakhs per annum. That's all about Azure. Just a quick info guys. IntelliPad provides Microsoft Azure certification training in partnership with Microsoft, mentored by industry experts. The course link of which is given in the description below. Now let's continue with the session. And now it's going to ask us which resource group we want to deploy it in. So we will, let's first apply, deploy it for the US region. So we are going to say, say US servers, application gateway, let's say US server one. Uh, the region is best US. And virtual network, uh, this is the virtual network we have to deploy it in. Now, this is the error that you will get. It says the subnet must only have application gateway. Now, in order to have this, what you'll have to do is you will have to create a subnet which is not going to have any other resource, right? So how we can do that is just go to your Azure portal and then go to virtual networks. Now the network that we want to configure is the US servers, right? And in this, if you go to subnets, you can see there's only one subnet right now, which is the default subnet. So let's add one more subnet. And let's, the address range for this, now the address range can be a little confusing to you. So let me make it as simple as possible for you guys. So right now you can see that address range over here is 10.3.2.0 slash 24. So slash 24 basically says how many IP addresses can be included. So if you type in slash 24, it gives you 250 uh, IP addresses in the range of 10.3.2. It could be .1, .2, .3, .19, .99 right etc so thus that could be the range so similarly we just replicate this and we'll specify 10.3 uh, instead of 2 we can specify let's say 5.0 slash 24 right and let's say this is for our ag uh, subnet okay so it says the subnet is not contained within these address space of the virtual network okay let's solve that as well so we will first have to go to address space so we can in so here the address space is this so instead of this range i can give a better range which can be slash 16 so the lower the number the higher number of uh, ranges you get so i have specified it slash 16 over here so what this basically tells is that the whole uh, the whole virtual network can have ip address in these ranges and obviously the subnets have to lie between these ranges right so my uh, default subnet is ob obviously within the range of 10.3 now i'm going to specify a subnet range for my application gateway which is going to be this okay and let's call it ag hyphen submit all right let's click on okay so this subnet is now being added okay it's been added and now if you go back to us service vnet you can see that ag subnet we can choose now okay and it's not giving any error now 
okay so now let's click on next and now it is asking me what will be the front end of this load balancer the front end is always a ip address so there will be one ip address of the load balancer that we will be hitting and that ip address is basically going to route to the uh, backend servers that we have so let's add uh, let's call this as ag hyphen ip hyphen us okay next uh, now it's asking me to add backends uh, so backends uh, we can add uh, we can click on add a backend pool let's name this backend pool as uh, us hyphen pool and let's add the uh, virtual machines in this so the target type would be a virtual machine and if it could be us server 2 let's add this first and again a virtual machine and let's choose us server 1 is not being listed over here so only the servers which are in the virtual network of uh, this application gateway can be added so i think uh, the server one that we deployed is not in the same uh, virtual network let's verify that so let's go to virtual machines and let's go to okay so I think this is a problem. So our US server one is in a different network. Hmm. Okay, let's try to fix that. So it's a good thing we did not configure US servers yet. So what we'll do is we'll just delete this server. That is US server one. And while it is being deleted, uh, let's quickly add a, a new virtual machine. In the resource group of US servers. Uh, let's name this virtual, uh, virtual machine as server one US or US server one. Uh, it will be in the West US. The operating system will be Ubuntu server. This is the size of the virtual machine. Username would be in telepart. The authentication type would be password. And as you can see, the deletion happened automatically in the background. And now let's specify the password. Right. Let's go to management turn off the boot diagnostics and click on review plus create okay so now my virtual machine is getting created now it will take a minute or so to get, get this ready guys so so we have now deployed the uh, us servers uh, correctly and what we can do now is let's connect to them and let's try to configure them Right, before we can actually go ahead and connect to the application gateway. Okay, so let's go to US server one. Okay, it's taking some time to load. Uh, one second, guys. Okay, so this is a US server one. This is the IP address. Let's try to connect to it. All right, so we are connected to US server one. Let's try to connect to US server two as well. Okay, this is the IP address. 
Great. So we're connected to both the servers. On the first server, let's update the machine. On the second server as well, let's update the machine. So same steps as we did earlier. And once they're updated, let's install the Apache 2 software on this. Okay, so it is being installed. Similarly over here as well, let's install the software. Okay, so while this is being installed, let's copy the code that we have to put on this server as well. Now it's taking some time to load. Let's give it that time. So let's put the website for the US server now. So this is US server one. So let's put that in for there. Similarly, Let's edit this as US Server 2. Great. Uh, now let's open these ports in the servers. So this is Server 2. Let's go to networking. Uh, let's add the port 80 rule. And while this rule is being created, Let's do the same for US server one as well. And now what we can do is we can just put in these IP addresses in our browser to verify whether these are working or not. So US server one is working. Similarly, let's check US server two as well. And that is working as well. So let me give you these IP addresses again in the chat so you guys can verify if these are working or not. And if they are, I think uh, we are good to go with at least the VM architecture and we can now de start deploying the load balancers. Now, based on the operating system that you choose, automatically the price of that server is adjusted. So let's say you're choosing a licensed product that license cost is included in the rent of the server that you're going to pay. All right, so that's how it's managed. If the IP addresses are now working, let's now start configuring the application gateway. So we are in the US server application gateway. Uh, so we left off over here. So we have chose, chosen US server 2. Let's choose again virtual machine. And I think we will have to refresh this. So let's reload. Okay, so resource group was US servers. Application gateway name is AG hyphen US servers. Region is West US. Uh, tier is okay. Uh, virtual network is US servers VNet. And okay, so. Okay, so in the previous one, I think it was creating an application gateway, but it got left off the green. So I think let's start to configure that application gateway itself. Okay, so I think uh, because we left off the previous application gateway, it has hindered, uh, you know, a problem in AG subnet. Or what I think is the US server one that we deployed. I think we have deployed it in AG subnet. Let me just double check that. Uh, okay, so this is server one. And if you go to the overview, yes, so this is the problem. Okay, so let's see if we can change that. Um, so we can go to networking. Uh, 
okay so let's do this guys let's delete this again because if we edit it i think there will be a lot of steps that i have to do it won't take much time and in the meanwhile let's create one again okay so the sizes are loading so we'll have to wait let's quickly enter the same info i think let's be double sure that we're deploying it in the default subnet now and management let's turn off the diagnostics you press create i think every good thing looks good now let's create it great so it's now getting created it'll take some 30 40 seconds so let's complete that and then come back to our application gateway so let's copy the code paste it here and i think that is about it so now we can just verify if we can see this ip on the browser so yes we can great and now what we can do is so now that we have the servers configured uh let's go to application gateway uh, add one uh, we're gonna add it to the uh, us server first us servers resource group let's call it at ag hyphen us it's gonna be a part of West US. Auto scaling, we don't want it. Virtual network would be US servers BNet. Okay, what is the problem now? Well, this is part of, okay, let's do this. Uh, let's just delete the AGNet subnet and let's try to connect to it again. So US servers BNet, uh, we go subnets. Or the AG subnet, let's delete it. Okay, so there seems to be some network interface which I was making use of it. Uh, what we can do is let's leave this, uh, let's create one more subnet where we can have our application gateway. So let's call it as AG1 hyphen subnet, and this could be the range let's create it and now okay this is a subnet that we want to configure let's choose an ip address let's add one new hyphen ag us okay let's add a backend pool so backend pool is nothing but your servers so right so let's add them so let's choose a virtual machine let's choose the first virtual machine and now let's choose the second virtual machine as well okay so we have added the backend pool let's call it as uh, us backend let's add it done uh, configuration so is there a routing rule that you want to specify uh, let's not specify anything so in that case will be a uh, okay i think we have to specify so let's specify a backend rule let's call it as a first rule right listener name would be let's say it's listener hyphen us front end ip would be public listener type is basic error page is url backend targets so it will be us backend http sec setting let's add new http setting Let's call it as HTTP US. Add it. We're not adding any path based rules in this load balancer. Okay. Let's click on add. And finally, let's just click on review plus create and create it. So, with this, now we have created the load balancer uh, that is required for these US servers. Now, I think it will take a minute or two to deploy. So let's give it that time. Meanwhile, 
uh, we can deploy the same for our Indian servers as well. So for our Indian servers, I think uh, the first thing that we would need is uh, the virtual network to be configured. Right. So let's go to our demo webinar resource group. Now in this, the virtual network, the subnets, in this we just have the default one. So uh, first we'll change the address space, saved. Now we go to subnets, okay. Let's add a subnet and let's call it the AG subnet. So now we have a subnet for the application gateway, right? And now let's go to application gateways. And this is the US one, which is getting created, right? Let's add one more and it will be in the demo webinar resource group. We'll call it as eg-india. It'll be part of the South India region, not scaling. Virtual network would be demo webinar vnet. And yes, the subnet would be ag-subnet, which is great. Uh, now let's add a public IP address to it and let's call it eg-india. Again, the backend. So let's add a backend pool. It will be of type virtual machine. So let's first add uh, the first Indian server and then the second Indian server. Okay. And let's call this as the India backend. So backend pool has been added. Now let's add a routing rule. So again, the same configuration, guys. Uh, the rule name, let's call it as India rule. Listener name, you can give it anything. Let's call it my listener. Front end IP, it would be public, obviously. Uh, then let's specify the backend targets. So backend pool would be India backend. HTTP seconds, you will have to add a new setting. Uh, let's call it as HTTP India. Here nothing to be specified just create the rule uh, the HTTP setting and I think that should be about it we're not adding any parts and let's just click on create now so with this uh, my application gateway has been created and this application gateway is now being deployed for India I think my US one should already be deployed so Let's check that out. So if I go to AG in US, uh, this is the IP address. Let's copy it, paste it on my browser. And as of now, I'm not able to connect uh, to anything right now, right? So what I'll do is uh, I'll just go back to my US application gateway. Uh, let me check. So there are a couple of things which can go wrong because of which it is not connecting. So let's first check the firewall. So here everything seems okay. Let's go to configuration. Here everything seems to be okay. We'll go to backend pools. Okay, so there are no targets according to the rules associated. Uh, let's check that. Okay, so there are no targets in the backend pool for US. Let's add it. Although I think we did add it, but it's not there, so let's not waste any time and save this okay while this is happening we can also check out the other settings so HTTP settings look good front-end IP configuration public we have configured it looks good uh, we have added a listener which is okay uh, rules look good for sure health probes okay nothing here then I think you also something have something called as backend health. Okay, so application gateway right now is in the uh, deployment phase, right? So that's why you cannot uh, see it right now. So let's wait for it to get completed. I think uh, our application gateway is still in the deployment phase. So as you can see that deployment to group US servers is still in progress. So I guess the application gateway has not deployed uh, fully. And that's why, you know, it's taking some more time. 
so load balancers are very are a very heavy resource guys so it usually takes around some five to six minutes to deploy so let's wait for that that, that time uh while this is completed right and while it is being completed let me see if we have any more questions so Okay, so US servers, one is failed, one is succeeded. Let's see if we have everything in my application gateway. Okay, this is my US application gateway, guys, as you can see from the name. Let's check the backend health. So now you should have two servers listed over here, which are not listed. Okay, let's go to backend pools. So there are two targets, which is good. Uh, let's go to HTTP settings. This looks okay. Rules looks okay. Okay, let's try to go here. Okay, and try to refresh this. Okay, so at least our application gateway has been deployed. It just says that there's a bad gateway. So we will see how we can fix this. Meanwhile, even our Indian server has been deployed. Oh, sorry, Indian application gateway. Let's see how that is working out for us. So we'll go to the application gateway India. Uh, let's copy the IP address, paste it in the browser. Hit enter. Okay, this seems to be working just fine. So it says, Welcome to Indian server one great if you keep hitting refresh it, it as you can see it is now routing you to indian server 2 as well right again it is routing to 1 again to 2 again to 1 again to 2 so it randomly basically takes up your request and it is now routing it to you routing to one of the servers usually on the production of architectures what happens is uh, once there is a load balancer through which the servers can be accessed on the browser, the server's uh, firewall is restricted to just allow connections from the load balancer. Obviously, this is done uh, as a security reason, but you will have to do it by yourself, right? And that's a architectural uh, best practice. Okay, so this is working fine, and uh the us application gateway is giving some issues to us so let's see how we can figure that out uh let me just go to the us application gateway so first things first let's see if the us servers are working fine yes the first server is working fine and the second server is also working fine great um so i think the problem is that the backend health is still not restored over here and because of this uh i think it's giving you as a 502 error okay so to fix this what we can do is we can go to backend pools and we can just delete these targets save it and once this deployment is successful, we can add the new two targets, uh, again the two targets, and I think that should solve the problem. Okay, so while this is happening, uh, let's go ahead and configure our traffic manager now. So we can see that the India load balancer is working perfectly fine. So now what we'll do is, let's create a traffic manager. Okay, so let's create a new traffic manager. Let's click on add. And let's call it as global traffic manager. And we can deploy it in any region. Uh, let's say we are deploying it in uh, US. Okay, resource group would be US servers. And okay this is very important the routing method so we want to route it according to geography right so 
wherever the request is coming from that request should basically be routed to the servers which are near to it so we have chosen the routing method as geographic let's click on create and with this our traffic manager has now been uh, created okay now this will take some time so let's give that time to it and now let's click on add so in the traffic manager profile uh, okay we have already added it so it should list here let's refresh so it will take some time to uh, okay so deployment has succeeded great so the traffic manager we can see it over here now the status is enabled so we can go inside this traffic manager now and what we can do is we can uh, configure it to connect to our uh, load balancers okay so for doing that you will have to go to configuration okay everything looks good over here So now we will have to add endpoints since there are no endpoints over here. So we'll go to endpoints, add an endpoint. So let's add it for the Indian server first, right? So the so whenever you're adding the endpoints, uh, you have to make sure of one thing, which I'm going to show you in a little while. So first of all, let's select the public IP address, and the IP address would be for AG in there. So as you can see, it says no DNS name is configured, right? So what you'd have to do is for the AG India IP address, AG India is with nothing but the application gateway of India, you will have to configure the DNS, okay? So let's see how we can do that. Let's go to the uh, IP addresses page. We'll go to public IP addresses. Here we'll go to AG hyphen India, which is this. And AG hyphen India, now what we'll do is we'll go to configuration. In configuration, we can give the DNS name, right? So all our DS, DNS names will are going to have this suffix attached with it. So let's give this as AG IP. Now it is checking whether it's available. So it's a GIP. So it's available, and now we can just click on save. With this, our public IP address <clears throat> is now going to have a DNS name. Okay, so it's done. And now over here, I will have to, I think, refresh this. So let's add an endpoint again let's call it as ag india endpoint it's going to be a public ip address and the ip address is ag india great so let's click on add and now i can just do a regional mapping over here which is going to be mapped to it so here we can choose to distribute traffic based on specific geographic locations okay so anybody who's pinging from asia in asia let's say uh, india then they should basically be routed to this endpoint okay so with this your endpoint has now been configured in the traffic manager to connect to your indian servers so now let's verify uh if my ag us yes so in application gateway the for the us servers it was successful great so now what i can do is i can again add the targets and that should solve our problem okay so the deployment is now happening meanwhile let's verify 
if we go to our traffic manager which is having this dns are we able to access the servers or not so yes we are able to access the indian servers right so that means our traffic manager is working just fine so i can give you this ip address as well so right now because only indian ip addresses are there uh, that's why our indian uh, servers are connected to it our indian endpoint has been added that's why only uh, the indian servers are connected but as soon as we also add the application gateway for us people who are from outside asia they will be able to uh, connect to it right so while this is happening dns name so we will just search for dns uh just select dns zones so here you can basically add a rule or you can configure a custom url which can connect to your uh traffic manager and let's see how we can do that so if you want to do that guys uh the simplest thing to do over here would be to first go to uh, so there's a website called freenom just go over there so freenom is a website which basically gives you a free domain to work with okay so let's sign in i already have signed up over here so you guys can also sign up and with this what you're going to get is you're going to get a domain that you can use uh for free so for example i have a azure hyphen project.tk domain which now i'm going to configure to connect to this traffic manager that i have specified and then all i have to do is the moment i go to azure hyphen project.tk i would be able to uh see the website that i've deployed okay so in order to do that just go to dns so first you will have to add a dns zone uh let's specify it in us again and the name that we will give them is dns hyphen public okay or basically it's expressing expecting us to get the domain name itself so it will be azure hyphen project dot tk okay let's click on review plus create create it and with this our dns zone will now be created and this dns zone we will uh, have to connect uh, our domain to this dns zone and then we will configure a dns zone to connect to our traffic manager so that is how the flow is going to happen so the dns zone deployment is complete so we can just go to uh the resource so here we are and here this is the most important thing guys you get name servers you get four name servers over here and these name servers you basically have to configure in your uh, website which is basically giving you the uh, dns name okay so let's copy these let's go to a free norm website go to the domain that we are going to configure it's going to be azure hyphen project so we'll click on manage domain and in manage domain we'll go to management tools and then name servers so just replace the name servers that are there with the new ones and that should be it that's about it how to configure your domain to basically connect so just copy it one by one okay so now just click on change name servers and that's it that's all you have to do on the freenom website okay now come back to your dns zones over here and now what you can do is just uh close this okay now you just have to point your dns zone to your 
traffic manager so just click on record add a record set and this let's uh, configure it to be c name and it is the global traffic manager that we want to point on okay let's click on okay so here we have to enter something so let's enter www and let's click on okay okay so with this our record set has now got created and it will take like a minute or two or sometimes it even takes 24 hours to basically make a change on the dns server so we'll check that meanwhile uh, let's come back to our application gateway check the backend help now and let's see if this has loaded great so now it is showing us both the us backends right uh, in the uh, application gateway of us and now if we go ahead and try to connect to it this is the ip address great we are able to connect to the us servers and we can see that it first connects it to the first one then the second one so let's copy this and let me give it to you guys so you can test it out now what i'll do is on this application gateway uh, the ip address that we have just got let's configure that to have a dns name so we'll go to configuration uh, this would be agus so it's available let's save it and then once this is configured we can just go to uh, the traffic manager now and add an endpoint for the us servers so we'll go to endpoints add an endpoint over here and this will be for ag india uh, it's a public ip address the target resource type and we have to connect to new ag us click on add okay so again uh, we will have to do the regional grouping so in this case now anybody can connect right so any the whole world can connect and if the whole world is connecting uh sorry this will not be ag india this will be ag us the whole world can connect and if they want to connect they will be able to go to this endpoint So now let's see what happens. Uh, so once let, let's make uh, let's wait for this to come online. And uh, once it is, we will just check if you go to the traffic manager, which server it is basically pointing us to. Given the fact that this particular endpoint is for the whole world to access. So once you have signed up, go to the home page. Then go to services, go to register a new domain. And once you go to register a new domain, it will basically ask you which domain you want to go for. Just enter the name over here and find your new domain. Uh, you will get a list of available options. Choose the one that you want and then do the steps that I just told you. So that should help you out. Okay, so I'm being routed to the Indian servers. Always, great. Now what I can do is I can connect to a US server, right? And then uh, through VPN and then we can see if it is working out for us. Uh, so sometimes there are inconsistencies. Uh, sometimes people in other regions might get redirected to uh, the region to uh, another uh, service, but I think that is just because the service has just been started if you leave it for 24 hours to work or 30 hours to work 
it will start functioning properly and then everyone i think 95 percent of us got the right uh, answer right people from india are able to access the indian servers and people from us are able to access the us servers great guys so and now let's check the final part of our project so now just let's go to azure hyphen project or tk and let's see if that is working out for us great so now even the azure hyphen project or tk url is pointing to our servers try it out and let me know what the results are so now the people from us also should be seeing the us page and indian one should be seeing from the indian page so firstly let's understand why azure is important because i understand a lot of people over here will not even understand what cloud is right what azure is so let me go ahead and show you guys why is there a need of cloud okay and let's understand that using a story so let's take the example uh, wherein let's say you guys want to start your own company let's talk from that perspective and then we'll understand why big companies are using uh, cloud platforms like azure today all right so let's say you're a guy who just wants to open a food platform let's say you're the food platform that you want to open is uber eats okay so if you want to open an application like uber eats uh, what is the first thing that you'll have to do so obviously first of all you will have to have an application right which basically you will be developing and which will basically work right so let's say you hired a team of developers and you've done that so now your application is ready and now the next step is basically making it available to the world right making it available on the internet so how will you do that so for doing that guys first of all you need to host that application on a server okay now uh, when you're starting small and let's say there are four or five people who are going to use your application you can do that using your own laptop as well now when you're doing it using your own laptop let's say you have developed the application right and now you want to host on the internet so what you do is you basically run that application on your laptop you connect it to the internet right and obviously there are a certain other things as well that you would need for example you would need a static ip of your laptop which an ip which is not going to change anytime right and at the same time you will also need 24 7 electricity so that your laptop never shuts down right otherwise if your laptop shuts down the other people will not be able to use that application okay so guys this would be the basic setup that you would need to host your application now let's talk about a scenario uh, wherein you know your application becomes a hit overnight and now some thousands of users are using your application now obviously your laptop will not be enough so what will you have to do so as you know that okay so my application is actually working a lot of people want to use my application and you know it is going to be a success in the future now so what you do is you take a loan from some bank or you uh, take some amount from your savings and then you ba basically buy a set of servers okay so those servers take around two to three days to basically get delivered to you then you basically set them up for setting them up again uh, you know you need a team which can basically install the required software on it then you need a place where you can keep these servers so you rent some apartment put those servers over there uh, you know connect uh, it to a power backup uh, kind of a facility where even if the electricity goes there is a generator which is going to power up your server and at the same time you basically also contact a service provider an internet service provider which is going to give you good internet to your servers seems everything sorted right so now you've invested a huge chunk of money on your application right and now you have made it available on the servers where thousands of people can access it okay now the application again becomes a hit overnight and now there are more customers who basically want to access your application and now the servers that you bought they're not enough so what you basically happens is uh, you get to know okay so more customers are using your application now and now you suddenly have to buy more servers because obviously the servers that you have currently they're not uh, giving you the uh, the right kind of performance that you need so again you have to invest some money now take one thing into account guys that servers are very expensive 
at the same time you also rented a place you are giving money for the internet connection you are giving money for the electricity so there's a lot of investment required over here to make your application available online to hundred thousands of users or even a million people right and obviously because you know you've just started out you are not getting the kind of money that you're supposed to do because you're also doing marketing for your application you're also giving a lot of discounts on your application because of which you're not getting the right right kind of revenue in right so what should you do so as and when the traffic will grow again and again you will have to buy more servers and that will require more investment from your side so you get fed up of the solution uh, of, of this particular uh, situation and now you're looking of ways to basically solve it now if this kind of situation arose before the year 2006 or 2005 well you didn't have any other option but to shut your company or take some loan from a bank and pay the interest also to the bank while you are repaying uh, you know the amount to them right but now with cloud providers such as azure such as aws such as google cloud platform this has become very easy so what is this cloud platform and how is it going to help you let's understand that so guys with a cloud platform what you can do is you can rent infrastructure right so now let's say you have an application which is ready and you want to make it available to the world so what you will do is you can basically uh, you know go to uh, azure and you can just tell them okay you know what i need uh, 32 gb of ram of servers and around 16 core of cpus just a quick info guys intellipad provides microsoft azure certification training in partnership with microsoft mentored by industry experts the course link of which is given in the description below now let's continue with the session right and i want 24 7 electricity i want that server to never go down is that possible so as your people say yes that is possible all you have to do is monthly you just have to pay the rent uh, for our servers we will manage all the electricity we will manage all the internet connection we will manage uh, everything which is required from the hardware perspective all you have to do is take care of your application which you're deploying to the server and nothing else and in lieu of that you just have to pay the rent of the server that you are using now let's say after one month you do not require the servers anymore so you there is no security that you have to pay there is nothing you have to you have to pay just pay the amount that you have used the server for and that is about it that we require nothing else at the same time let's say tomorrow you need more servers that you want to add while uh, you know your customers are growing so all you have to do is take some more servers on rent and apply to your existing fleet of infrastructure and you're set and it will hardly take two to three minutes to do this right and again you just have to pay the rent of the servers that you are basically going to use okay so now with this uh, they also give you a feature wherein let's say the load increases on your application the cpu usage of the servers which are hosting your application it increases so automatically new servers will be added to your fleet and as and when the cpu usage goes down a particular number it can also start removing servers from your fleet right or removing servers from your infrastructure and this is what is called as auto scaling and with this you never have to now worry about how many servers you need how many people are there on your website why because everything is being managed automatically and at the same time you do not have to buy servers now you can just rent them and use it as long as you want them right so this came to be a very good deal for you and that is exactly how millions of companies worldwide have now shifted to cloud why because azure is going to azure or aws or any other google cloud platform for that matter is giving you servers on rent rent right and the rent is as low as 0 0.005 dollars per hour right so that is how cheap the rent is for the servers that you're basically trying to deploy and with this uh, you know the internet is managed with them the even if the hardware outdates let's say tomorrow they will upgrade your hardware for free you don't have to pay them anything extra other than your rent they are going to manage everything 
and because of this your usage is going up why because now uh, your application is available all the time and at the same time the traffic also uh, is being managed automatically so that uh, the new servers are added to your fleet and are removed for your fleet as and when the traffic increases or decreases okay so this is the story of a startup why it was using azure now let me show you some of the companies who are using azure today right or are using a cloud platform today specifically microsoft azure so these are all the companies who are using microsoft azure for all kind of needs of infrastructure right and they just have their software over it so companies like toyota honeywell lufthansa linkedin samsung xerox bmw and even microsoft itself so any microsoft website that you go to is also hosted on microsoft azure right so all these companies are on azure for the very same reason that i've just explained you first thing is cost effectiveness second thing is distribution of work because now you don't have to have your own team to manage your servers and at the same time you also are can be reliable on the infrastructure which azure has given you because it would have been a pain to manage the hardware uh, you know a team which is going to monitor your hardware all the time if you want to set it up all by yourself okay so now that we have understood what azure is exactly and why we should use it now we will move along and understand some azure services and its pricing so suhas is saying how much does it cost to owning a server versus uh, buying from cloud okay so suhas it depends on the size of a server so let's say if you uh, let's let's compare the price of having a pc today right so if you buy a pc which which has a very good gpu right uh, let's let's say you buy a 2080 ti graphic card with an i9 core cpu which has around 16 cores right and a 64 gigs of ram which has around 3000 megahertz of speed so this setup for just the cpu is going to cost you around 3 to 4 lakhs and now this is a pc now imagine if you have to set up a server and this PC will now be multiple times in the server rack that you have, which is basically going to cater to 1,000, 2,000 people. So the cost of this setup is going to be around 6 to 7 lakhs per server rack, right? Now imagine when your server hits 100,000 users or 200,000 users, this cost is going to increase exponentially. Now obviously you will have to manage it according to the revenue that you are generating, right? But at the same time, the revenue will take some time to come in. Right, and at the same time, if your users are ex increasing exponentially, which is a good thing for you though, but let's say if you are not able to manage the demand of the users, which is basically the infrastructure that you have, it again becomes a problem. Let's say you have that kind of money to buy your own infrastructure, but with every increasing demand, that infrastructure will take some time to come to your office. At the same time, you will also have to take a headache of manage, managing or hiring a team of your own to basically manage these servers right and obviously when you hire a team you also have to deal with the problems that the team is facing you have to also deal with uh, you know uh, what are the kind of tasks that you will be assigning them etc so it becomes a headache for you because you basically wanted to open a app which is basically a software so not only you now have to manage the software, but you are also going to manage the hardware side of the hardware software, thus giving less time to your application, which probably if you have spent more time on it, you could have increased the revenue of your company, right? And that is exactly why basically companies prefer cloud providers. Okay, Santosh is saying, what about security charges? So Santosh, everything, you just have to include the rental charges, security uh, from the hardware perspective security from the perspective of uh, you know if you're deploying a firewall on azure so that firewall's foolproofness is all guaranteed by microsoft azure now think about it like this let's say you have your own application that you're trying to launch in the internet space now obviously the kind of security uh, you know aspects that you can create around your application the kind of money that you can invest around your application just for the security needs whatever that money is it's going to be always less than what azure has already invested 
on their infrastructure given the fact that Microsoft itself is hosting each and every service of theirs on Microsoft Azure. Okay, so you can be rest assured that if you are hosting your application on a cloud like Azure, it's getting best in class infrastructure and at the same time, uh, you know, the security best practices. Now, obviously, you will have to make sure that your application from the software perspective is secure as well. That is not something that Azure can guarantee, but the infrastructure that you're deploying on cannot be tampered with. That is something that Azure will guarantee you. I just told you about why cloud platforms are basically, uh, you know, preferred rather than owning your own infrastructure. Now, why are we learning Azure today? Let's let's try to answer that question. So, as you all know, that uh, Amazon Web Services is the largest cloud provider in the market right now, right? And when I say the largest cloud provider, it has around 41 to 42 percent market share. Now because it is the largest cloud provider in the market that obviously means that there are more jobs and because there are more jobs there are more people who are trying to apply for the job and hence more competition when you talk about microsoft azure it's the second largest cloud provider now let's first talk from the market perspective now because it's a second large a second largest cloud provider companies which are using aws right now they're also taking into account a secondary cloud provider for their infrastructure needs. Why? Because let's say tomorrow, uh, you know, the whole of AWS servers go down. Now they do not want it to impact their own application. So what they do is they create a redundancy in place. And what they do is they manage their servers on Azure as well. Right. And now they're using two cloud providers instead of one. This is from the market perspective. And that's why you can see the growth of azure has been dramatic in the past two three years right the kind of growth that aws has seen is less than the kind of growth that azure is seeing from uh, you know if you if you take into into account the last three four years at the same time azure is a lot cheaper when you compare it with other cloud providers and the sole reason for that is the microsoft products so if you are using any microsoft product on let's say aws on Google Cloud Platform, it is obviously going to charge you more than Microsoft product that you get on Azure. Why? Because Azure is basically owned by Microsoft. So because of that, even the pricing is in control and hence it becomes more cheap for people who want to use Microsoft uh, software. Third thing is now because uh, the AWS is the largest cloud provider, there is more competition over there. Azure does not have much of competition but at the same time since companies have started considering azure and because of the growth rate of azure that we have seen in the past three four years there's an acute shortage of people who are who uh, basically are certified in azure and at the same time know azure that well as well nowadays what is happening is people who know aws they are the only ones who are also trying to uh, you know control the infrastructure which is there on Azure in the same company, right? But that is not helping out because a lot of features are different between Microsoft Azure and AWS. And now companies basically want to have a separate guy who can manage their separate cloud platform that they have. Now, obviously, if you talk about senior cloud profiles, such as senior cloud engineers or senior cloud architects, now these guys they are not just limited to learn only aws or only microsoft azure in the long run when you see yourself you can actually you will actually have to learn more than one cloud provider that is some companies expect you to know both aws and microsoft azure some companies expect you to know all the three microsoft azure google cloud platform and aws as well but when you're starting out in the cloud domain it is recommended that you start with microsoft azure because it will be a lot easier for you to switch to the cloud domain because of the less competition right and while you are also growing for the next level the next level of profile that you want to go for then you should also learn aws you should also learn google cloud platform okay when you talk about it from the uh, features perspective so what are the features that aws is providing which azure is not all the features are same but the way you implement them using the services is different right the steps that you have to do to do a particular task in azure 
is obviously going to be different from what you have to do in IWS because they are two different companies. They have built their own product uh, separately, and obviously because of that, the way of implementation is also very different, right? So that is the only difference. But when you talk it from features perspective, both the cloud providers are neck to neck. They are giving each other competition in terms of the feature that they offer, and because of that. All the features or most of the features are same. Okay, so let's talk about the most common service which every one of you is going to use once you start um, uh, using Microsoft Azure, and that service is nothing but the virtual machine service. So, guys, the virtual machine is basically uh, it's an uh, infrastructure as a service, or in other words, it's basically a server. So, all that we have been discussing till now, even in the example that I told you earlier was about using a server, right? So whenever you deploy a server in Microsoft Azure, that is nothing but a virtual machine, right? So a virtual machine is just like your own laptop or personal computer or PC, right? It's just that a virtual machine can have whatever kind of resources you want, right? So when you deploy a virtual machine, you choose the amount of RAM that you need, you choose the amount of CPU that you need, and then you deploy it. Right, so that is exactly what a virtual machine is, right? For example, in your PC, if you have a 32 GB RAM right now, you cannot just change it right now. You will have to buy some parts, include it in your uh, PC setup, and only then that configuration will increase. But with virtual machines, the scene is you can do that in a matter of seconds, right? And how can you do that? Because uh, you know the infrastructure or the hardware that is basically made available to you by Microsoft Azure. Is virtualized, which basically means if your virtual machine is being launched on, let's say, a certain hardware, it might be the case that the same hardware might be accommodating 100 or 200 of virtual machines as well. So that is the kind of uh, resources which are available on the hardware, but the hardware can virtualize some of the resources and can make those resources available to you as a separate machine. That is exactly what virtualization is, right? So a virtual machine in Azure, like I again said, it's basically a server that you deploy, right? And these servers are basically uh, going to have the required RAM, the required CPU that you specify. So that's what a virtual machine is, right? Then the second kind of service is called app service. So what is an app service? So an app service is basically a platform as a service, right? And in that, what you get is, so let's say you deploy a virtual machine. Right, so when you deploy a virtual machine, what happens is you get a screen to a, a, a computer which probably has the Linux operating system or the Windows operating system installed on it, and then you can use it as you want. Right, but in app service, this thing is not there. In app service, what happens is you are given a platform, so you're not given the whole machine to work on, you basically uh, uh, are given a platform which basically gives you a dashboard kind of a view. And in that dashboard, you can only do the actions which are specified by the service that you're deploying. For example, in app service, you can deploy your own website. But if you have to deploy your own website, uh, let's say you want to do that on Azure Virtual Machine. So first, what you'll have to do is, let's say your website is based on .NET. So you will have to install .NET on the server, or let's say your website is uh, you know, based on Apache software. So you will have to install the Apache software if it's a PHP website, you will install the PHP software. And once all the softwares are installed, only then you can deploy your website on it. Or you can copy the files of your website on it, and then your website will become available. But the scene with app services is that everything is deployed automatically. So you just tell Azure what is the kind of website that you are going to deal with. So let's say if you have a PHP website, what you do is you click on app services, you tell Microsoft, okay, so I'm going to use a PHP uh, website on the service that I'm deploying and Microsoft themselves they basically set up the environment for you they install the softwares and everything and all they do is they give you a button which is uh, on the dashboard that you will see right and on that button you can see uh, uh, I mean through that button if you click on it you will be able to upload your website and once your website is uploaded it will automatically be deployed on the server which is basically deployed in the background right so the purpose of having an app service versus a virtual machine is to make your life easy so you do not have to deal with the operating system directly 
Azure manages the operating system on your behalf. It manages all the software based on your behalf. And all you do is you just deploy your application. So that is what an app service is. Right. Similarly, the third kind of very common service which will be used in Microsoft Azure is the blob storage. So a blob storage is just like Google Drive. So I'm pretty sure everyone of you might have used Google Drive uh, in any of your careers, right? A Google Drive is just like you know uploading your file on the cloud, and that's about it. And that is exactly what a blob storage also is. So on blob storage, you can also upload your files. But what you can do with those files is a lot different than what you can do with uh, files on Google Cloud. Google Cloud, for example, in Blob you also have the option of uh, you know keeping those files in a very uh, uh, very primitive kind of storage, which is going to reduce your costs drastically. And at the same time, you will see that when you're using Google Drive, you have a limit to the kind of files that you can upload. Uh, when you sign up on Google Cloud, the the storage I think that you get is around 30 GB. So 30 GB data is free for you that you can upload. And after 30 GB, you will have to buy some storage where you can upload that data, uh, upload more data. But when you're using blob storage, you do not have any restriction of how much of data can you upload. It's unlimited uh, data that you can upload. And at the same time, you are only charged for the data that you are upload per month. Let's say you uploaded one terabytes of data, so you will only be charged for the amount of one terabytes of data and nothing less, nothing more. Now, those pricings are also very different. So if you want very high speed uh, download and upload uh, to, your, to, to your file that you have uploaded on uh, blog storage, the pricing will be different. Let's say you say that uh, this is a backup file that you're putting on blog storage and probably you you will never use it again. You just want it to be saved in a very uh, safe place. So in that case, what you can do is you can change the storage class of your blob storage, and that will almost take make the cost of uploading and keeping the file one tenth, right? And similarly, there are a lot more features as well, and that is exactly what blob storage is. So again, if you want to understand it, it's just like Google Drive but with a lot more features. So that's about what blob storage is right then you have something called as file storage so file storage is just like having a network drive right which you can map to your computer so i just talked about google drive google drive you cannot map it as a c drive or a d drive on your system but with file storage if you deploy it on microsoft azure it is again uh, you know a very uh, unlimited kind of a service where you can decide how many gbs or terabytes you need and once you've de defined that application in Microsoft Azure, you can basically connect it to your computer and mount it as a local disk drive. And then you can basically copy files to it or retrieve files from it as you want. So this is what a file storage is. Now the cool thing about file storage is that multiple people can be can basically mount this drive on their computer at the same time, and they can use it for uh, as a shared drive between them while they're working on it. Right, so that is what a file storage is. So each of these services basically plays a, a different role when you are deploying an application on production cloud. Right. Then the next kind of service that you have is called virtual networks. So virtual networks is just like uh, you know in your office you have networks, right? So if you want to deploy a network for a set of machines that you have deployed in Microsoft Azure, the way you can do that is by making use of virtual networks. Now. Again, you can create n number of virtual networks in your Azure account where you can have n number of servers. And these virtual networks, again, can have n number of features that you can explore and implement, which I think you will learn more as you start using the virtual network service. Right? And the final kind of service that we're going to understand is load balancers. Right? So what is a load balancer? A load balancer is basically, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's more of used in production and uh, probably for a guy who does not know about load balancers even if they're using it they will never get to know about it right and this is all actually a service that we are actually going to make use of in today's session as well where i'll show you the 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 reason people use load balancers so i give you the example of uh, a story in the beginning right where you can add more servers for your application and then as you add more servers 
more number of users can basically be dealt with right so how does that happen how does how do you, how can you add hundreds of servers and then decide where a user exactly is going to land on or which server he is going to land on for basically his needs for example if you go to flipkart.com or you go to amazon.com so when you go there you automatically are given uh, if your internet connection is good if your application loads just fine right so where is the data on that application coming from that data is basically coming from cloud is basically coming from a fleet of servers which have been deployed on cloud and to one of those servers you connect and that is where your data is basically coming from so you never decide which server you have to connect to that is automatically chosen for you right and that is exactly what a load balancer does it distributes the load equally among multiple servers which are deployed in your infrastructure okay more about this we will understand as you move along so guys this is a brief about the azure services in microsoft azure now let's go ahead and talk about the pricing so the moment you sign up on azure what you get is one month free usage of microsoft azure with a free credit of around 13300 rupees or 200 dollars right so you can use this amount to learn and understand microsoft azure right so you can deploy as many servers as you want and you can use them until and unless you exhaust the 200 dollar or the 13300 rupees credit that you have in your microsoft account the moment you sign up right so this is something which is very developer friendly which azure has done that the moment you sign up it makes the services available for you free so that you can practice them and learn more about it okay and other than that there are some set of free services as well which are valid for uh, you know a lifetime so whenever you're using azure this is uh, some of these services are valid for one year for example uh, when you're using linux virtual machines or windows virtual machines or microsoft azure 750 hours every month will be given free of cost to you of the server type b1s vm right so if you are using the servers the first 750 hours of those servers will be free of cost that is will not be charged to you while you're using those servers right so now guys let's move on and start off with the hands-on and what i'm first going to do is i'm going to explain you what we are basically going to make and then we are going to go ahead and start it okay so guys let's first understand the uh, website architecture that we are going to deploy on azure today all right so what we are basically going to do is uh, we will have two sets of servers right so, so the first set of servers would be in the uh, us region and the other set of servers would be in the indian region all right now since these these will be multiple servers what we are also going to do is we will, we are basically going to have a load balancer on top of them and through this load balancer uh, if you are in the us region if you go to a particular domain basically it should be pointed to the us server automatically and once you are pointed to the us servers your load balancer should basically uh, you know divide the load between the people uh, or between the servers that you have in your fleet right similarly if let's say you are from india so you will also be accessing the same domain which is uh, this right and once you access it you will be basically pointed to the indian servers and in indian servers we are going to have a load balancer which is basically going to route your request to a specific indian server let me repeat it again so first thing what we'll do is we'll basically uh, deploy some servers in us and deploy some servers in india right and these servers will have a load balancer on top of them so now what is going to happen is if five servers are hosting the same application your user does not have to be concerned about which of these five servers uh, he has to reach he will basically reach to a common point and that common point will be the load balancer which is basically going to route the request based on which server is going to be more free okay and that is exactly what we are going to do with the us servers as well okay so guys so let's say if you are in india and you are trying to access azure project.tk right so obviously if your request is being served from the us servers the uh, ping will be more or the time it will take to 
uh, you know uh, to to respond to your query would be more than the servers which are de which are basically deployed in the indian region so indian region if you are from india the servers can reply to you more faster similarly if a guy is from us right if he is trying to uh, you know ping a particular website and that website has servers in us obviously they can serve him faster than servers which are going to be there in the indian region right so this is the architecture that we are going to deploy today and this is basically how even a modern e-commerce application basically works so if you have a look at flipkart or amazon these are the things that they implement in the background which normal customers usually don't know about but they basically use every day okay and that is exactly what we are going to do today in this session if we uh, go to uh, let's say a browser so let's say i type in google.com so you will automatically see the moment i type google.com i'm uh, automatically uh, routed to the indian server so as you can see it's written india over here right if i type in google.co.uk you can again see i'm still on the indian server why because every time i'm trying to go to a different google website I'm always logged to the server which is more nearer to me, and that is the Indian Google. Right? So no matter which URL you are entering over here, you're always being redirected to the Indian Google, right? But if you want to bypass this, so let's say you connect to a VPN, right? Let's say you connect to a VPN and you connect to a particular country. So whichever country you will be connecting to, let's say you connect it to uh, uh, you connect to France. So now when you will be going to your browser typing in google.com now you will be redirected to google.fr right so that is exactly how it works what we are going to implement in today's hands on as well let's go ahead and the first thing that we would do is go to the azure dashboard so the url is portal.azure.com so once you guys log in or sign up on microsoft azure this is how your dashboard is going to look like now I, now I already have some resources uh that i have deployed over here so you don't have to worry about them right so what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna create a resource and once i've created a resource now i will choose what kind of resource that i want to deploy so when i'm creating a new now it's asking me what kind of resource that i want to deploy let's say i want to launch a linux server so a linux server is basically uh, either an ubuntu server or it could be a centos server or if i want to launch a win windows server i can choose this windows or i can choose some other uh, operating system as well so this gives me limited option over here these are the popular options that people basically deploy so what we can do is we can just search for virtual machines i can click on that service and as you can see, I have some uh, machines which are already running over here. So we are going to ignore them. So first, let's deploy our first virtual machine. So we'll click on add. And now I can fill in all these things that I want. Okay. So first things first, it will ask you uh, a resource group to basically deploy it in. So a resource group is nothing but it's basically a logical grouping of all the uh resources that you're going to deploy on the azure cloud okay so what we can do is we can just click on create new and let's say this is demo hyphen webinar this is the resource group that i'm basically going to create right now okay so the resource group has been created and now we have to enter the virtual machine name so let's say it's uh indian server so this is the server that we are going to deploy right uh, next thing that i'm going to see is the region that i want to deploy it in so it's in central india which works out for me which is great uh, what is the operating system that i want to launch so these are the different kind of operating system that i can choose between so i have the microsoft options then i have oracle option i have the linux options so whichever i want i can choose so for this demo i'm choosing the ubuntu server then here i can choose the size of the virtual machine that i want to deploy 
so let's say i want to deploy uh, the lowest on this list which is one vcpu and one gb of memory so let's choose this then it is asking me what is the authentication type that i want to choose do i want to log in using a public key or do i want to log in using a password so let's choose password let's give some username over here let's give the username let's say as uh in telepart and now let's give some password as well okay it says the value must be between 12 and 72 characters okay let's give that value okay now which ports do i want to be opened on the firewall so whenever you want to connect to a linux machine you basically connect using the ssh protocol okay and the ssh protocol basically always works on port 22 so port 22 is going to be allowed in the firewall for us let's click on next so now in disks we are being asked which kind of disk do you want do you want premium ssd do you want standard hdd do you want standard ssd so basically this is going to affect your performance so hdd is basically a disk based hard drive then you have solid state hard drive and then you have premium solid state hard drives as well so all these three will have different io values for this demo let's choose standard ssd right and then let's click on next now it's going to ask me uh, where do i want this server to be deployed so it's automatically creating uh, you know a virtual network for me which is called De demo webinar bnet right and it is all automatically creating a subnet as well it is assigning a public ip also to my server etc so let me we'll keep everything at default we'll click on next uh, now it is asking me what kind of monitoring do i want on my server right so i don't want any more monitoring so i just switch it off and click on next again uh, this can also be left so you can just click on next next again and finally now you can re re basically just review all your settings right so it says verification failed so probably we did not fill out some information let's verify that so we'll just click here okay it says the requested size for resource is currently not available in central india so it's saying the uh, size that i selected which is uh, basically this is not available so let's choose some other size uh let's choose let's say an 8 gb machine or a 2 gb machine let's say let's click on review plus create okay even this is not available all right so sometimes the region that you choose they might not have the required size that you want to launch and in that case you just have to go ahead and choose for a size that might be available i think if i go for a premium size it should be available give me a second okay so you can see there's a high demand for all these servers and that's why they're all used right so what we can do is we can just go back and none of the servers are available in this region so let's go to some other region uh, let's select uh, south india i think that should have some servers available for us okay so here some servers are available great so what we can choose let's choose the same size that we selected earlier click on review plus create and as you can see the validation has now passed so let's click on create now and with this now my server is getting launched okay now it will take some time for this server to get deployed but basically what we have done is uh, we have deployed one server in the south india region which basically is going to make use of an ubuntu server okay so let's go back to the dashboard and let me show you the uh, resource group which is basically getting created okay there are a lot of resource groups over here but what you can basically refer to 
is this so demo webinar is the resource group that i created right so now let's go ahead inside the demo webinar and here you can see the resource that you've just deployed the indian server it is getting deployed in there so as you can see the deployment has got succeeded great so let's deploy a us server as well so again let's click on add on the resource group let's create a second resource group for our us servers so that we can differentiate between uh, the resources that we are going to deploy and let's deploy it in the west us region okay click on review plus create and finally create this resource group okay so the resource group has got created and now i can just go to that resource group and we can deploy some resources over here so let's do the same thing let's deploy a virtual machine again in the us resource group so i'll just click on create a virtual machine us server one let's give this name let's deploy it in best us okay this is the image that i want to launch uh this is the size that is automatically selected let's hope it is available let's give the username as interpart and the password as this i think i will keep the same password which i used for my previous server okay click on disks i think rest everything we can leave at default only in management we will turn the monitoring off and click on review plus create so as you can see the price is just 80 pesa per hour which is great so we'll just create it now and now a server is being launched in the us region okay now to make it more authentic let's deploy one one uh, virtual machine mod so so that we have two and on top of these two virtual machines then we will deploy uh, you know a load balancer as well and we'll also figure out a way so that when we basically hit the load balancer we automatically get to know which server basically we are trying to connect to okay so while this is being deployed let's deploy uh, one more virtual machine in india so let's add one more it will be in the resource group called demo webinar virtual machine now name it will be indian 2 it will be in south india region uh, same image same uh, server configuration username would be entire part and let's give the password same okay let's go to management uh, turn off boot diagnostics and now let's create it so in networking let me see yes so we are under the same uh, network that we created earlier and now let's just go ahead and create this all right so with this guys we have now deployed uh, two servers in the india region and let's do the same for us as well let's deploy one more last uh pm for our us region as well so this will be in the uh us resource group right and the virtual machine is going to be named as uh us server 2 it's going to be in the west us same machine config username would be telepart and password would be the same what i entered for others again finally we'll go to management turn out diagnostics click on review plus create 
and create the VM now. Okay, so now this will be deployed in the background and what we can do is we can start configuring our server now. Okay, so let's head over to the US server, sorry, the Indian servers first and let's try to configure the first server that we deployed. So this is the IP address of the server. Let's connect to it. So for connecting, you will first need a terminal. So people who are using Windows, what you can do is you can download a software called Putty, right? So you just have to go to putty.org, go to download Putty, just click over here. And then what you have to do is you have to download the Putty 64-bit which is this right and once you download this uh, you know you will see a window like this right so in this window all you have to do is uh, okay one second yes this is the window that you will see so just enter the IP address over here of the server so in this case the server's ip address is this just enter that over here and click on open right and that is about it same screen then you will see as i'm seeing right now okay so i'll just enter ssh so people who are there on linux or mac you just have to enter this command so ssh enter the part at the rate the ip address hit enter Type in yes, it will ask the password. So just enter the password of the server. Even the putty guys will see the screen. And then you are now logged into your Intel uh, sorry, your Indian server in the Azure region. So this is your first server. Let's connect to a second server as well. So SSH Intel part at the rate. And then the second server is this. Uh, let's copy the IP for this server as well. Put in here. And now it's asking the password. And yes, you are now connected to your second server as well. Okay. So what I've done is I have deployed four servers, two in the US region two in the India region and now I've connected to the servers in the India region. All right guys, so let's go ahead and configure these servers now. So what I'm going to do is first I'm going to basically install a web server software which is called Apache 2. So in order to install that, first we'll have to update the machine. So let's update it by typing in the command so you get update. And once the servers are updated, now let's install the software by using this command, which is sudo apt get install apache2. Okay, so the software is being installed over here. We can do the same on the other server as well. First update it. And once it's updated, we will install the apache2 software. So both the machines now have the apache2 software installed and now let's try to see if that software is working or not. So ideally what should happen is if you install the software and if you copy the IP address of your server and try to paste it in the browser, you should be able to see the website that you have just deployed. But what happens is because you know we have not opened the firewall for uh, the HTTP protocol, that's why we are not able to see this web page right now. You remember we only opened uh, the port 22. So whenever your browser is trying to interact with your server, it always tries to interact on port 80. And that is exactly why you're not uh, seeing the web page right now. So what we can do is, let's say this is my Indian server 2. So all I have to go to is networking. And in networking, I have to add an inbound uh, rule. So in the rule, uh, I have to specify the destination port, which is port 80, and it is going to be allowed. And I just click on add. 
So with this rule in place, uh, what is going to happen is the port 80 is going to be opened in the firewall. And then once the rule has been created now, right? So this will take around, uh, you know, 30 to 40 seconds to basically get uh, updated in the main firewall of Azure. And then we should be able to see this website. So let's wait for some 30 to 35 seconds. And while this is happening, Let's also open the port 80 on the first Indian server. So we'll just go to the first Indian server, go to networking, and add uh, port 80 over here. Okay. So this rule is now getting created. And if I go back, you can see on this IP address, I am able to see the Apache 2 page. So this is the Indian 2's IP address and we're going to change this web page in a little while and I'll show you how you can do that. So to replace this file, what you have to do is you have to go to slash var slash www slash html and then replace index.html. So that is exactly what we're going to do now. So let's go to Indian 2 server. Let's go to the file location which was mentioned. And in this file location, now let's delete the index.html which is present. And let's add one more index.html. So to create or edit any file, you have to make use of the command sudo nano. So nano is basically just like notepad that you have in Windows, right? So notepad opens a notepad uh, for you to write in or edit documents. Similarly, in Ubuntu, there is a text editor called nano. So we're going to open that and as you can see it is now creating a file called index.html So let's write a very simple HTML code over here uh, which, which is basically we're just going to have One line which is saying welcome to the Indian server 2 Right Let's Write this HTML done, and now if I refresh this, you can see it says Welcome to Indian Server 2, which is great. So now let's do the same thing for our first Indian server as well. So, right now, if I go to this IP address in a new tab, I'll be seeing the default Apache 2 page. Uh, Let's replace that with this code. So what I'm doing is I'll first. So what is Microsoft Azure? Microsoft Azure is a cloud provider that provides various platform as a service and infrastructure as a service products. Azure has cloud solutions to all the infrastructural problems by providing services in various domains. Did you know that almost 95% of Fortune 500 companies are using Azure? Also, it is 5 times cheaper than AWS in terms of Windows and SQL Server because there are also Microsoft products. Forbes say that Microsoft Azure is set to boost the size of the IT market by $10 trillion in the next 10 years. As per predictions, 80% of the businesses will move their workload to cloud by 2025, thus making it a major career to consider transitioning to. For a better understanding of Azure, let us start at the very beginning. Microsoft Azure was announced in October 2008 and released on February 1, 2010 as Windows Azure first and later named as Microsoft Azure on 25th March 2015. In today's scenario, its reach is in 140 countries and is still expanding which is pretty impeccable. In simpler terms, Microsoft Azure is a platform that enables users to engage in agile cloud computing and is designed for creating and managing apps through Microsoft's data center. Now there are four integral Microsoft Azure service domains. The first one is Azure Compute. Compute is the most integral domain in Azure 
as it brings everything together with Azure Virtual Machines. You can get on-demand scalable compute resources. Azure Virtual Machines, App Services and Container Instances are some popular compute services. Second, we have Azure Networking, Networks from the Cloud Networks. In Azure, VNet is the networking tool that connects all Azure resources together. These networking services allow enterprises to safely connect their on-premises services to the Azure Cloud. It is also used to manage virtual private networks and further create multiple virtual networks on the cloud. The third one is Azure Storage. Azure Storage provides storage solutions that are more durable and large-scale applications, data-driven applications can be built without any hassle. Azure automatically scales the storage requirements according to the usage and it automatically balances throughput according to the connections made. And the last one is Azure Database. Azure provides relational databases, NoSQL databases, data lakes and data warehouses. It provides a scalable, high available and fault tolerant database server and lets you scale according to the incoming data. There are various job roles in Azure. Let's take a look at one of the most popular job roles, Azure Developer. An Azure Developer is a cloud professional who creates cloud-based applications, making use of the benefits of the cloud architecture. If you are proficient in testing, security, development and deployment, then a career in Azure Development is somewhere you will fit in well. The job includes responsibilities like testing of applications, maintaining, developing and deploy them on Azure. It also includes participating in all phases of development and having the ability to work side by side with cloud administrators, clients and cloud architects. In United States, on average basis, an Azure developer gets paid $132,148 per annum. However, for an entry-level developer, it's $97,000. Whereas in India, the salary offered ranges from 7 lakhs to 25 lakhs per annum. That's all about Azure. Just a quick info guys. IntelliPad provides Microsoft Azure certification training in partnership with Microsoft, mentored by industry experts. The course link of which is given in the description below. Now, let's continue with the session. Go to the file path. And now, I'm going to paste the code that we wrote over here into this file and change this to welcome to Indian server one. Okay, done. And now if I refresh it, great. So now I have two IP addresses where if I go from the browser to these IP addresses, I can going to see Indian server one and Indian server two. So let me give these IP addresses to you guys as well. So just open your chat section and you should get these IP addresses. Just try it in your browser. I'm going to put a load balancer on top of them. Okay. So let's see how we can do that. So there are a lot of type of load balancers that basically you can deploy. Uh, the load balancer that we are going to deploy today is basically an application gateway. Okay. So let's go to application gateway. And in application gateway, all we have to do is, uh, so there are, yeah, so we'll just click on add. And now it's going to ask us which resource group we want to deploy it in. So we will, let's first apply, deploy it for the US region. So we are going to say US servers, application gateway, let's say US server one. Uh, the region is West US and virtual network. Uh, this is the virtual network we have to deploy it in. 
Now, this is the error that you will get. It says the subnet must only have application gateway. Now, in order to have this, what you'll have to do is you will have to create a subnet which is not going to have any other resource, right? So, how we can do that is just go to your Azure portal and then go to virtual networks. Now, the network that we want to configure is the US servers, right? And in this, if you go to subnets, you can see there's only one subnet right now, which is the default subnet. So let's add one more subnet. And let's the address range for this. Now the address range can be a little confusing to you. So let me make it as simple as possible for you guys. So right now you can see that address range over here is 10.3.2.0 slash 24. So slash 24 basically says how many IP addresses can be included. So if you type in slash 24, it gives you 250 uh, IP addresses in the range of 10.3.2. It could be dot one, dot two, dot three, dot 19, dot 99 right etc so there was that could be the range so similarly we just replicate this and we'll specify 10.3 dot uh, instead of 2 we can specify let's say 5.0 slash 24 right and let's say this is for our ag uh, subnet okay so it says the subnet is not contained within these address space of the virtual network okay let's solve that as well so we will first have to go to address space so we can in so here the address space is this so instead of this range i can give a better range which can be slash 16 so the lower the number the higher number of uh, ranges you get so i have specified it slash 16 over here so what this basically tells is that the whole uh, the whole virtual network can have ip address in these ranges and obviously the subnets have to lie between these ranges right so my uh, default subnet is ob obviously within the range of 10.3 now i'm going to specify a subnet range for my application gateway which is going to be this okay and let's call it ag hyphen summit all right let's click on ok so this subnet is now being added okay it's been added and now if you go back to us service vnet you can see that ag subnet we can choose now okay and it's not giving any error now Okay, so now let's click on next. And now it is asking me what will be the front end of this load balancer. The front end is always a IP address. So there will be one IP address of the load balancer that we will be hitting. And that IP address is basically going to route to the uh, backend servers that we have. So let's add, uh, let's call this as ag hyphen IP in us okay next uh now it's asking me to add backends uh so backends uh we can add uh we can click on add a backend pool let's name this backend pool as uh us hyphen pool and let's add the uh, virtual machines in this so the target type would be a virtual machine and it could be us server 2 let's add this first and again a virtual machine and let's choose us server 1 is not being listed over here so only the servers which are in the virtual network of uh, this application gateway can be added so i think uh, the server one that we deployed 
is not in the same uh, virtual network. Let's verify that. So let's go to virtual machines. And let's go to, OK. So I think this is a problem. So our US server 1 is in a different network. Hmm. OK, let's try to fix that. So it's a good thing we did not configure US servers yet. So what we'll do is we'll just delete this server. That is US server 1. And while it is being deleted, uh, let's quickly add a, a new virtual machine. In the resource group of US servers. Uh, let's name this virtual, uh, virtual machine as server 1 US or US server 1. Uh, it will be in the West US. The operating system will be Ubuntu server. This is the size of the virtual machine. Username would be in Telepart. The authentication type would be password. And as you can see, the deletion happened automatically in the background. And now let's specify the password. Right. Let's go to management, turn off the boot diagnostics, and click on review plus create. OK, so now my virtual machine is getting created. Now, it'll take a minute or so to get, get this ready, guys. So, so we have now deployed the uh, US servers uh, correctly. And what we can do now is let's connect to them and let's try to configure them right before we can actually go ahead and connect to the application gateway okay so let's go to us server one okay it's taking some time to load one second, guys. Okay, so this is a US server one. This is the IP address. Let's try to connect to it. All right, so we are connected. To US server one, let's try to connect to US server two as well. Okay, this is the IP address. Great, so we're connected to both the servers. On the first server, let's update the machine. On the second server as well, let's update the machine. So same steps as we did earlier. And once they're updated, let's install the Apache 2 software on this. Okay, so it is being installed. Similarly, over here as well, let's install the software. Okay, so while this is being installed, let's copy the code that we have to put on this server as well. Now it's taking some time to load. Let's give it that time. If you don't want to use Apache server, you can also make use of, uh, you can make use of Nginx. So Nginx is basically, again, a web server, which is doing exactly what Apache 2 does, and but at, at the same time, it's a different company. Right, so it also hosts uh, HTTP uh, websites for you. So if you don't want to use this software, you can use that. So let's put 
the website for the US server now. So this is US server one. So let's put that in for there. Similarly, let's edit this as US server two. Great. Uh, now let's open these ports in the servers. So this is server two. Let's go to networking. Uh, let's add the port 80 rule. And while this rule is being created, let's do the same for US server one as well. And now what we can do is we can just put in these IP addresses in our browser to verify whether these are working or not. So US server one is working. Similarly, let's check US server two as well. And that is working as well. I think uh, we are good to go with at least the VM architecture and we can now de start deploying the load balancers. For example, in this case, I chose Ubuntu. So you can choose a Microsoft uh, Windows uh, operating system or a Windows Server operating system. That's your choice. Now, based on the operating system that you choose, automatically the price of that server is adjusted. So let's say you're choosing a licensed product. That license cost is included in the rent of the server that you're going to pay. Right, so that's how it's managed. So in networking, you will see that there are some priority numbers over here. Right. So let's say uh, 310 pri rule, 310 priority number rule tells me that port 80 is allowed. Right. So let's say I put in a rule which is at 309, which says port 80 is not allowed. So in that case, the lower the priority rule, the uh, it takes precedence in the sense that if there are two rules which are conflicting in nature, one is allowing it, one is not allowing it. The rule which has a lesser number of the priority number will get precedence over the other. So that is what the priority rules are for. If the IP addresses are now working, let's now start configuring the application gateway. So we are in the US server application gateway. Uh, so we left off over here. So we have chose chosen US server two. Let's choose again virtual machine. And I think we will have to refresh this. So let's reload. Okay, so resource group was US servers. Application gateway name is AG hyphen US servers. Region is West US. Uh, tier is okay. Uh, virtual network is your servers vnet and okay so okay so in the previous one i think it was creating an application gateway but it got left off the green so i think let's start to configure that application gateway itself Okay, so I think uh, because we left off the previous application gateway, it has hindered, uh, you know, a problem in AG subnet. Or what I think is the US server one that we deployed, I think we have deployed it in AG subnet. Let me just double check that. Uh, okay, so this is server one. And if you go to the overview, yes, so this is the problem. Okay, so let's see if we can change that. Um, so we can go to networking. Uh, okay, so let's do this guys. Let's delete this again. Because if we edit it, I think there will be a lot of steps that I have to do. It won't take much time. And in the meanwhile, let's create one again.
Okay, so the size is a loading, so we'll have to wait. Let's quickly enter the same info. I think let's be double sure that we're deploying it in the default subnet now. And management, let's turn off the diagnostics. View plus create. I think every good thing looks good now. Let's create it. Great, so it's now getting created. It'll take some 30, 40 seconds. Uh, let's try to copy this IP. Come back to terminal. I think server one, we will have to reconnect. Okay, let's quickly update it. And now install the software. Okay, so the software is being installed. And now what you can do is uh, go back to server one, go to networking, add an inbound port rule. Port range would be 80, add it, great. That rule is now being added, and at the same time, the software are also getting installed. Network load balancer can redirect based on networks. Application load balancer can redirect based on uh, the user parts. Okay, so that would be the difference. But I think if you don't know about Azure, uh, it is okay if you do not understand it right now because there are a lot of things to learn in Azure. Right? It's okay if we miss out on some today because the main idea of today's session is to understand how uh, you know companies like google or uh, other big companies they're making use of cloud for basic things that you do not notice every day but today you are noticing okay so let's copy the code Paste it here. I think that is about it. So now we can just verify if we can see this IP on the browser. So yes, we can. Great. So now that we have the servers configured, uh, let's go to application gateway. Uh, add one. Uh, we're going to add it to the uh, US server first. US server resource group. Let's call it at ag US. It's going to be a part of West US. Auto scaling, we don't want it. Virtual network would be US servers BNET. Okay, what is the problem now? Well, this is part of. Okay, let's do this. Uh, let's just delete the ag net subnet and let's Try to connect to it again. So US servers vnet, uh, we go subnets over the AG subnet. Let's delete it. Okay, so there seems to be some network interface which I was making use of it. Uh, what we can do is let's leave this. Uh, let's create one more subnet where we can have our application gateway. So let's call it as eg1 hyphen subnet and this could be the range let's create it and now okay this is a subnet that we want to configure let's choose an ip address let's add one new hyphen ag us okay Let's add a backend pool. So backend pool is nothing but your servers, right? So let's add them. So let's choose a virtual machine. Let's choose the first virtual machine. And now let's choose the second virtual machine as well. Okay, so we have added the backend pool. Let's call it as uh, US backend. Let's add it. Done. Uh, configuration. So is there a routing rule that you want to specify? Uh, let's not specify anything. So in that case will be a uh, Okay, I think we have to specify so let's 
specify a backend rule. Let's call it as uh, first rule, right? Listener name would be, let's say it's listener hyphen us. Front end IP would be public. Listener type is basic, error page is URL, backend targets. So it will be US backend, HTTP setting. Let's add new HTTP setting. Let's call it as HTTP US, add it. We're not adding any path-based rules in this load balancer, okay? Let's click on add. And finally, let's just click on review plus create and create it. So with this, now we have created the load balancer uh, that is required for these US servers. Now, I think it will take a minute or two to deploy. So let's give it that time. Meanwhile, uh, we can deploy the same for our Indian servers as well. So for our Indian servers, I think uh, the first thing that we would need is uh, the virtual network to be configured. Right. So let's go to our demo webinar resource group. Now in this, the virtual network, the subnets, in this we just have the default one. So uh, first we'll change the address space, saved. Now we'll go to subnets, okay. Let's add a subnet and let's call it the AG subnet. So now we have a subnet for the application gateway, right? And now let's go to application gateways. And this is the US one, which is getting created, right? Let's add one more. And it will be in the demo webinar resource group. We'll call it as eg-india. It'll be part of the South India region, not scaling. Virtual network would be demo webinar vnet and yes, the subnet would be ag subnet, which is great uh, Now let's add a Public IP address to it and let's call it ag India. again the backend. So let's add a backend pool. It will be of type virtual machine. So let's first add uh, the first Indian server and then the Second Indian server. Okay, and let's call this as the India backend. So backend pool has been added. Now let's add a routing rule. So again, the same configuration, guys. Uh, the rule name, let's call it as India rule. Listener name, you can give it anything. Let's call it my listener. Front end IP, it would be public, obviously. Uh, then let's specify the backend targets. So backend pool would be India backend. HTTP seconds, you will have to add a new setting. Uh, let's call it as HTTP India. Here, nothing to be specified, just create the rule, uh, the HTTP setting. And I think that should be about it. We're not adding any parts. And Let's just click on create now. So with this, uh, my application gateway has been created. And this application gateway is now being deployed for India. I think my US one should already be deployed. So let's check that out. So if I go to ag US, uh, this is the IP address. Let's copy it, paste it on my browser. And as of now, I'm not able to connect uh, do anything right now right so what i'll do is uh, i'll just go back to my us application gateway uh, let me check so there are a couple of things which can go wrong because of which it is not connecting so let's first check the firewall so here everything seems okay let's go to configuration here everything seems to be okay we'll go to back in pools okay so there are no Targets according to the rules associated. Uh, let's check that. Okay, so there are no targets in the backend pool for US. Let's add it. Although I think we did add it, but it's not there, so let's not waste any time and save this. Okay, 
while this is happening, we can also check out the other settings. So HTTP settings look good. Front end IP configuration, public we have configured it looks good. Uh, we have added a listener, which is okay. Uh, rules look good for sure. Health probes, okay, nothing here. Then I think you also something have something called as backend health. Okay, so application gateway right now is in the uh, deployment phase, right? So that's why you cannot uh, see it right now. So let's wait for it to get completed. I think uh, our application gateway is still in the deployment phase. So as you can see that deployment to group US servers is still in progress. So I guess the application gateway has not deployed uh, fully and that's why you know it's taking some more time. So load balances are, very, are a very heavy resource guys. So it usually takes around some five to six minutes to deploy. So let's wait for that, that, that time. Okay, so US servers, one is failed, one is succeeded. Let's see if we have everything in my application gateway. Okay, this is my US application gateway, guys, as you can see from the name. Let's check the backend health. So now you should have two servers listed over here, which are not listed. Okay, let's go to backend pools. So there are two targets, which is good. Uh, let's go to HTTP settings. This looks okay. Rules looks okay. Okay, let's try to go here. Okay, and try to refresh this. Okay, so at least our application gateway has been deployed. It just says that there's a bad gateway. So we will see how we can fix this. Meanwhile, even our Indian server has been deployed. Oh, sorry, Indian application gateway. Let's see how that is working out for us. So we'll go to the application gateway India. Uh, let's copy the IP address, paste it in the browser. Hit enter. Okay, this seems to be working just fine. So it says, Welcome to Indian Server 1. Great. If you keep hitting refresh, it, it as you can see, it is now routing you to Indian server two as well. Right? Again, it is routing to one, again to two, again to one, again to two. So it randomly basically takes up your request and it is now routing it to you, routing to one of the servers. So this is working fine. And our uh, US application gateway is giving some issues to us. So let's see how we can figure that out. Uh, let me just go to the US application gateway. So first things first, let's see if the US servers are working fine. Yes, the first server is working fine. And the second server is also working fine. Great. Um, so I think the problem is that the backend health is still not restored over here and because of this uh, I think it's giving you as a 502 error okay so to fix this what we can do is we can go to backend pools and we can just delete these targets save it and once this deployment is successful, we can add the new two targets, uh, again the two targets, and I think that should solve the problem. Okay, so while this is happening, uh, let's go ahead and configure our traffic manager now. So we can see that the India load balancer is working perfectly fine. So now what we'll do is, let's create a traffic manager. Okay, so let's create a new traffic manager. Let's click on add. And let's call it as global traffic manager. And we can deploy it in any region. Uh, let's say we are deploying it in uh, US. 
okay resource group would be us servers and okay this is very important the routing method so we want to route it according to geography right so wherever the request is coming from that request should basically be routed to the servers which are near to it so we have chosen the routing method as geographic let's click on create and with this our traffic manager has now been uh, created okay now this will take some time so let's give that time to it and now let's click on add so in the traffic manager profile uh, okay we have already added it so it should list here let's refresh so it will take some time to uh, okay so deployment has succeeded great so the traffic manager we can see it over here now the status is enabled so we can go inside this traffic manager now and what we can do is we can uh, configure it to connect to our uh, load balancers okay so for doing that you will have to go to configuration okay everything looks good over here So now we will have to add endpoints since there are no endpoints over here. So we'll go to endpoints, add an endpoint. So let's add it for the Indian server first, right? So the so whenever you're adding the endpoints, uh, you have to make sure of one thing, which I'm going to show you in a little while. So first of all, let's select the public IP address, and the IP address would be for AG India. So as you can see, it says no DNS name is configured, right? So what you'd have to do is for the AG India IP address, AG India is with nothing but the application gateway of India. You will have to configure the DNS. Okay, so let's see how we can do that. Let's go to the uh, IP addresses page. We'll go to public IP addresses. Here we'll go to ag hyphen India, which is this. And ag hyphen India. Now what we'll do is we'll go to configuration. In configuration, we can give the DNS name, right? So all our DS, DNS names will are going to have this suffix attached with it. So let's give this as ag IP. Now it is checking whether it's available. So it's a G I P. So it's available, and now we can just click on save. With this, our public IP address <clears throat> is now going to have a DNS name. Okay, so it's done, and now over here, I will have to, I think, refresh this. So let's add an endpoint again let's call it as ag india endpoint it's going to be a public ip address and the ip address is ag india great so let's click on add and now i can just do a regional mapping over here which is going to be mapped to it so here we can choose to distribute traffic based on specific geographic locations Okay, so anybody who's pinging from Asia, in Asia, let's say uh, India, then they should basically be routed to this endpoint. Okay, so with this, your endpoint has now been configured in the traffic manager to connect to your Indian servers. So now let's verify. Uh, if my AG US yes so in application gateway the for the US servers it was successful great so now what I can do is I can again add the targets 
and that should solve our problem. Okay, so the deployment is now happening. Meanwhile, let's verify if we go to our traffic manager, which is having this DNS. Are we able to access the servers or not? So yes, we are able to access the Indian servers, right? So that means our traffic manager is working just fine. So I can give you this IP address as well. So right now, because only Indian IP addresses are there, uh, that's why our Indian uh, servers are connected to it. Our Indian endpoint has been added. That's why only uh, the Indian servers are connected. But as soon as we also add the application gateway for US, people who are from outside Asia, they will be able to uh, connect to it. We will just search for DNS. Uh, just select DNS zones. So here you can basically add a rule or you can configure a custom URL which can connect to your uh, traffic manager. And let's see how we can do that. So if you want to do that, guys, uh, the simplest thing to do over here would be to first go to uh, so there's a website called Freenom. Just go over there. So Freenom is a website which basically gives you a free domain to work with. Okay. So let's sign in. I already have signed up over here. So you guys can also sign up. And with this, what you're going to get is you're going to get a domain that you can use uh, for free. So for example, I have a azure-project.tk domain, which now I'm going to configure to connect to this traffic manager that I have specified. And then all I have to do is, the moment I go to azure-project.tk, I would be able to uh, see the website that I've deployed, okay? So in order to do that, just go to DNS. So first you will have to add a DNS zone. Let's specify it in US again. And the name that we will give them is DNS hyphen public. Okay, or basically it's expressing expecting us to get the domain name itself. So it will be Azure hyphen project dot TK. Okay. Let's click on review plus create. Create it. And with this, our DNS zone will now be created. And this DNS zone, we will uh, have to connect uh, our domain to this DNS zone. And then we will configure a DNS zone to connect to our traffic manager. So that is how the flow is going to happen. So the DNS zone deployment is complete. So we can just go to uh the resource so here we are and here this is the most important thing guys you get name servers you get four name servers over here and these name servers you basically have to configure in your uh, website which is basically giving you the uh dns name okay so let's copy these Let's go to a free norm website, go to the domain that we're going to configure. It's going to be Azure hyphen project. So we'll click on manage domain. And in manage domain, we'll go to management tools and then name servers. So just replace the name servers that are there with the new ones. And that should be it. That's about it. How to configure your domain to basically connect. So just copy it one by one. Okay, so now just click on change name servers. And that's it. That's all you have to do on the Freenom website. Okay, now come back to your DNS zones over here. And now what you can do is just uh, close this.
okay now you just have to point your dns zone to your traffic manager so just click on record add a record set and this let's uh, configure it to be cname and it is the global traffic manager that we want to point on okay let's click on ok so here we have to enter something so let's enter www and let's click on ok okay so with this our record set has now got created and it will take like a minute or two or sometimes it even takes 24 hours to basically make a change on the dns server so we'll check that meanwhile uh, let's come back to our application gateway check the backend help now and let's see if this has loaded great so now it is showing us both the us backends right uh, in the uh, application gateway of us and now if we go ahead and try to connect to it this is the ip address great we are able to connect to the us servers and we can see that it first connects it to the first one then the second one so let's now what i'll do is on this application gateway uh, the ip address that we have just got let's configure that to have a dns name so we'll go to configuration uh, this would be agus so it's available let's save it and then once this is configured we can just go to uh, the traffic manager now and add an endpoint for the US servers. So we'll go to endpoints, add an endpoint over here, and this will be for AG India. Uh, it's a public IP address, the target resource type, and we have to connect to new AG US. Click on add. Okay, so again, uh, we will have to do the regional grouping. So in this case, now anybody can connect, right? So any the whole world can connect, and if the whole world is connecting, uh, sorry, this will not, not be AG India. This will be AG US. The whole world can connect, and if they want to connect, they will be able to go to this endpoint. So now let's see what happens. Uh, so once let's make uh, let's wait for this to come online. And uh, once it is, we will just check if you go to the traffic manager, which server it is basically pointing us to. Given the fact that this particular endpoint is for the whole world to access. Let's look into what this Azure Cloud service. So what is Azure Cloud service? Microsoft Azure is an ever-expanding set of cloud services to help your organization meet your business challenges. Azure offers services on a pay-as-you-go pricing model in computing, web services, data storage, analytics, etc. etc. So there are so many different domains in which Azure is providing services. So to be very simple, Azure is a cloud provider, a public cloud provider, as well as you can get private cloud services and hybrid cloud services from them. So first of all, Azure is Microsoft owned. Azure is a cloud provider. So after AWS, Azure is the most popular cloud service in the world. So when an interview asks this, you can be basic as well as advanced. I would suggest you just give the apt answer what exactly it is. Microsoft Azure is a cloud service, which provides you various different services in various domains like computing, web services, data, data storage, and you can access those services via an internet device so you can access them through a laptop or a desktop or your mobile device anything with an internet connectivity you will be able to access microsoft azure okay so we've seen what is azure cloud service 
Okay guys, now let's look into the second question which is how does Azure compare with AWS? So first of all, AWS owns 32.3% of the market share in the public cloud industry but Azure owns only 16.2% which is just half of what AWS owns. But Azure is currently the fastest growing cloud network and also it has 54 different regions in which it has availability zones but AWS has 69 availability zones across only 24 regions. So regions in the sense are geographically located regions for example. Just a quick info guys, IntelliPad provides Microsoft Azure certification training in partnership with Microsoft, mentored by industry experts. The course link of which is given in the description below. Now let's continue with the session. Azure has uh, regions like South India, North India, East US, West US, Central US, Europe, Central Europe. So there are so many different regions like that. So like that there are 24 different regions but within those regions AWS has 69 availability zones. But Azure has uh, 54 regions. It has In 54 regions it has 54 availability zones and it's currently growing. So this basically shows Azure is better in availability zones that is data centers because it has a wide range of data centers in various regions. Next comparing the services, uh, if you already know about cloud AWS and Azure then this would be easy. EC2, S3, RDS are AWS services. The same exact service EC2 is equal to virtual machine, Azure virtual machines. S3 is equal to storage, blob storage. RDS is equal to SQL databases in Azure. So EC2 is used to launch and create servers named as VM does. And then S3 and blob storage are for storing objects. RDS and SQL databases can create relational databases running on the cloud. So you can distinguish between different services. And then finally, the paper uh, hour model and paper minute model. So this is one of the important difference you'll have to note down. Because AWS does not have a pay per minute model yet, it charges you for the hour which you used, but Azure will charge you only for the minute. For example, if you are running a service, uh, let's say you are running the same server, Linux server in AWS and Azure for five minutes, in AWS will be charged the uh, hour. For example, if the hour charged in both AWS and Azure is $5. So, it would be $5 for, for 60 minutes if it's $5. So you will be charged for the whole $5 in AWS. But in Azure, that would be not the same because you will be charged per minute. So if it is $5 for the hour, that is 60 minutes. So that will be reduced to one minute. So that would be multiplied into five. So you will be charged very, very, very less in Azure compared to AWS if you are using services for a very less period of time. So if you're using some service for two to uh, 10, 15 minutes, then go with Azure because that will not charge you as much as AWS. Okay, so we've seen the second question. So I think you can coagulate into an answer and give it, uh, I'm just explaining you the differences, but you'll have to provide it more of a answer. And then comes the roles implemented in Microsoft Azure. So there are three main roles, the web role, the worker role, and the virtual machine role. First, the web role, this gives a web solution that is the front end. Uh, this is like an ASP.NET application while under facilitating Azure provides IIS, which is basically a web server uh, and required services. So web role provides a web solution. Basically, it's a front end. It can be a website's front end. The worker, load is a worker role is a solution for background service. It can run long activities. For example, if you have a a log activity if you want to monitor the log activity you can use a worker role and then finally a virtual machine role so this can act both as a web and a worker role and this is executed by virtual machines the virtual machine role gives the client the capacity to modify the virtual machine on which the web and worker roles are running so for example Web role only uh, contradicts to the website, the front end. Worker role only contradicts to the business logic, which is the background or the back end part. So in virtual machines, you can run both a web role and a worker role, which means you can have a website running as well as a background process running. So these are the three main roles which are implemented in Microsoft Azure. So I think you get the point of this. So basically in Azure, 
mostly it is used to launch applications so for an application obviously there will be a web role which would be the application itself hosted and then the worker role which is background processes for example if a person wants to uh, retrieve an image from the website so they'll cl- uh, enter the information click a button and a background code will run so that code would be your worker role and these both can be run on a virtual machine which makes it a virtual machine role so these are the three most basic roles and the next question is so this might be a question which may be asked but this does not have a certain answer i'm just giving you the three most popular and commonly used services so talk about the three principal segments of microsoft as your platform okay so first of all compute and storage comes by default because they are the most used compute services and storage services are the most used services in any cloud platform and then you can choose one as per your need for example you can choose databases or you can choose uh, monitoring managing governance you can choose anything so here i've chosen databases for example you can uh, tell the answer like this so the principal segments of microsoft as your platform or it can be basically anything but here the most commonly used services comes under the compute and storage platform and i also would say databases because every single application needs a compute needs storage and also database so for example in compute there is virtual machines app services and function apps which can be used to develop an application and also host that application with the backend code and then there is microsoft azure storage where we have blob storage table storage where we have uh, file storage we have azure queues so we can use all of them to store objects we can use them to store images videos audio files we can use them to store no sql data and finally comes databases where we can store record or structure information and also there is a cosmos db which is for no sql and also if your application needs a a uh, analytical database we have sql data warehouses for that purpose too so compute storage and databases i would say they are the most uh, they are the three principal segments of microsoft azure platform because they provide so many different services pretty sure even azure uses them for their own benefit okay so this is the fourth question so we have seen four questions up till now so the fifth question is what is the distinction f- between azure queues and azure service bus queues okay first of all storage queues and service bus queues are different so first what are storage queues uh, storage queues featuring a simple rest based uh, get put peek interface providing reliable persistent messaging system within and between services service bus queues are part of a broader azure messaging infrastructure that supports queuing as well as publish or subscribe and more advanced integration patterns Okay so the simplest thing you'll have to know is if your application needs to store more than 80 GB of messages go with storage queues but if it needs only less than that and it won't exceed 80 GB you can go with a service bus queue so the thing is storage queues are mainly used to move messages between services or to a end user so you can see it is a rest based get put peek interface basically you can get a message from it you can upload or send a message through it and in service bus you can do the same but also you can integrate advanced patterns for example you can integrate a queuing system which basically filters multiple messages according to their priority and that does not come with storage queues also storage queues are very easy to use you can use it between services you can create a queue within minutes service bus is has a broader usage in azure itself so these are the main two differences that if you want to use an application for your own personal use go with storage queues if it is a bigger application which needs shorter message uh, storing go with service bus queues so the dis- the main distinction between them is storage queues are simple uh, rest based get put peek interface but service bus queues is involved with the azure messaging infrastructure itself and this supports queuing as well as normal publish and subscribe which comes with storage queues as well also you can integrate advanced integration patterns by which cannot be done in storage queues where you can filter different messages according to their priority and various other features and factors okay 
So the next question is what is table storage in Microsoft Azure? So Azure table storage service stores a lot of organized information. Azure tables are perfect for putting away organized non-relational data. It is a NoSQL data store which acknowledges verified calls from inside and outside the Azure cloud. So uh, basically table storage is a NoSQL data store where you can store non-relational data. That's basically NoSQL non-relational database. Okay. So now what exactly is table storage? First, let's look into what exactly it is. First of all, a table is a collection of entities. A record can contain numerous tables. Basically, when you create a table, you can have uh, multiple tables or a single table and it, it is a collection of entities. So what are entities? Entities is an arrangement of properties like a database row. An entity can be up to one MB in size. So basically an entity is an item within the table. For example, if it is a table for shoes and inside that every single shoe name would be a entity. Next comes properties. A property is a name value pair. Every entity can incorporate up to 252 properties to store data. For example, uh, let's say in entity, we have three different shoe types. One is uh, Adidas, one is Reebok, one is Nike. And inside Adidas, you can have 252 properties like color, type, shoe model number, and so many different properties under that entity, which defines that particular entity. So inside a table, there can be any number of entities. And inside those entities, there can be 252 different types of properties to store data. So that's what Azure table storage is used for. It is a service used to store a lot of organized information in which you, uh, you can store non-relational data. It's a NoSQL data store, which acknowledges verified calls from inside and outside the Azure cloud. That is, you can integrate it with Azure services inside the cloud, as well as third party services from outside the cloud. And table is a collection of entities. Entities is basically the uh, main item inside a table and properties are the sub, basically a property explains what an entity is and the entities completely uh, explain what a table is. So that's it, that's what, that is what table storage is. The next question is what is auto scaling in Azure? So what is auto scaling in Azure? Scaling by including extra intense instances is frequently referred to as scaling out. So this is a commonly used term which is called scaling out. So Azure likewise supports scaling up by utilizing bigger role rather than more role instances. An auto scaling solution reduces the amount of manual work engaged in dynamically scaling an application. So this is pretty simple guys. So let's say you have a virtual machine which has a, let's say it has a website running on it. Now there are a lot of users using it right now, but that one particular virtual machine is able to handle them. So let's say there are 20 users. Now, right now, this particular virtual machine is able to handle all the 20 users and the website is not crashing, but suddenly your website has gone viral and there are 200 users. Now your virtual machine will not be able to handle because there are more users and the CPU utilization will go high. The traffic, the overload of your server will go high because of that, the usage also will increase and then your website might crash. So. What you'll have to do, you'll have to again uh, start up a virtual machine or another server. Once you've done that, you will have to configure your website and make it run again. So this will take some time until then you would have lost a lot of users. So instead you can start off with using auto scaling. So for example, you can see the image in the right corner below in which the, in, to the left, there are two virtual machines, which is written as minimum two. That basically means, uh, let's say you have a website and right now your website has two virtual machines and that is the minimum number of virtual machines and it'll never go below that. Even a virtual machine is, uh, let's say even a virtual machine has been terminated accidentally, it'll launch one more virtual machine within a span of a minute and that will be ready for your website. So now to the right side, you can see virtual machines as needed and maximum is equal to five. So the maximum number of virtual machines you will get is five. The minimum number of virtual machines running will be two. And there you can add or subtract three virtual machines. For example, if you have two virtual machines right now, you can add three more or two more or one more or you don't need to add at all, but you cannot go below number two or you cannot go above number five. 
you can use auto scaling solution to do this for example right now you have two virtual machines and the work overload goes very very high so right now you want one virtual machine so it'll launch one virtual machine now it'll monitor all of the three virtual machines again if the user count is completely increasing it'll launch one more and again if the users are increasing the traffic uh, is overloading then again it'll launch one more virtual mission so here the maximum is number five so it'll launch up to five virtual missions after that even though the user base is increasing it won't go above that you'll have to change that in the configuration for example max is equal to 10 so it can launch up to 10 different virtual missions okay so got it so i think you understood what exactly auto scaling is so you can explain it simply for example you can tell auto scaling solution reduces the manual work engaged in dynamically scaling an application instead we can set up an auto scaling solution in azure where it gives you the number of required instances as such as whenever the traffic increases it will give you more instances when the traffic decreases it will reduce the number of resources being used which is also cost optimized and this will reduce your billing cost so now let's look into the next question which would be what are the features of microsoft azure so what are the features of microsoft azure so there are so many different features so let's just look into uh, three features so first azure app services enables designers to assemble the sites utilizing various different programming languages you can use asp.net php you can use java python and send these websites utilizing ftp or git basically you can use github to have this code and you can integrate it with azure app services so that uh, azure itself will launch your website for you it will maintain your website for you you just have to uh, work on your code Next comes SQL databases, formerly known as Azure database, makes, broadens and scales the application into the cloud utilizing Microsoft SQL Server. So in SQL databases provided by Azure, you don't need to scale out anything. For example, if you have set up a maximum size, whenever the size of the database increases, it will automatically scale the storage and also you can manually scale the compute. And finally, this is Microsoft's platform as a service that supports multi-level applications and automated deployment. That is Azure is Microsoft's platform as a service because they're giving you a platform to work on various different services. Even though services like virtual machines are infrastructure as a service, it comes under IaaS, but Microsoft Azure as a whole is a platform as a service because they are giving you a platform which you can work on different uh, cloud services. So these are some features about Microsoft Azure. You can talk about them. So next question is what are the difference between a public cloud and a private cloud? This is one of the most basic questions. You can easily answer them. So look at the image at the top. So first of all, public cloud, elasticity, utility pricing, leverage, expertise, and then private cloud, total control, regulation, flexibility. So let's compare this. First of all, elasticity. That is, you can launch any number of services. It can go up, it can go down. You can have any number of users. You can provide the access to users. You can cut off the access whenever you want. So it's more elastic. And then coming to right, it's total control. You can mention the administrator and only they will have control over the private cloud. So this basically increases security in private cloud, but public cloud is widely used and also you can see leverage expertise that means if you're using microsoft azure as a public cloud then you will be able to leverage expertise because they have so many different security professionals working for microsoft and they will be guarding your virtual machines because you have taken a virtual machine from azure itself and coming to private cloud you'll have to maintain monitor all of that and then comes utility pricing and regulation. So utility pricing in the sense you only pay for what you use. In private cloud, you will pay for everything you have taken up. And also regulation in the sense you can stop someone to access something. You can uh, stop a service overall. You don't need to use a service. So in private cloud, you have the whole control. In public cloud, you have partial control. Okay, so now let's look into the most basics of them. A public cloud is utilized as a service through the internet by users. So anyone can use it 
while a private cloud is deployed within specific limits like a firewall settings and is totally overseen and checked by users dealing with it in an organization so a public cloud is used for launching applications for public use that is uh, end user use private cloud is used mostly used for deploying applications within a specified limit for example within an organization you can launch applications so you can do that using private cloud so this is the basic differences between public and private cloud so the next question would be hybrid cloud what do you comprehend about hybrid cloud so basically a company can use both public and private cloud so a combination of them is a hybrid cloud so hybrid cloud is a blend of internal and external cloud services so internal in the sense within the organization external in the sense for users a mix of private cloud joined with the utilization of public cloud services this kind of cloud is most appropriate when you need to keep the classified information at your vicinity private cloud and consume alternate services from a public cloud for example if you have mission critical data you can store that in the private cloud and the application itself can be running on the public cloud because the application does not have any important information and even though there is a security breach there can be nothing taken from that but your mission critical data and code is stored in a private cloud which only you can access so this is hybrid cloud and the next question is what is a storage key so your storage key access keys are similar to a root password for your storage account always be careful to protect your access keys use as your key vault to manage and rotate your keys securely you can view and copy your account access keys with the azure portal powershell or azure cli the azure portal also provides a connection string for your storage account that you can copy for example if you are logging into your storage account in azure portal it's pretty simple to log in you can just enter you can just enter as such but if you are trying to access your storage account from powershell or as your cli uh, you will have to use your storage keys so it's pretty it's basically uh, an entry point for your storage account so you can use that also azure portal provides a connection string for your storage account that you can copy and use it in your azure cli or powershell so to be simple it is a uh, it is similar to a root password for your storage account and it is a key which you can use to log in into your storage account to check out the uh, storage containers like blob storage table storage within the storage account itself so it's pretty simple storage account and then comes what is microsoft azure traffic manager so it enables users to control the distribution of user traffic of installed azure cloud services there are three distinctive load balancing strategies provided by azure uh, the manager who uses on traffic applies a, a routing policy to the domain name servers questions on your domain names and maps the dns courses to the apt instances of your application so let me explain to you in simple words so first of all azure traffic manager is a dns based traffic load balancer that enables you to distribute traffic optimally to services across global azure regions while providing high availability and responsiveness so basically traffic manager uses a dns to direct client requests to the most appropriate endpoint on traffic routing method so basically let me explain to you this so let's say you are trying to access a website using a website's url name now when you type that your first point of uh, entry would be the traffic manager so once you hit that the traffic manager will use dns and it will check to which ip address should this particular url name is uh, should be redirected so once when it finds that it will redirect the client request to the most appropriate service for example in intellipad.com we have intellipad.com which is the main page and intellipad.com slash blog so for example i'm searching for intellipad.com slash blog now this will go to the traffic manager once it hits the traffic manager it will check out the ip address for this particular url once it gets the ip addresses it will transfer me to the blog page not the main intellipad.com page so that's what traffic manager does and it's pretty simple to use it so you can start off with traffic manager even now so you can combine traffic manager with auto scaling so that it is better to use so if you're using traffic manager with auto scaling basically what you do you will be able to launch and terminate multiple virtual machines as well as you'll be able to launch multiple applications in different 
virtual machines and connect two auto scaling groups together in which the traffic manager is the first entry point and for example in one auto scaling group there is app 1 in another auto scaling group there is app 2 so now it hits the traffic uh, manager if you are trying to access app 2 it will take you to app 2 if you are trying to access app 1 it will take you to the app 1 auto scaling group so this is how you can use traffic manager the next question is what is microsoft azure portal this is again a basic question so microsoft azure portal is the website which you are logging into when you are using azure so view and manage all of your applications in one unified hub you can view your web applications your databases your virtual machines your network storage and vst projects now it is easy to keep tabs on current and projected costs so microsoft azure is not just for managing all your all your applications and services it can also be used to manage your current and projected billing costs so azure portal automatically calculates your existing charges as well as it will forecast your future or monthly charge even if you are managing hundreds of resources across several applications for example if you are using only one service still it will give you the billed amount for right now and also the projected bill if you are also using hundreds of services again it will do the same thing for you regardless of the scale so microsoft azure a portal is the website which you are using to access microsoft azure services that is more than enough if you want to tell more you can tell it's a unified hub to manage all the azure services it also provides cost management uh, services uh, you can say it has a different web page for every single service you can access every single service directly from the portal itself and also manage monitor and do uh, everything else through azure portal itself and also you can access azure portal from any internet connected device okay so we've seen that the next question is what is elastic pool in sql azure so we already saw what exactly is an sql database so now azure sql database elastic pools are a simple cost effective solution for managing and scaling multiple databases that have varying and unpredictable usage demands Databases in an elastic pool are on a single server and share a set of resources at a set price. Okay, let me make it simple for you. So right now you have you want various databases for different applications, and all these databases uh, need to have a different set of specifications. Now what you can do is you can launch an elastic pool, which is basically a single server with different sets of resources within it. you can launch multiple databases and you can specify the required set of resources for a particular database within the elastic pool itself you can launch any number of databases within that server uh, and how much that server can handle and all of the databases is shared will use shared resources and the price for that will be the same even though you are using uh, any number of databases so let's say you can have 10 databases within that elastic pool or you can have five databases or you can have only one database but you will be charged the same because you are sharing the same number of resources across all the databases so this is elastic pool next is what is your sql database so an sql database is just an approach to get associated with cloud services where you can store your database into the cloud if you already know about sql databases for example mysql postgresql or ms sql database you will understand this easily because it is basically the same relational database on your local system hosted on a cloud system and given remote access to you so you can tell it pretty simply sql azure database is a database server running in the azure data center and to which you are given remote access to so that you can access that sql database microsoft sql azure has a similar component of sql server that is it provides high accessibility versatility and security in the core microsoft azure sql database has an element it makes backups of each active database automatically so this feature does not come with a local database because it does not take backup it has only one storage where the data is actually stored and if that is lost your data is lost but in microsoft azure sql databases it's not the case you can enable automatic uh, database backups so if your database is active and new data is coming in it will automatically back it up so even though your database has been terminated you can use the backup to launch a database with the same existing data set 
So this is Azure SQL databases. Now let's look into the next question, which is what are the different types of storage areas in Microsoft Azure? So there is blobs, there is table storage, there is queues, and there are still more, but you can uh, talk about three uh, maximum. So there is also file storage, which is basically a shared access file storage. So you can also talk about that if you want. But right now I will we'll be looking into blob, table and queues. So queues we already looked into. Now we'll just look into blobs and tables. Even table storage was a separate question. So you can also answer that. So first of all, what is blob? So blob is the most commonly used uh, storage type in Azure. So the full form of blob would be binary large objects. So you can see that BL. OB, which is basically binary large objects, blobs. So blobs are a component for storing a lot of content or binary data. You can store pictures, audio, visual documents. You can store video. You can store any type of data. They can scale up to 200 terabytes and can be acquired by utilizing REST APIs. Very, very simple to start off with blob storage. You can create a storage account and create a blob container in which you can upload images, videos, documents, anything you want. You can store any type of binary data within blob storage. So that is one of the main area in Microsoft Azure. Next comes table storage, which is a non-relational data store where you can store organized information and also you can store them using uh, a uh, format, which is table entity and with an entity you can have properties so that we saw next is queue the sole target of a queue is to empower communication among the web and worker role instances they help in storing messages that may be accessed by a customer so as told queues can be used to connect multiple services as well as services with the end user so these are the three main storage areas one more is a file storage which is basically a shared storage access which you can use to connect the same storage to multiple virtual machines. So every single user in every single virtual machine will be able to access the same data store, which will save you a lot of storage as well as cost. Next question is what is the concept of blob storage? I explained to you what exactly is blob. So let me just go into that more. So blob as told again, it is binary large objects and includes text files, images, audios, and videos. Azure Blob is a service that stores massive unstructured data that can be accessed from any place via protocols like HTTP or HTTPS. So how does this work? How can you access these objects using HTTP or HTTPS? So it's pretty simple. Whenever you upload an object like image or audio into the Blob storage, it will have a URL. So it will be provided a URL and you can use that URL to access that particular object. For example, if I'm uploading an image, that image will have a URL for that image itself. Now you can use that URL to access that particular image. So how will you access that? Using protocols like HTTP or HTTPS. So now what else you can use as your blobs for? Storing data for disaster recovery, backup and archiving, also storing files for shared access. Shared access in the sense, if you upload an object and you have a link for it, you can share that link with multiple users so that they all can use that particular blob storage as a star shared storage. So that can uh, happen. Also, you can use it for disaster recovery. That is, you can store data in different regions in blob storage itself and use it for backup and then also archiving data. So this is blob storage. Now let's look into the next question. So now this question is what is Azure DevOps in Microsoft Azure? So if you are already familiar with DevOps methodologies, then this would be easier to understand. If you're not, I'll explain to you what exactly is DevOps in a few sentences. So first of all, DevOps is not a tool. It is a methodology which companies uh, follow and implement in their software development lifecycle to automate the entire life cycle. So Azure DevOps is not a methodology, it is a service. You may be confused by the name, but DevOps is the methodology, but Azure DevOps is a DevOps service provided by Azure and it is developed by the Microsoft team. It was previously called as VSTS or Visual Studio Team Services. Azure DevOps provides easy automation by having predefined build options for the deployment of applications. 
For example, if you're trying to launch an Angular application, it already has build options for it. It has NPM packages in build. You can have a build. You can basically create a build in a matter of minutes. For example, if you're also uh, launching a Java application, it has a Maven build option. You can use that to build that application. So that's why they are saying it provides you easy automation and also free defined, predefined build options. And finally, it also monitors your tools and it uses monitor to monitoring tools to monitor your application or your project which you have launched within Microsoft Azure DevOps. Okay, so Azure DevOps has various different tools. So let me explain to you those tools. So one tool is Azure Repos, which is a repository like GitHub. So it's pretty similar. It's basically the same. And then comes Azure Pipelines. Pipelines is the tool which you use to implement a CI CD pipeline. A CI CD pipeline is the one which you use to automate the software lifecycle. And then comes test plans, which is basically used to test the application. And then comes Azure uh, boards, which is a Kanban board, which is basically like Jira, where you can implement uh, work items, you can implement sprints. And then finally, you have Azure artifacts where you can store the packages like NPM, NuGet in the same place so that it is easier to access them. Also, finally, you get an Azure dashboard where you can access and also create and launch widgets where, which will be helpful for your application. For example, you can see how many builds have been succeeded, how many have failed, how much time it is taking to build a particular project, uh, how many times it has been deployed and how many users are using our application right now. So all these widgets can be used in Azure DevOps. So you've seen that the next question is what is Azure App Service? We already discussed this, but still I'll explain it to you once again. Uh, so to be very simple, Azure App Service is a completely uh, managed service provided by Microsoft Azure. So within Azure, Azure App Service is a completely managed platform as a service, not infrastructure as a service, but a pass. It is a pass offering for proficient developers that conveys a rich arrangement of abilities to web, mobile and integration services. So if a developer wants to just concentrate on the code which he is developing and doesn't want to manage the servers and the other side of it, that is the uh, backend part of it. So what he can do, he can opt for Azure App Service where he can launch one and he can just upload his code into Azure App Service which will take care of provisioning servers, uploading the code within the server and also serving that website and also provide you a URL which you can use to look into the website. So you can do all of this using Azure App Service and you don't need to manage anything. Azure will manage everything for you. It will launch, as told, it launch servers. It will also monitor and manage them for you. And if you want anything else, if you want to scale it up, again, you have an option for that. If you want to look into the server which it has launched, again, you have a shell option for that. Mobile applications in Azure App Service offer a very adaptable, universally accessible mobile application development platform for enterprise developers and system integrators that conveys a rich set of capacities to mobile engineers. So basically using Azure App Services, you cannot just uh, launch websites. You can also launch mobile applications and they are very adaptable and universally accessible mobile application development platform. For example, you might be using uh, Android Studio or Xcode. So in this, you will be able to launch both of them and they will run successfully. So next we'll look into CMD let in Azure. So it's it's a pretty simple answer. So CMD let is a command basically, it's a PowerShell command and this is utilized as a part of the PowerShell environment. So CMD lets, command lets are summoned by the Windows PowerShell to automate the scripts which are in the command line. For example, you have created a script. Now you want to automate the script, you can go with command let. Windows PowerShell runtime additionally invokes them automatically through Windows PowerShell APIs. You can also automate CMD let commands, which will automate other scripts 
using powershell apis so to be pretty simple cmd let is a lightweight command which you can use in the powershell environment and it is used to automate scripts for example if you want to launch virtual machine at a particular uh, time or if you want to monitor a virtual machine at 5 pm in the evening every single day you can launch that script and you can automate it using cmd let and it will run that script every uh, every day at 5 pm Okay, so the next one is Microsoft Azure Scheduler. So Azure Scheduler enables you to invoke activities, for example, calling HTTPS endpoints or presenting a message on a storage queue on any schedule. With Scheduler, you make jobs in the cloud that dependably call services both inside and outside of Azure and execute jobs on demand on a routinely repeating schedule or assign them on a for a future date. So in the name itself, you can understand Microsoft has your scheduler. So it basically schedules certain things for you. But what does it schedule? It schedules jobs on the cloud. So it can be within Azure or outside of Azure. And as mentioned, it will execute those jobs on demand. And it can be done on a repeating scale. That is, for example, every day or every week. Or you can assign them for a future date to run only once. So that you can do using Microsoft Azure Scheduler. For example, it can call an HTTPS endpoints or it can present a message on a storage queue on any schedule. So you can use the scheduler for any service on Azure or outside of Azure. So it's pretty simple. It is uh, explainable by, by name itself. So to be simpler, you can tell this. Microsoft Azure Scheduler is a service which you can use to schedule a certain task in Microsoft Azure or outside of Microsoft Azure to execute a job on demand which can be executed repeatedly or it can be set to a future date for execution only once. So the next question is how can you create an HD Insight cluster in Azure? So let me explain it to you in, uh, in, in a very simple way. So you can tell this because this is an interview, you will be asked questions, you will be able to answer them with words. So to make an HD inside cluster, first of all, you'll have to open Azure portal, then click on new, you can select data services and you can click on HD insight or you can just search HD insight and get into it. So once you get into it, you will have multiple options. You will have Hadoop, you will have HBase and Storm and more options as well. So Hadoop is the default and native execution of our Apache Hadoop and HD Insight provides you uh, Hadoop as the default option and then comes HBase which is an Apache open source NoSQL database based on Hadoop that gives random access and solid consistency for a lot of unstructured data. Storm as such it is a distributed fault tolerant open source computation system that enables you to process data in real time so the thing is i'm not going to explain how to pitch base and storm right now i'm just going to explain to you what is hd insight so hd insight is an analytic service which you can use to launch hadoop on the azure cloud or other hadoop ecosystem services like hbase storm or spark on azure cloud so to launch HD Insights, it's pretty simple, but to work with it, it is a little tough. So to launch HD Insight, you will just have to go to the HD Insight uh, cluster and you can choose the service which you want and you can launch it. So HD Insight, again, it's an analytic service and you can launch the big data or analytic service which you want from it. Next question is what is text analytics API in Azure Machine? So let me put it simply. First of all, text analytics APIs comes under cognitive services. So API, the application program interface. So this particular API is for text analytics, which can be used to uh, search a particular word or it can be used for keyword mining. Okay, now let me let us just read this once. The API can be used or utilized to analyze unstructured content for tasks such as sentiment analysis and key phrase extraction. Sentiment, uh, sentiment analysis in the sense, let's say you have a complete page of content. Now you want to see the sentiment of that content, whether the statement is happy uh, or sad or neutral. So you can check out that using various keys and you can enter those words into the API so that when it runs, it will check whether it is positive or negative. 
So you can see it has a numeric score between 0 and 1 and when it comes near 1 it is highly positive and it, when it comes near 0 it is highly negative sentiment. So that you can see. This is for sentiment analysis and key phrase extraction in the sense if you have a very huge document and if you want to check whether this particular key phrase comes inside it and you can use the text analytics API to check out the entire document. The upside of this API is that another new model need not be planned and prepared. The user just needs to bring the data and call the service to get the sentiment results. So they are telling that the best part of this API is that you don't need to call another service to run this API. Instead, you just have to bring the data set and call this API to run on the data set and get the sentiment results immediately. So I think you got it. It is a text analytics API mainly used for tasks like sentiment analysis and key phrase extraction. You have two numeric scores, zero and one. Near zero, it is negative and near one, it is highly positive. Uh, it's basically sentiment and the upside is you don't need to call any other service. You can directly call this API and upload a data set and it will give you the sentiment results. Next question is what is migrate tool? So again, in the name itself, you can get this answer migration a migration from the on-premise setup to the cloud or from the cloud to the on-premise setup. This is a central hub of tools to discover assets and migrate workloads to Azure. So you can migrate any type of workload into Azure. So it provides support for key migration scenarios across servers, data, databases, web applications, and virtual desktops. It saves costs and migrate efficiently with free tooling and Azure Copt optimization. So you can use the Azure Migrate tool to migrate databases or servers or web applications from your on-premise setup to the Azure cloud seamlessly. So for example, if you want to migrate your database, you will have to provide the details like the endpoint, then you'll have to provide the username and password, and then the destination would be a Azure database. You can provide the details of the Azure database, and once you click start, it'll migrate the data from the on-premise database into the Azure database, and it's very, very simple to start with. So this is basically Azure Migrate tool. You can easily explain this with two or three sentences. And we've come to the final question, which is what is Azure service level agreement? First of all, the SLA ensures that when you send two or more role instances for each role, access to your cloud service will be maintained not less than 99.9% .9 of the time. Additionally, identification and recorrection activities will be started 99.9% .9 of the time when a role's instance procedure isn't running. So let me explain to you SLA in simple words. It's an agreement in which Azure tells you that this particular service will be running for this amount of time. So for example, if you are using a service for 10 minutes, Azure provides you a SLA stating that your application will run 99.9% .9 of the time in that 10 minute period. So your application can go down only for a 0.01%. That's very, very less. So like that Azure will provide you. If you are using a free trail service, uh, they don't mention an SLA because it's your free trail and they don't give you any benefit for you. But if you have a paid Azure account, if you're paying every single month, they will provide you an SLA for every single service, which will mention that this particular service will run for this amount of time. So for storage, it's basically high. For example, it would be 99.9999% of the time. It will be always up. It will never go down. So SLA is a statement which tells you this particular service will stay up for this amount of time and it will not go down. For example, if you're using it for one hour, it will stay up for 99% of the time and it may go for 1% of the time. It's not that it will go, it may go. So this is Azure SLAs. So we've come to the last question of this session, guys. I hope you understood all of the questions which we've taught. Just a quick info, guys. IntelliPad provides Microsoft Azure certification training in partnership with Microsoft, mentored by industry experts. The course link of which is given in the description below.